Hello, everyone. Uh, let's make a start. Uh, welcome to uh, ACRA 2023 uh, VTAC workshop. Uh, so uh, this year we have a theme uh, of blending virtual and real uh, visual tactile perception. And you will see uh, a lot of real uh, tactile sensors, and you will also see a few like uh, sim uh, tactile sensors in simulation in this workshop. So uh, first of all, I would like to give you a brief uh, introduction to some history of VTAC workshops. Uh, so this is the fourth, uh, fourth, year, fourth time uh, we are organizing uh, this uh, series of VTAC workshops. And I will give a, a glance of the program and also introduce the organizers and support of the, our uh, uh, TC. And at the end, I will give you a brief introduction to the TIO special section we're organizing on tactile robotics. Okay, uh, first of all, some brief uh, history of uh, our uh, VTAC workshops. But before that, I would like to uh, take uh, one minute to share a very sad news we have got last month. Um, so it's our great sadness to uh, learn that uh, Professor Vincent Hayward um, passed away last month. Um, and uh, he was uh, one of our uh, great speakers in the workshops and uh, uh, for 2019 and also 2020. Um, and he inspired uh, many of us um, exploring the scope of uh, sense of touch, um, both for uh, human sense of touch and also robot uh, sense of touch. And I will share some memories um, in our VTAC workshops, but also if you know Basin and you are uh, welcome to uh, scan this QR code and share your memories in this website. So here is uh, a picture we got from ICRA uh, 2019 uh, in Montreal, Canada. So the same was integrating vision and touch for multimodal and cross-modal perception. It was our very first workshop on uh, this visual tactile perception. And you can see Vision was here uh, standing next to Tag. Um, and it was uh, an in-person event. And uh, this is the second time for an in-person event for uh, beta workshop. And I hope so we will have some insightful discussions like we did in, uh, in Montreal. And this is a picture of uh, uh, the panel discussion at the end of the VTAC 2019. And you can see uh, Vincent was uh, sitting in the middle and uh, we were looking at it. Probably he, he was speaking on some uh, insights into uh, this field. And so uh, you can see uh, quite a few family uh, faces. That's me, that is Nathan. And actually this uh, photo was uh, shared by uh, Vincent with me after the, uh, the, uh, the workshop. And in the second one, we got uh, ACRA 2022, and we, ha we have the same of closing the perception action loop with vision and tactile sensing. So we want to push the, uh, the boundaries so that we can uh, embed tactile sensing in different uh, uh, robotic tasks. So that's why we would like to highlight how to close the perception and action loop. Uh, this time, it, you know, what happened and we had we had to move our workshop online, um, but we got some legacy from the online workshop. We have got some videos um, in our YouTube channel. So you can uh, watch these uh, uh, videos online in our uh, YouTube channel. You can scan this QR code. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, we have a Kindle talk from Winston this, um, um, latest results concerning uh, the me mechanics of touch, and he gave a lot of uh, his insights uh, into this field. And you can scan this QR code uh, to watch his video uh, in ACRA 20, uh, 2020 VTAC workshop. And in, v uh, in VTAC 2021, so uh, we, give, we had the same of trends and challenges in visual tactile perception. Um, again, so we have uh, uploaded all the videos to our YouTube channel. You can watch these videos by scanning uh, this QR code. Um, but we do think it's very important to gather uh, all the researchers in the same room and have the discussions. And that's how we have uh, this workshop this year uh, in person in London and now. 
Okay, and next I will give you a brief in introduction to the program today. Um, so in the morning, so we have a uh, session one, uh, we have the same of uh, the de development of uh, touch sensors, and we it will be chaired by uh, Professor Goli Cheng, and we will have uh, uh, two guest speakers, um, Professor Ravenda Tahia, and also uh, Professor Lucia Beckett, Be Be but she will uh, join us online. Um, and we will have this uh, uh, poster uh, highlights session, so we have two minutes for each presentation. And for the session two, we have simulations of tactile sensors. Um, it will be chaired by me, and we have Professor um, Michael Yu Wang, um, uh, and also we have another postal session, uh, also two minutes for each uh, presentation. And then we'll have lunch break and we have posters and demos. Um, so please talk to these uh, poster presenters and uh, uh, get engaged with the uh, poster sessions. And for the session three, we have same to real learning for visual tactile perception. It will be chaired by Nathan. Um, and we have uh, Professor Catherine uh, from MPI, uh, and we have uh, Roberto, um, and also we have uh, uh, Ted. Uh, Ted will join us online. Uh, he was around in Accra, um, but unfortunately he can't attend uh, our workshop in person, but he, he will join us online. Um, and then we have, we have uh, Rich from Shadow Robotics, um, and uh, uh, they will uh, showcase the recent development of tactile sensors here. Uh, and we have uh, one coffee break. And then in the final uh, session, we have challenges and outlook. It will be chaired by Wenzhen. Uh, unfortunately, Wenzhen cannot join us uh, in person. So she will join us online as well. Um, and we have uh, uh, Professor Data Fox. And at the end, we have the panel discussion. Um, so this is a brief introduction to the program. Uh, as you can see, it's hybrid. It's the very first time for hybrid. So hopefully it will work well. And uh, next I will introduce uh, our organizers uh, and also uh, the support that we have received from TCs. Uh, we have uh, five organizers. Um, so we have uh, uh, three here in this room. Um, uh, I'm Shan Luo, uh, and we have uh, Nathan um, sitting in the front, and we have uh, Gordon also at the front. So you can reach us if you have any questions on the workshop. The so Wenzhen will join us um, uh, online, and Casper is probably around. And as you know, Casper is uh, very busy uh, this week, but he should um, probably pop by sometime. And we have received uh, some support from three TCs, uh, technical uh, committees uh, from RES. Uh, we have uh, haptics, we have uh, human robot interaction and coordination, and we have uh, con uh, cognitive uh, uh, robotics. And one um, example how you can join this uh, HP RES uh, TC. So this is uh, uh, one slide from the TC for cognitive robotics. So you can go to their websites and you will find a lot of uh, events and you can join them uh, by clicking a link in their website. And finally, I would like to make a, a quick announcement on the special section um, on tactile robotics. We are, uh, we are organizing um, the transaction, attribute transactions um, robotics. Um, so it has been open from yesterday. So it's quite recent. Um, and we will welcome uh, the submissions until uh, end of October. Um, and the expected publication date will be 2024. Um, and we have uh, uh, the guest editors from the VTAC workshops uh, and also Professor Ravenda uh, here uh, in this uh, uh, guest, uh, guest editors uh, team. And uh, as you probably know, uh, around 10 years ago, uh, Ravenda organized one special issue on uh, the sense of touch uh, as the same journal, attribute transactions on robotics. And we think it will be a good time to, uh, to like to, um, we have got a lot of developments in the field. So we want to highlight the development of uh, uh, the sense of touch for robotics. And also we would like to overlook uh, the next 10 years. 
So um, we look forward to your submissions. Okay, so that's a brief introduction um, um, these days. And also you can find us uh, the list of uh, topics on the website. As you can see, it's quite broad. Um, um, textile robotics, the sense of touch for robots. Uh, and uh, that's a brief introduction on the workshop and also the special issue. Okay, so we will move to the next section. Session, so it will be chaired by uh, Professor Golden Chen. Let me give you an introduction to me. Uh, I'm Golden Chen. So um, I'm from the Technical University of Munich. I hold the chair for cognitive system. We do all kinds of things, including skin, uh, tactile response, and mainly I I like humanoid robots, and I like putting skin on humanoid robots. Okay. So um, while they're setting up, are you ready, Linda? Or... Almost okay. So let me give you a, a introduction to Professor Ravinda Lahia. I have known Ravinda since he was a PhD student when he did the uh, one of the first eye cuff skin, right? Uh, and um, and I we you know I damn, damn I'm showing my age. So um, I know Ravinda for a very long time since he's PhD student. We're very proud of him. Uh, and then he went on to be a postdoc at um, F in Trento, uh, and he does some amazing work on material science relating to skin. And then he moved over to Cambridge, Glasgow. He became full professor at Glasgow. And then he, he had this uh, amazing lab who uh, published a phenomenon paper on actually creating new material for skin. And this is something we really need. Right. And now recently, congratulations, he has moved to Northeastern University and he started a new group there. And it's a, it, it's going to be, a, again, phenomenal. And at least it's in a nice location. It's in Boston. Okay. So I probably visit him more often in Boston than in Glasgow. All right. So let me, let, uh, Ravinda, would you like to come? Yeah. Are you ready? Thank you, Thank you very much. Hey, well, uh, thanks, Gordon, again for the for the kind introduction, and uh, welcome uh, all of you to this Vitech workshop. Um, I will. Oh, it's there. So, so uh, today I'm not going to talk about pressure sensors because uh, literature is full of when we talk about touch sensors or tactile sensors. Literature is full of uh, various type of pressure sensors. So I guess you'll have enough uh, background material when it comes to pressure sensors or touch sensors, as we know, in the form of various type of pressure, strain, and uh, different type of sensors. I'm going to focus on new type of sensors. Uh, temperature sensor is not new. Uh, that's one I would focus on. But I'm including in my presentation because uh, it has not attracted as much attention as, uh, as uh, pressure sensor has got. And then I'll I'll move to the other part, which is light detection. So something where this workshop fits uh, is trying to bring touch and vision together. So there are new modalities, which could be your sensory modalities, which could be used to both as a, a as a vision to some extent and also touch to a greater extent. But not just restricting to these. These modalities could also be used to solve. Uh, traditional problems in e-skin, such as how do we uh, generate energy? So I'm going to give you some examples in these directions. Um, so my group uh, uh, is Bendable Electronics uh, and Sustainable Technologies Group. That's how we know, we, we call group in, in Northeastern, but it used to be called as Bendable Electronics and Sensing Technologies Group. Um, in Glasgow. So what we are doing is we try to understand sense of touch in uh, in humans, and uh, we develop the technology for robotics and prosthetics. And then the technology that we have got in the form of various type of flexible, stretchable, and uh, soft sensors, it closes the loop and comes back to you know in various ways to to in human uh, itself through wearable systems. And we are trying to. Uh, close the loop in this sense. Many publications from my group, they you will, you will see that sort of closing the loop. Okay, so 
Uh, here is the outline of my talk. As I mentioned, I'll first focus on the temperature sensor and then I'll move to the light detection and then I'll conclude my talk. So in terms of temperature sensors, our skin has thermoceptors, but has, these have not attracted as, as much attention as, uh, as mechanoreceptors. So if you look at the skin, then uh, there are various type of receptors embedded in the skin. And then uh, the challenge with temperature sensors is that if you embed these, uh, these sensitive elements under some soft material, then uh, the sensitivity of sensors can also go down. And as, as a result, there are not many temperature sensors which are fast enough to allow a sort of real, uh, a feeling of real time interaction. And this example, in this example, we used vanadium pentoxide based nanowires. So we printed these nanowires. These are aligned along certain directions and they are embedded in PDMS. Now PDMS is thermally insulator, but you will see the response of the sensor. This PDMS that is, is not very thick, it's quite kind of 100 micron uh, thick, but it still provides that kind of soft cover, which is needed for sensors to, to uh, you know, uh, to be robust enough to, to work under different conditions. And the sensor is quite fast as well. But not only this, the it also we used here, uh, in this case, we used, uh, this is the printed sensor that I'm going to talk about. So that re reflects more or less, if you compare with the human skin, would reflect something like sensory neuron. And then we have, we created these, uh, uh, uh the the circuit we we made circuit here which is based on uh, the sensitivity of temperature sensors so pre-processing of the sensory data and then we also use a, a classifier uh, there so basically thresholding and using sensor data to control robotic arm so and this is this way i was trying to show how uh, we have focused greatly on central nervous system, but there is also peripheral nervous system where you can you can see how data is processed and and the data is sent to the to the brain, not as a raw data, but some processing has taken place. But when it comes to fabrication of sensor, you need uh, miniaturized sensors, and there is the current techniques that we use. It's quite challenging to have a miniaturized sensor, temperature sensor in flexible form factor and, and having large area. To that extent, the printed, uh, printed technology, they come into picture and they are quite handy because you can, uh, you can make, you can print sensors on large area. And then nanoscale device, nanoscale uh, nanowires, they allow you to have that very small sensors, miniaturized sensors. So in this case, you can see here, that's the fabrication step. We used in this case, dielectrophoresis approach to align nanowires. And these nanowires are aligned between two electrodes. As you see here, these are the kind of electrodes. So I'm using mouse here so that the colleagues uh, who are attending online, they can also see, otherwise I can use pointer also. Let me know if you, if you don't see uh, the mouse moving here, the, the, the pointer moving here. So these are the electrodes. We, we align nanowires between these two electrodes. And when the temperature increases, the conductivity, the material has this property that conductivity changes with time and it can changes quite uh, drastically. So you, between the electrodes, then the, the amount of current that is flowing through the, the, between the electrodes that changes and that gives a measure of the temperature. So we use this technique. And as you can see, these are kind of nanowires, aligned nanowires, large number of wires that are present between two electrodes. There's no, uh, many nanoscale uh, electronic devices, they rely on single nanowire. But in this case, we, we do ensemble of nanowires. And the reason is simple, that device to device variability is, is expected to be much lower when you use a large number of nanowires. Uh, ensemble of nanowires, uh, the statistical distribution, if you see, the dimensional variation related uh, effects can be reduced in this way. So once we do it, we align nanowires and then these electrodes, these are, these are used to align the nanowires. They are, they are sitting on the back side of the substrate so you can remove them. Once you have nanowires, then we print metal lines. So 
we are not depositing these metal using standard metal deposition technique. And that's where the way we started focusing on sustainability. So we are trying to reduce the material that is used for the fabrication. So we print these metal lines and you can see here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, image, you can see these metal lines and between these metal lines, there are nanowires. So once we do it, this shows this uh, uh, image. They are, these are the optical images. You can see here uh, quite uh, a, a larger view, and that's the two electrodes between which we have sensor, we have the nanowires and quite a large image where you see these large number of nanowires connecting two electrodes. And then this is encapsulated. This is encapsulation is also printed in this case. And then we have PDMS as well. So we evaluated then after that, we evaluated these sensors under different conditions, including different encapsulation, PDMS and nano silica based epoxy encapsulation to understand if encapsulation itself could have an impact. And we also tested these sensors under different uh, heating cooling cycle that you see is 20 heating cooling cycle where you don't see kind of hysteresis that we typically come across. And we increased the temperature and we noted from, in this case, you can see from 30 degree to 100 degree Celsius. But not, not only this, we went to the lower side of the room temperature also. So our experimental arrangement allowed us to, to test from five degree up to, up to you know, 100 degrees. So we couldn't go below that, but that's because of the, the experimental uh, limitations. Otherwise, I theoretically, I don't see a challenge here even uh, uh, measuning low temperatures. So we uh, uh, evaluated the, the response, as you can see here, and we also under different uh, encapsulations. And this slide shows the response uh, time, uh, that, that's the response time is less than a second here, and the recovery time is, is about two seconds. So the sensor, temperature sensor, when you compare to the state of the art, they are quite fast, uh, in terms of both response as well as recovery. And in this case, you can see here, the variation is from room temperature up to 40 degrees. So that basically, if you compare with other sensors, this type of sensors could be then used uh, for real operations along with, uh, along with the pressure sensors. Uh, this response versus temperature, you can see on the right-hand side uh, under in this case, under different bending conditions. We bend the sensor, we also evaluated impact of the bending. Because when you bend a sensor, the every material has inherent piezoresistive property. The mobility of the charge carriers inside the material could be affected because of the, because of the, the band gap structure that all material they have. And that could lead to variation in the output and need to be evaluated when you use such sensors in real, uh, real uh, world applications. So these are examples where we uh, tested sensors over bending conditions and twisting conditions. And you can see here, this, is, this was twisting here was plus minus 90 degree. We noted that these sensors continue to respond in a quite stable way. Uh, this uh, uh, slide shows once we fabricated the device, tested them in the lab conditions, then we demonstrated how this could be applied in applications. And in this case, two applications, watch is wearable systems. For example, sensors was placed here on the wrist and in this case on the, on the forehead of a user and the body temperature was uh, detected very quickly by the sensor. So you can see here 32 degrees was on the forehead, whereas 30 degree, 35 degree was on the, on the wrist. And not only this, we also then evaluated the response of sensor under different breathing conditions. So it can also get the, the temperature uh, of, of, the, of the breath. So you can see here quick rising and, and, and decay, and then blowing hot air in a periodic way so just to show that there could be a stable response. And we evaluated under cold conditions and hot conditions by allowing robots to touch the, the, the moving a robot with sensor and touching a cold and hot object and seeing that response, it was, uh, the response was uh, quite effective. And this video shows the response. The sensor printed sensors are here on the fingertip 
this this side was the the image of the sensor itself one sensor there are a array of sensors in the fingertip here and when the user presses the sensor that's the response basically this is the body temperature that you see now is the hot air and we also evaluated when the temperature sensors was touched there was no impact of the pressure so it was only the temperature so these are the cold conditions you can see the response and uh, we uh, we carried out these response also under extreme conditions so this is again from cold to hot conditions it's going back and the the classifier allows us to to detect the threshold and and allows us to to, to control the robot uh, we evaluated the these the uh, response for extreme condition in this case the sensor was uh, exposed to a, a um, you can see here, uh, yeah, so red hot rod that was brought close to the, the sensor and uh, the reaction time was quite fast. So basically then uh, it allowed us to say that, you know, these temperature sensors can be integrated along with uh, pressure sensors and it could be an effective way to, to have a multi-model interaction. Now, that next example that I want to highlight is based on light detection sensing. One of the challenges that we come across when we talk about electronic skin is that electronic skin has sensors which are distributed over large area. And you may have at some point, you may have quite large number of sensors and there is also electronics associated with that. All this, when you put together, leads to the, the challenges in terms of how to power these sensors particularly when you are talking about autonomous robots or, or robots working in unstructured environments. So you need skin for safe interaction and for the reliable operations, but at the same time, energy means uh, these autonomous robots, they will have, um, they will, uh, their operational time can be lower. But at the same time, skin is, is an opportunity because skin is unlike other sensory modalities, skin is exposed to the ambient conditions. And if you can use suitable device, it can become a, a opportunity, you can generate energy. And first example in this case is the solar cells based energy autonomous skin, where we demonstrated by putting solar cells on the uh, using solar cells as part of the skin, you can generate energy. And not only these, the solar cells can also be used as touch sensors and also proximity sensor and an array of solar cells when we put together, you can use them for uh, uh, to detect the shadow and some level of vision. That's where I'm trying to bring vision and touch together through hardware. So we developed this uh, prototype that you see here on the screen. There were, uh, this is all commercial solar cells. So this is an example of heterogeneous integration. We picked up commercial solar cells and I, I must say these were not highly efficient solar cells. So these solar cells were then cut using laser. We, we uh, got one centimeter square solar cells and they were placed on the, on the soft material, soft substrate. In this case, it was, uh, we tried PDMS and uh, Ecoflex. We tried various combinations here. And they were integrated on these. There are, there are 32 solar cells that you see here. And eventually we, we put all of them on the palm of a 3D printed robotic hand. And we evaluated the response. We use the solar cell data. Now solar cells, when you are not touching them or when there is no shadow, or no, nothing blocking the light, they will continue to generate the energy. And that can be stored in the, in the batteries. In our case, we demonstrated, we put the battery here in this case and we charge those batteries also. So it can continue to work uh, as long as there's light. And then when you, block the solar cell, that, that means the amount of energy generated by a particular cell will go down and that will be an index, uh, indication of touch or proximity, depending on how much uh, the, the output is going down. We use this technique to, to uh, um, understand if the skin could be used for object recognition and also uh, for detection of motion. So we generated, uh, use this, uh, uh, the output we got from the palm area itself was 300 milli, uh, 380 milliwatt. And if you extend it for the whole body, adult human body, assuming 1.5 meter to be the, the skin size, 
then you can generate more than 100 watt. And as I said, these are not the highly efficient solar cells. If you use these solar cells, uh, the highest efficiency, perovskite, et cetera, then you could, uh, you could uh, consider higher output as well. That would be good enough to operate some of the motors. So that's why I said it's kind of it could be a, it could be an opportunity. So it also leads to new paradigm in terms of uh, you know distributed energy. Currently, you have in robotics you know kind of uh, battery as a backpack, but this could also lead to distributed energy, distributed sensing because solar cells are also the touch sensors in this case, and it also allows us to reduce the the complexity uh, that we have generally when we talk about integration of large number of devices. So same device is used for multiple things and uh, they are kind of very different. They, there's no sort of you know, cross, uh, uh, cross talk in this case. It's not a, uh, you are not measuring temperature and, and pressure with the same device. It's energy and, and the physical stimuli that you are, you are trying to get. So using this, we also demonstrated how this type of sensors could be used for, for detection of motion. You can see here some examples, some solar cells are placed here and the user, uh, uh, there's a light source coming and user, you can see the response on the bottom right, uh, you can see the response of these solar cells. So in each, uh, each row and uh, the, the light vary in the real time. It's quite, uh, there's no, uh, it's not fast. It's the actual time that is recorded here. And solar cells are quite fast in this case. So using this, then we also evaluated the skin example that I presented. The, the feedback from the solar cells, using that feedback to, to move the robotic hand and control the object. So you can see here, the solar cell response is going down. And that is what robot uses as an input to, to grasp. Um, and these videos are all available on my group's YouTube channel, so you can download them. So in this case, this is proximity. So the user is coming close to the, to the skin and robot uh, goes back. So that's basically, there are, I must say, we, we, uh, the skin also have IR sensors and we use that because the questions were, what happens in case of dark conditions? So you still can detect the proximity in those conditions, but those are all powered in this case by the skin. So uh, that's an example of the, of the uh, skin when you are using off the shelf components, but this can be, there's a limitation here. Solar cells are not flexible. They are placed on flexible substrate. So there's a global flexibility. What could be done to generate, to make it ultra flexible skin? Uh, just like we tried different type of uh, pressure sensors uh, using uh, you know, or highly flexible and soft sensors. In this case, uh, we have uh, also extended this approach. We are now printing photo detectors and we have printed solar cells also. I will not cover the solar cell part today because that's still under uh, review. But photo detector that we have printed using the technology, solar cell technology is also the same. So you will get a sense how this technology photo detectors are extended to solar cells. So we used, uh, we developed our own printing setup in this case. So we call it direct roll printing. What happens it, uh, in this case, we realize microstructures or nanostructures on the wafer and using roll printing setup, we, this is uh, uh, at certain pressure when, the, the substrate and the receiver, they are they have a force between them that's detected. So the roll starts and it lifts those wires from the wafer. And you will see on this, these wires are lifted from here and they are transferred on the flexible substrates. So that way you transfer the ultra thin layer from the wafer on the flexible substrate. You process these, so you got the electronic layers on the, on the flexible substrate. Once you get this, you process them further to obtain, you can even get transistors. We have demonstrated transistors also. I'm not going to talk about transistors today. So I'm focusing just on photo detectors, which is simply N and P junction. So you dope the, the, the nanostructures and then you transfer them on flexible substrate. Using this, we, we recently reported gallium arsenide based microstructures. So these are the, uh, these are the structure semi images when you have, these are still on the wafer. And then using uh, etching, we got these structures. And after that, we, we transferred them. You can see there is no uh, ribbon left on the wafer after they were transferred. 
So once you transfer them, this shows the various uh, different times, just to, to, to give you a sense of the, the fabrication of these structures is quite challenging. You have to control them. Basically, that's the critical element here. You need to stop at certain point where it's uh, it's kind of good enough to hold the ribbons on the on the wafer. It's not breaking, but when you bring the roll printing in contact, roll printing can also break it. At this point, for example, it would be difficult for roll printing to break. At this point, it's quite easy, but if you go beyond this point, there's no roll printing needed because all the ribbons have, there are no ribbons there. So we have to control, it's a delicate process. You have to control in terms of the all process conditions, time, temperature, chemical that you are using, etc. concentration of that chemical. And once you get this, so you see this, these are the kind of, this image shows the ribbons, which is anchored to the, to the wafer, and then you transfer them. So once you transfer, that's how the photo detector array looks like. Now you can have metal lines between these two, you have the gallium arsenide array. When light falls on gallium arsenide, because of the, again, because of energy band gap, you see that variation, it's able to, there will be the flow of charge carriers, yes. And that gives you an idea of, uh, you know, that allows these detectors to detect light. Now these detectors, consider these detectors as a, as a array and how then you can detect the light or shadow as we detect it in case of solar cells. And also you can detect the motion. So in that regard, the skin, we don't have these, our skin does not have this type of capability, but artificial skin or electronic skin can certainly have new capabilities. And that would be an attractive way. You may imagine in future skin, also kind of a giving you a 3D view in terms of images, in terms of shadow. It won't be vision as we know, it won't be camera as, we, as, as it captures the, 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 the real images, but it can give you somewhere in between. So that blurry would be, uh, picture would be possible. And this is possible, not just in case of uh, vision spectrum. These gallium arsenide I picked up as an example here because this also works in near infrared as well as ultraviolet. So that gives the skin the capability to operate under different light conditions. If a robot is working in a clean room environment where you have yellow light, you may use it. In the daylight, white light, you can use it, but also in other conditions. So I have some other examples, but you know, it just gives you an idea, flavor uh, of what is possible, what new, uh, modalities can be brought into the into the skin domain. Uh, I would skip those slides, but I'm here if you want to uh, ask more questions. Uh, perhaps I'll I'll stop with this video, which shows how we also evaluate these devices under different twisting and bending conditions. So you can see all these after fabrication; they are subjected to quite extreme uh, experimental conditions. In this case, plus minus ninety degree twisting. So these nanostructures, and once you do this, then we also then, we basically then uh, test the condition, the uh, outcome before and after, just to see how the, the sensors, they respond. If, uh, if there is, they are experiencing these bending, twisting uh, in real life, these, uh, these conditions. So you can see here before testing and after testing, response of detectors is quite the same. Okay. All right. So well, uh, uh, I would I would stop at this point in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you showed us a picture of aligned nanowires. Yes. Uh, can you explain more about how to make the wires aligned? Okay. Well, uh, in, in that picture, we used uh, simply the uh, this technique called dielectrophoresis. So what happens is you are applying electric uh, high voltage between two electrodes. So that generates the electrostatic forces and they are good enough to to align the nanowires along, you know, along the electrodes. Does this quite fast? Yes, it's quite fast. It's actually 
within you know milliseconds, less than milliseconds, you can align them. And that is what we are trying to explore uh, in a different area to get the electronics here, circuits. Thank you for your nice presentation. I, I really thought it was very cute, the robot reacting to the hot and cold. And But humans, we do that for preservation because it's something that's bad for us. Can you tell us a little more what you think heat and cold sensing will be useful for, for robots? Like I also agree it's something we should invest more in, but yes. what, what's the future you see there? Uh, well, uh, when we developed it, was our view was not just about robotics, but also prosthetics. You know, when you put these temperature sensors, if you just a uh, user wants to have a feel of you know, object they are touching, as an example, cold beer. So it's very important because, you know, psychologically, we, we associate the taste with the, with the conditions of the object, you know, the, so it was that kind of motivation in case of robotics also, uh, uh, if you see uh, particularly uh, hazardous environment where you may experience high temperatures, you may want to see that structure remains, uh, you know, it, it, it continues to operate in a stable way. And that's where you need uh, this type of uh, sensors. It may not be required for normal human robot interaction though. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a uh, fantastic working presentation. Thanks. So uh, the optical sensor at the end, uh, it was made on a flexible substrate, right? Yes. So what happens if you make it on stretchable substrate and how the sensor would respond in that, right. in that scenario? Uh, well, uh, we did not demonstrate in this case, but uh, uh, other groups have demonstrated that when you transfer these nanostructures, uh, they are they are highly flexible. Okay, you can transfer them on pre-stretched substrate, and then release them. So they will buckle a little bit, but they can withstand that much of stress. And you can then use it in stretchable conditions also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just quickly. Uh... I think the last question um, is perfect timing for the next speaker. Uh, Lucy, are you there? Right. Is she with us? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next speaker yes, is. Yes, I'm here. Uh, it's a specialist in uh, stretchable uh, uh, sensor, uh, robotic or soft robotics. And now uh, she's going into artificial uh, touch. And um, she, one of the key papers that she would uh, have is a uh, stretchable sensor. So I think uh, the, it, the last question actually follow on to our speaker. So I want to introduce Lucia, if she can pop up. Um, Lucia, can you share our screen? Yes, hello. Hi, Lucia. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this workshop. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much for, uh, for your introduction, uh, Gordon. As a matter of fact, uh, actually, we, we've known each other since a long time uh, when I was in uh, Santana. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was working at, uh, let's say, uh, bionic systems for the cyber hand, so the human hand. But uh, so uh, then I moved to the Italian Institute of Technology. And uh, today I, I want to actually introduce you some new concepts and some new ideas that we are, uh, um, that we are um, uh, addressing in my team. And uh, uh, so um, this is um, uh, the title, the Elephant Trunk as a new model of tactile perception. And um, so can you see my presentation? Yes. Yeah, we can see okay, so um, in, my team is called Soft by Robotics uh, Perception, and our mission is to create uh, new soft and embody sensing systems because we want to uh, develop the technologies, but we want to focus on touch to develop new robotic solutions that can sense the, uh, the environment that we live in and uh, also have an intelligent interaction. Um, so you know that um, here, uh, I, I try to just give some, some insight about uh, the fact of 
uh, the, the embodied intelligence uh, that um, we should consider when uh, developing also our components and our technologies. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think yes. it, your slides are not moving. Um, probably you can oh, really? share your, uh, your slides both screen. Probably you, we can see. Uh, Sorry? We were still uh, uh, at the first slide. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now? Yeah. If you put it uh, like presenter mode, so probably we can see. Uh, I did, I did put as presenter mode. Uh, but what we can see is, uh, you know, it's not. Okay. So let me share my screen instead of the presentation. I don't know why it doesn't work. So let me share the screen. Okay. So now I try again with the presentation mode. Yeah. Can you see now shifting? Um, actually, uh, we can see your notes. <laughs> so uh, probably your oh, okay. The other screen you have. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Um, so I have to share the screen, and I share the 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 presentation. So the PowerPoint, I share the PowerPoint, and then if I put the the slideshow, can you see now? Uh, it's just probably showing up, but we still can't see. Can you see? I still know. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's annoying. You can't see the, the slides changing? No. Um, we are still on the mission page. If she's got two monitors. Mm. So yeah. I don't know what I should do. I shared my presentation. You have two monitors. Sorry? You have two monitors. Yes. Oh, oh. okay. So I take away one monitor. Okay. Yeah. No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it could be easier. Yeah. Okay. So let's try again. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. We make it. Yes. Thank great. you. Okay, so, okay, so did you see the slides change? Yeah, we can see it, yeah. Okay, so um, try to catch up. So actually, um, you know, due to the, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, seamlessly, seamless interaction between our body and the environment, uh, as you can see here, I brought two examples, not uh, in case, but <laughs> not by chance, but a human hand that is scratching a surface and, uh, um, a trunk tip of an elephant that is uh, interacting with a, a human hand. So, uh, you know, the, um, the interaction with the environment and uh, is really important to consider. And uh, to this, then of course we have to uh, uh, consider the transduction, the conversion and the encoding. And this um, happens uh, already in passive touch, no? And this, uh, is affected by the physics of contact, the materials, the tissues, like we've uh, also heard before by Ravinder, uh, the, the, the kind of interaction. Uh, but then if um, in active touch, of course, what is important is the movement, okay? So all these, let's say, uh, aspects no, uh, um, need, um, in, in the in the perception, a body that can have a passive and active soft adaptability. May this be articulated, bone or boneless? Actually, this is one of the of the of the of the things that we have to consider when uh, developing new uh, intelligent tactile systems. So uh, you know, um, uh, there is a uh, there's a. Um, quite, uh, let's say, um, exploding field of soft robotics where we can, uh, um, we can, um, let's say, um, I mean, we can have systems that can deform and can adapt to the, uh, to the environment by uh, different materials, by an intrinsic, let's say, uh, adaptability and compliance, but also uh, with the, uh, um, uh, with some architecture. And uh, uh, of course here, uh, the, um, the, 
the proprioception and the exteroception, the distinction is, uh, is really hard to make because the systems are uh, deformable. And so uh, the, uh, the detection of the different, let's say, um, uh, sensing uh, uh, systems is uh, more, more difficult. But what we do in our team is that we are trying to, let's say, use the soft robotic approach in order to investigate uh, new, uh, new tactile systems systems with uh, an embodied approach. So our main research areas are three. Uh, so one is on soft tactile sensors in skins, uh, then the development of soft robotic systems for uh, uh, performing active touch. And then we are um, also moving to bias biomorphologies for, for soft robotics. And uh, I would like to then, uh, let's say, uh, gi um, give you first a little bit of uh, um, some, uh, let's say, overview of the main uh, uh, sensing technologies that we've been uh, develop developing in the uh, uh, for tactile sensing. Uh, and then I would like to introduce you this new model that we're considering, uh, which is the elephant trunk. And so, uh, you know, for um, soft sensing is possible. We know uh, there are a lot of technologies today. So for example, in our team, these are uh, some, some old uh, publications. We have explored different kinds of uh, soft sensing transduction mechanisms. Like on the top, you see, uh, um, a capacitive three axial uh, soft sensor that can, let's say, although it has a very, very simple uh, um, technology with a, a, a soft PDMS material and fluorosilicons and um, uh, let's say electric textiles, it could detect uh, very nicely uh, the three axial force. But then we can use also inductive sensing, inductive sensing, which can be very fast and which can be also very robust. Here it's shown for pressure sensing. But what I would like to highlight, why did I show this is, and I like always to show these videos, even if they're quite old, here you see a section of the, pre of the previous capacitive sensor, and you can see actually how, you know, by interacting with the, with the finger, right, how the finger adapts to the material and how the materials and their combination are the sensor core. Um, so this is actually one, one point that we have uh, to consider, the materials, but also the interaction with the environment. And then, um, of course, uh, the soft sensing called more, let's say, broadly mechanical sensing um, uh, can be used to uh, detect also not only uh, tactile um, information, but also information about the movement, for example, of our devices. And uh, in this case, for example, we, uh, we explored uh, by using, um, you know, a very typical layout of um, a coil, but just by flexing or bending the coil, we can have a very nice, let's say, information about either the angle of the folding or the curvature of the of this uh, pneumatic uh, artificial muscle uh, without um, uh, being affected by the uh, nonlinearity of the material. Okay, so one of the aspects in soft robotics, which is really hard, is uh, the fact that uh, we want to detect precise mechanical properties uh, of, let's say, um, uh, yeah. Um, let's say mechanic, response to the mechanical uh, stimuli, but we have materials that are nonlinear, viscoelastic. And so the, uh, these nonlinearities affect a lot the response of our sensors. And so we can have uh, high hysteresis and um, noise. And so this is very uh, hard. Uh, um, these are very difficult features uh, so that uh, these sensors can be effectively used in robotics. So for example, in this case, instead of uh, doing a strain measurement, uh, depending on the, let's say the strain of the material, we measure the variation of the magnetic uh, field that is being concatenated by the, in, the, um, in the coil. And uh, this then uses the volume, the volume around uh, the, the actuator, the movement. And then we could also uh, investigate by uh, collaborating with Professor Union Jung from Postec, uh, some new, let's say, stretchable uh, coils um, for strain sensing by uh, the uh, material that they have developed on hydrogen-doped 
uh, liquid metal microparticles. But then uh, what I would like to maybe highlight among all the, uh, these uh, cases is one uh, sensing technology on which we are focusing a lot in my group, which is the optical waveguide skin technology. So um, we have introduced this concept actually many, many years ago in uh, the soft robotics community. Uh, so the fact that actually um, by using and I think maybe can be interesting in this workshop today, uh, by using, let's say, um, uh, a substrate that is transparent to uh, some uh, electromagnetic uh, wave, like for example, uh, infrared light or near infrared light, um, these uh, by touching, so this is the typical, let's say on the top, if you have a rigid substrate and a photometer on the left and a photoreceiver on the right, uh, you can actually then have, because of the uh, refraction of the signals when touching the, the, the surface and um, putting a camera underneath this rigid substrate, you can have a tactile image. Then if you had add another dimension, so you add the deformation of the substrate, then we can actually somehow, um, uh, we can have, a, 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 an optical loss of the signal from the meter to the receiver. And so we can detect the pressure on this, on this let's say, substrate. So we patented this, this concept quite some time ago, especially we extended this uh, spatially, this concept spatially. So actually by distributing at the boundary of a, of a soft sensing area, uh, an altern uh, alternate uh, emitters and detectors and activating them, uh, it is possible actually to uh, detect, uh, uh, reconstruct the pressure map on this, on this system. No? Uh, so actually we've tried in the years several, let's say, uh, methods for uh, reconstructing the, the map, in, in including the uh, EIT-based approach or machine learning approach, is each with their pros and cons in sense of, let's say the complexity of the processing when we want to increase the number of, let's say, um, uh, components. And so um, lately we have developed a, a new system, which is a, this multi-touch soft optical waveguide skin, um, where uh, we have a graded skin uh, with several layers of uh, PDMS. And um, so as you see here, as I said before, the substrate is a continuum waveguide and where there is of course no one one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between the uh, emitters and the, and the receivers. And these, uh, this system uh, can be built in different shapes. And we have experimented, for example, the circular and the, and the, 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 the square. Okay, and um, so um, the um, this uh, optical waveguide. What we have done is that we have developed um, a pattern recognition contact map, and we have used actually a time delay neural neural, neural network for uh, having some high stereosis compensation here on the right. You see, for example, how this, of course, has some differences, no? depending on moving from the center of the sensor, in the case of a circular sensor. But you can see very, very nice curves uh, of the optical output um, without actually uh, high hysteresis, with very, very low high hysteresis. And so in the end, you can see here some videos that uh, I highlight uh, on this system. We have um, about 300 centimeters square for the moment and uh, um, the sensing range for each cell, which is actually a virtual cell, okay? So what you see here, the grid that you see on the top right is a virtual grid, but there is no wiring and nothing in the, in the sensing area. And we can have this real-time reconstruction with a spatial resolution of about five millimeter, also on curved surfaces up to, uh, we've tested up to um, uh, 30. Uh, a, a radius of curvature of 30 millimeters. So um, uh, there is also a fault tolerance mechanism that we can um, use in order to, if, uh, you know, to make the system more robust. No? Uh, so this I think can be a nice, let's say uh, a nice uh, um, uh, development that could be also find uh, application on uh, um, all types of robots in also more extended areas. But then, uh, of course, one of the issues is the ambient noise uh, in sense of the light. And so we have 
developed a uh, uh, very uh, highly elastic uh, uh, coating uh, in order to shield uh, the light uh, with a composite that uh, is made of um, uh, Ecoflex uh, uh, matrix with um, titanium dioxide uh, nanoparticles, which, which works very well uh, in order to, let's say, uh, shield the, the ambient light. And what is really interesting is that uh, we can play around with different configurations and we can, for example, develop uh, types of sensors that are insensitive to pressure, but only to strain, like you can see here on the top right. So for example, in this case, uh, when you bend the sensor and when you, you, you touch it, uh, with uh, with uh, you know uh, with, you impose an indentation a pressure, there is actually no doesn't really affect the sensor. But if I strain the sensor, then it has a big change of um, of response. And this is because all the signals stay inside because all the the, the sample is coated with this uh, with this layer. Um, and so by tuning, actually, we, uh, by tuning the concentration of the, uh, the uh, titanium dioxide particle, uh, then we can, uh, uh, let's say, um, um, by tuning, let's say, several parameters, we can have uh, different characteristics of the, of the, of the sensor. So, um, but then, you know, uh, what we do also is uh, we, uh, we develop uh, different kinds of, of grippers. And this is, for example, um, I want just to show it very, very quickly, uh, an example that's just been be, being published on, um, let's say, using uh, volumetric tessellations to develop uh, pneumatic muscles that can actually have uh, different modalities, um, both bidirectional, but also um, uh, they can extend and they can contract uh, based on a positive and a negative pressure. Um, and with this, we can make uh, different kinds of grippers and we will uh, integrate uh, sensing inside. But then, um, I mean, is, uh, the the hand, the human hand, the only effective way to enable you know uh, versatile and dexterous manipulation. Perhaps not. We are we know from the literature there is a lot going on on uh, taking uh, you know different kinds of examples from octopus from uh, uh, other kinds of animals. And what we are considering is as a model is the proboscis of the elephant. So. Um, you know the proboscis of the elephant trunk is really a natural, uh, a natural uh, model of versatile grasping and manipulation because it can reach, it can grip, it can do that in different environments, and it's an amazing model, uh, and it can actually do uh, can deal a lot of um, handle a lot of objects uh, of different sizes and uh, and weights, and. Uh, so here, for example, you see some uh, some videos uh, where you know you can see quite some dexterous uh, Sorry, Lucy. Uh, movements. Under two minutes. Okay, and so uh, actually, what is really interesting is that um, the, the elephant trunk can see uh, the world uh, by touch. Okay, and this uh, can be done. Uh, I mean, in, it, it, it's really interesting because it has a really uh, uh, complicated and tough uh, skin, uh, mammalian skin, and that the um, this is actually uh, what we are uh, studying. And so, uh, in our project, uh, the proboscis project, we aim at investigating this link between the material properties, the morphology, and the environment. And this is a, a FET project that I coordinate. And so uh, we study the anatomical features of the trunk and also the strategies in order to develop new soft robotics technologies and uh, new paradigms for universal manipulators. Uh, so what we do in my team, we, we study the uh, skin of the elephant. And uh, um, so, you know, the skin has, is very, very wide, it's very large of the elephant, and it can have many functionalities depending on the position. And what we are doing is that we are studying the structure and the morphology of um, this very peculiar skin and, and trying in order to 
trying to understand how the biomechanical features can affect the uh, the strain uh, distribution in the in the in the skin. So um, I will skip this. So we can uh, we can uh, let's say use uh, we have used uh, different samples of uh, prox of the proximal part of the trunk in order to do indentation and tensile testing. And from indentation, we can see that actually there are two main main layers of the skin, which is the corium and the um, and the uh, the epidermis, which have quite different uh, characteristics, and so we can uh, model this with a bilayer. Uh, we can have a bilayer model, and with the ten set testing, you can see quite some difference between samples. Uh, because of course they are uh, very different uh, because of their morphological characteristics due to wrinkles and folds. And so we develop uh, different models in order to shed light on how the strain can be uh, distributed on uh, indentation, but also on uh, traction. And uh, uh, so what we want to do is that we want to develop new, uh, let's say biomechanical uh, inspired uh, mockups in order to study how, uh, let's say, this can uh, this uh, morphology um, can affect to validate these models. And as you can see here, we are still quite far because the materials that we're using, actually, in the artificial skin, the yellow curve are still quite different from the from the natural model. Uh, but then another thing that we do is that we also study how the trunk actually can interact with the environment. I'm finished, I just have one minute. And so we set up experiments in which uh, we uh, study how uh, the trunk manipulates and grasps and manipulates uh, objects uh, without using vision. And um, so um, we developed sensorized objects for to quantify the tactile interaction. Like here, you see an object which has uh, 80 tactile uh, built with uh, inductive sensors in order to detect in real time uh, the, uh, the interaction forces that we find be very finely, let's say, tuned by the, uh, by the, uh, by the animal because the pressure is constant during the grasping state. Uh, the grasping, let's say, face, uh, the lift, uh, the the hold face uh, in the grasping uh, task, and. Um, so this is a major finding, and we can also see actually what is the shape of the content. So let's say, um, sorry, I made very fast, I went very fastly through these very important concepts, but what I wanted to transmit to you is that this uh, new model can be really considered as a new, uh, this elephant trunk as a new model of tactile perception, and we will pursue this in the next years. And uh, we have some initial lessons uh, that we are uh, extracting from our experiments, like that the distal wrap is a major role in object grasping, that the pressure can be finely tuned. Uh, and so uh, with, you know, most probably very nice, let's say, uh, tactile system uh, in which, with which the, the skin is endowed. But then, you know, the skin microstructure must be needs more, much, much, much more, uh, let's say, uh, investigation efforts. So with this, I thank you very much. And I'm sorry for, uh, let's say, uh, the problems in the in the showing the slides. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, we're going to take some very quick questions. Uh, the elephant is very cool. All right. Any questions? If not, I have a quick one just on uh, the stretchable sensor. How sensitive is it to the um, temperature? Well, actually, uh, we didn't test the temperature to the of the sensor. Uh, and uh, so, it, you know, it, it actually is a sensor that can detect uh, pressure, okay? It doesn't have temperature yet. Okay, thank you. I look forward to see it. There's a question in the audience. Uh, thank you for your... Uh, amazing presentation. I have quite one question uh, regarding the uh, softer optical wave guide skin. Like yes, yes. I saw the shape of those two candle kind of skin is the regular shape, like the cube, uh, like like the re rectangle and the uh, circle. So what will happen if like the shape is a irregular shape? How yes, this is a very good question. Thank you for this question. So actually. Uh, what will happen is that we will need to, uh, let's say, elaborate, uh, you know, you have, um, we, ha uh, we have, um, 
you, you need to uh, develop a very dense, uh, let's say, um, distribution of emitters and detectors at the periphery in order to not have any blind spots, right? So this is one thing. But what is really nice is that you can really adapt the shape and you can then use the, let's say, the, um, the, the, the algorithms and the, 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 that we develop in order to, let's say, uh, have this, uh, uh, you know, spatial distribution. Uh, but to respond to your question, yes, that's a, it, it, that is uh, something which is a, a challenge, but, it, you know, we just have to unite the two methods used for the circular and for the square. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to close this uh, uh, talk, and then we're going to go into light, light, sweet uh, session with the poster. Thank you, Lucy, once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I get the uh, poster speaker up here? You have two minutes each. Seven uh, for this session. Okay. So if you can line up over there, so we can make yeah, it. And then you can come up and yeah. use this. Yeah. So it's controlled by by Guan over there. Okay. So Eric, your yeah. first. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for listening today. My name is Eric Chang. I'm from Columbia University. Um, Today I'm presenting on behalf of Peter, John, and Matei. Um, so I'm going to echo what Ravinder started his talk with, which is that there's a lot of literature on, you know, high resolution tactile sensors with high resolution tactile images, force information, pressure maps, etc. But our human skin can sense, you know, so many other modalities like temperature, vibration, pain, and these are relatively underexplored in robotics. So in this work, we have built a prototype of a multimodal tactile sensor that combines force, vibration, temperature, and proximity. Taking inspiration from the many specialized types of receptors in the human skin, um, we have chosen many different types of sensors to, to target the different facets of touch. So for example, we have capacitive force sensors targeting the slow acting static force signals. We have arrays of MEMS microphones, accelerometers, um, and PVDF, which is a piezoelectric, um, to target higher frequency vibrations. Um, we have arrays of temperature sensors. And then finally, um, we use protected capacitance for proximity measurements. Um, so while we're working towards a, a tactile finger, um, this prototype is a planar test bed that we're using to test a lot of different modalities before integrating them into a finger form factor. Um, so finally, overall, we're, we're really excited about this idea that we can have some sensors that are tuned to sense, you know, say the very slight onset of touch with very low latency, some sensors that are tuned to higher frequency vibration, and then other sensors reserved for, you know, pressure maps and, and higher force tactile information. So thank you, and please come see me on my poster if you want to chat. So object pushing uh, represents a non-prehensile um, manipulation task that's quite illustrative of more complex uh, robotic manipulation problems. Uh, so humans can do this quite easily with ease. So we can actually push objects without seeing um, seeing the object itself and just using touch. But for robots, um, we the robots needs to uh, be able to infer certain object properties uh, using just uh, and also control the objects using just touch and proprioceptive uh, uh, sensing. So to do this, we uh, used a simple real RL framework, um, and we mainly explore two quite uh, two uh, questions here: Would a model free RL perform? Um, how does a model free RL perform compared to model based RL in terms of generalizability and robustness? And also, how does a pose-based observation compare to kind of raw tactile images um, for in terms of sim to real transfer effectiveness? And to do that, we trained uh, three different RL agents, um, two model-free RL and also a model-based uh, RL agent. And we perform a sim to real a zero shot sim to real transfer by training uh, individual uh, observation models. Um, 
our simulation uh, environment is quite simple. So we only use uh, a cube, to a uh, simple cube. And um, we're able to show that kind of by uh, formulating this RL problem into uh, uh, just using touch sensing, we're able to generalize to a bunch of objects with different properties without any sort of domain adaptation um, or domain randomization. So, um, so if you want to know more about the methods and the results, um, come to see me. I'm a person. Hi, uh, building an autonomous system that a robot arm with a soft gripper can uh, find the target and approaches uh, the target um, and uh, correctly grasp it and uh, without having any collision might be uh, trickier than I thought than we thought. So our team in the universe of Bristol um, um, built such a system and took place in uh, a uh, food handling and assembling competition of Robosoft uh, conference in last April. And we would like to show our uh, problems or how difficult it will be uh, to pick up the food item correctly uh, and autonomously. And we would like to share our thoughts and problems. Also separately, uh, we our team are developing um, uh, tactile sensing based uh, soft gripper as well. So if you want to uh, check our poster, if you want to check with me, thanks. So uh, this work, we developed a miniaturized version of the BRL tactic, tactile sensor. Um, so it's an optical tactile sensor um, and developed it to be the size of a human fingertip and fit onto um, a PISA IT soft hand. Um, and we then went on to develop a hardware platform to capture and process those tactile images uh, in parallel and then use that feedback um, as part of a simple linear grasping controller that can provide um, like a sort of semi force sensitive gentle grasp to a wide range of objects, regardless of geometry and stiffness. Um, so we did some tests on that, comparing the performance of it to pre-existing literature on gentle grasping with the soft hand. Um, and then we went on to do some experiments to contextualize it in terms of a uh, human robot collaboration. So shown here at the bottom as a, as a handover task. So the gentle grasping makes it safe to be used in conjunction with, with humans. So um, yeah, if you'd like to know more and discuss the results, then come and find me at my poster. Uh, hello, everyone. Like in this presentation, we can, uh, we show the unsupervised adversary domain adaptation for simple transfer or uh, tactile manipulation scales. So as we all know, like simple transfer or uh, tactile manipulation scale can be uh, like a good way to re reduce the causal data collection, but uh, the same to real gap is always like make the trained model in simulation highly to be applied to the real world. So in this work, uh, we firstly propose like an um, uh, ACT night like uh, uh, a a tensile like uh, network, and uh, also like we apply this uh transfer model to uh for the manipulation task the we can see the red the red one like it can be applied for the in-hand post estimation and also we demonstrate like uh after applying this transfer model like uh the manipulation uh task can be achieved very well yeah so thank you if, actually i'm not the first author so <laughs> if you have any question i will try my best to answer it, you <laughs> Yep. Hello, everyone. My name is Mauro. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bristol, working in Nathan Lepore's lab. Um, our work is about reconstructing 3D objects using vision-based tactile sensing um, and neural implicit representations or neural fields. Um, neural fields like NERF, DeepSTF, or QPASI networks um, are relatively recent but extremely popular techniques in computer vision and 3D, 3D deep learning um, to encode and reconstruct 3D objects. And a question we had was, can we use these techniques um, to reconstruct objects with vision-based tactile sensing rather than cameras? 
um, and then use these reconstructions later on in uh, downstream tasks? And the answer is yes. Yeah. So we are proposing an approach where a robot first collects tactile images on an object surface. We then map, so we then reconstruct local surfaces at touch location using uh, these tactile images. Um, and once we have all these this local surfaces, we then condition uh, neural fields, specifically a deep STF network on these local surfaces um, to reconstruct the entire object. And these here, so these are results that we obtained, examples of results. The um, uh, objects to reconstruct are those on the rightmost column. And as you can see, the uh, reconstruction quality is quite poor at first um, with a single touch, but it improves as the number of touches increases. So this is very exciting. We you're seeing here three objects, but we actually train and test with uh, 1,500 objects. So this is quite general. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in knowing more about this or and discussing through the deep learning, neural fields, et cetera, come and talk with me. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Julio. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Alicante. And in this work, we try to solve the task of sleep detection using the vision-based tactile sensor known as Digit. This sensor only provides an RGB image without visual markers as output, instead of providing other tactile information such as force or, or depth. So our question here is if we can solve the, the task of tactile of sleep detection, sorry, uh, using this kind of, of sensor. So first we we created and annotated our own tactile segmentation data set. Later we implemented our method, which is made up of two main stages. In the first one, we used CNNs. Um, to to um, to carry out the tactile segmentation task, and in the second one we can use different techniques such as PCA ellipse fitting or skeleton thinning to estimate the angle of rotation uh, produced by slippage. Finally, we um, we did two main experiments. In the first one, we compared different CNNs for the task of tactile segmentation, obtaining similar and good results. And uh, in the second experiment, we compared the different algorithms to estimate the angle of rotation. And we show that um, the skeleton thinning algorithm gets lower error and deviation compared to the other two approaches. So um, finally, um, we can say that our method is able to measure the angle of rotation um, with a maximum error of uh, three degrees in the worst case. And so I think I have to wait because I have like a small video at the end. But I okay. So, so oh no. You can do the post stuff. Yeah. Okay. The I will show stuff. the video after. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And um, I'm not going to sh shorten the coffee. Uh, we have uh, shortened the coffee break and the poster break already. So please enjoy the coffee and please go to the posters. Uh, and we're back here at 11.30. So have fun. This session will be chaired by me. And uh, uh, so I have included one QR code here. Uh, so you can share your thoughts, your questions um, to the panel uh, as the end. We have um, uh, a panel discussion uh, session as we did in 2019. Uh, so you can post your questions and uh, your thoughts there as we are organizing this uh, uh, special issue and we would like to uh, uh, foster these discussions in the community. So well, um, please uh, post your comments there. Okay, so I will start with uh, some updates uh, from our research group. Um, so we have a uh, robot perception lab at King's College, uh, College London, and we have been working on a uh, very tactile perception. And today I will uh, share some of our recent updates on the, uh, on the visual tactile perception in the real and also the virtual worlds. So I split my talk into two uh, sections. So the first one is the real world, how we can use uh, these tactile sensors in grasping, medication, different tasks. And also uh, have, we have got some works uh, recently on how to use such tactile sensors in the virtual world 
and uh, transfer this knowledge and models uh, to the uh, real world. Uh, so as you can see in these uh, examples, our main applications would be how to use uh, this tactile sensor to uh, enable like rich physical interaction with the, with the world. Um, and we are looking at two example challenging objects. So one is transparent objects. Uh, it's quite challenging for vision. As for depth or RGB images, it's quite challenging for the vision to detect these objects. So in uh, this work, we have been using tactile sensing with vision uh, to augment the capability, capability of the robot to uh, perceive these objects. And also we have been working on deformable objects. Uh, here is a cable and we can use vision and tactile sensing uh, in the manipulation of such objects. So first of all, I will share some of our recent uh, updates, um, very, uh, visual tactile perception in the real world. And probably you have seen this uh, uh, tactile sensor we have developed uh, in 2020, uh, we call it the gel tape, and it was the first all around high resolution uh, finger tactile sensor. And also uh, the tactile skin was covered on a curved surface. Um, and it gave us a lot of challenges to address. As you can see here, we have a camera as the base um, as for other optical tactile sensors. Uh, and we have a finger shaped uh, a body for the contact with objects. So by having this finger shaped body, we can detect uh, the contact around uh, the finger. So we can detect the finger, uh, the contacts inside the grasp, but also the contacts outside the grasp. So it can be very useful for uh, this cluttered environment uh, interaction. So these contacts can come uh, from any angles. And from this sensor, you can get very detailed texture. As you can see here, we have the texture of the strawberry from our uh, sensor. And we have been using this sensor for uh, various applications, uh, for example, for uh, contact detection, so that it can recognize <coughs> this contact location and also the shapes of these objects. And we have uh, used this uh, uh, tactile sensor for grasping. So in this grid world, um, this physical grid world, uh, we have a few blocks um, placed on the table and we have these uh, grippers equipped with our uh, gel tape sensor uh, to grasp uh, these objects from these grids. As you can see, we have uh, the contacts from, uh, can, it, the contacts can be from any directions, but the sensor can, can detect these contacts and better plan uh, its motions. And recently, <clears throat> we have been using uh, such tactile sensors in uh, grasping transparent objects. As I mentioned, these transparent objects can pose a big challenge for vision systems. So as you can see here, we have a transparent glass. Um, and if we use a pure vision uh, system, it will be uh, a very uh, challenging task to detect these uh, contact points uh, and also plan its grass. So here we propose uh, a method called vision guided tactile poking. So like we humans, uh, when we see these um, transparent objects, if we are unsure um, their shape or other information, we will have a glance of these objects. And then we predict uh, the place to contact these objects. For um, example, we can poke this object to get some uh, detailed information or more accurate information. So this is the uh, main idea of our approach. So we uh, analyze the video image and we have a poke pre-night to predict the contact area. Um, so for example, the edge on the top of uh, the glass cup. And then we can predict uh, the poking points. Uh, we can generate one point for uh, the tactile sensor to contact this edge. And then from this tactile sensor equipped, with, uh, uh, equipped onto this robot arm, we can get this tactile image. And this tactile image can augment uh, the perception of the transparent objects, and we can get a better idea what it, where it is and how it, uh, uh, the shape of it, and we can better plan the grasp the, uh, of these transparent objects. Um, and uh, this is our uh, experiment setup. As you can see here, we have a transparent object, we have this RGBD camera, and we have this robot arm equipped with uh, 
uh, the tactile sensor uh, underneath the robot arm. You may have a question why we have it underneath the robot arm. Um, so I will, it's a long story. I will leave it for the um, questions or you can talk to me why we had it. So, um, but basically we can use it for, for poking this uh, glass cup and then we can better grasp uh, this uh, transparent object. Here's a quick demo how we did it. So you can see we can have a glance and we get the poking points and we poke it. So you can see this tactile image and then the uh, tactile uh, gripper can pick up this glass car better. And this method has generalized while well for different objects uh, like uh, a glass cup lying on the uh, uh, flats on the table and also a plastic cup uh, like on the rise. And also we have did some ex uh, we have done some experiments on optic objects. As you can see here, um, this method can also uh, can be applied to optic objects. Um, it's much easier, but uh, it can be generalized to different objects. So the first section uh, was on the real world uh, experiment. And we have seen these sensors. We have seen how we use such sensors uh, in grasping manipulation. Uh, next, we will I will introduce you some of our updates on um, the visual tactile perception in the virtual world. Um, so we got one uh, work on simulating the optical tactile sensors uh, around in two, 2019. And we got one paper in RAW on the very first simulation model for optical tactile sensors. The motivation behind having this uh, simulation model is that it's very fragile if we have the, the skin for tactile sensors, for all of these tactile sensors. If we use it too much, so it will wall out, um, but it could be much easier to train your model in simulation and you don't have this problem to wear out uh, your silicon or your skin. So that's why we propose this simulation model so that you can train your robot agents in simulation. Once it's trained, you can fine tune it uh, in the real world so that you can save your tactile skins. So we have uh, considered several um, uh, sensors. Uh, one is the gel side sensor. The other is our gel tape sensor. I have just introduced all of these sensors. They have this uh, soft elastomer as the skin. And we use this uh, same to real learning to, uh, um, to train these robot agents before deploying them in the real world. We started from uh, the, uh, we started with the gel set sensor. It's uh, much easier compared to, uh, compared to the gel tape sensor. And it has a flat surface and the light will travel uh, linearly in this uh, uh, scheme. Uh, in this work, we addressed the one problem. Uh, of uh, simulating the skin. As you know, the skin is highly deformable, it's nonlinear. Uh, it will be very time consuming to simulate uh, the, uh, uh, the, the features of uh, uh, its dynamics when it deforms. So we go around this challenge um, by introducing this depth sensor. So as you know, for the gel set sensor in the real world, we have this RGB uh, sensor. But uh, in the simulation, we introduce this depth sensor so that we can get uh, the depth map from the depth sensor. And then we can smoothen uh, this, uh, sh the, the depth map. And then we can, it's something like the real world. Uh, when we get in contact with something, uh, we may have this uh, Gaussian filtering um, like uh, phenomenon when we get in contact with, with uh, objects. So that's what we had for the smoothing. Uh, of the elastomer height map. And then we have these uh, normals uh, from this context. And we can render uh, these uh, uh, depth maps with uh, the fault model so that we can get the colors as we did in the real tactile image. So that's how we get the RGB tactile image in the simulation. And we have got some uh, experiments in the real world and also the uh, virtual world. So we have got this uh, 3D printer equipped with our uh, gel set sensor. Um, as you can see, um, we have these outputs and in the real life, and also we have the um, outputs from the simulation. As you can see, there are still some uh, gaps. Um, for example, these uh, textures and also the misalignment um, in, of the lo location. But you can see we have made the very first simulation model 
uh, for a work for this uh, optical tactile sensors. And we have done some uh, works for comparing our simulation uh, measure against the real uh, world's uh, tactile images. Uh, as you can see here, we can get these uh, contact shapes, we can get these color uh, gradients, and we can simulate uh, this JALSA sensor uh, in uh, simulators like Gazebo and also Mojico. But as you can see here, we uh, can observe some artifacts in the real world, especially on the surface, we have these textures uh, brought by the 3D printing uh, process of the 3D uh, printer. So the observation is that uh, the real world is not perfect, but uh, for the virtual world, we always have, uh, have a perfect world. So how to um, reduce the gap? Um, so we, so the, the very first method we got is uh, very manually designed and handcrafted. So we design some um, textures manually and we inject these textures into the tactile images so that we can reduce these gaps and it works well. Um, but you know, if we transfer it to a different domain, not 3D printing objects, so we may uh, have to design some other uh, like uh, uh, textures on the surface. So we came up with one idea to use uh, this generator model uh, to get these textures from the real tactile images so that we can adapt the simulated tactile images uh, with textures learned from the real tactile images so that we can see, we can um, get these textures on the surface um, of this context. So in this way, we can reduce the gap so that's through the deep learning way. Um, so in the last two works, we have got the simulation of uh, the gel side sensor. As I said, uh, for gel side, we have this flat surface and the light path is uh, easy to be reconstructed uh, in the simulator. However, for the gel tape uh, sensor we have got, uh, we have a complex morphology, it's curved surface, um, it's uh, very challenging to reconstruct the lights. Uh, in the simulator. So in a recent work, um, which will be presented in uh, RSS to, uh, this year, we have proposed uh, a new method to reconstruct the light passes for these complex morphologies. So we have explored different uh, light pass measures um, to simulate how the light can um, travel in the, in the skin. So here we have uh, found this geodesic uh, measures can uh, makes the best estimation of uh, the light passes in the simulation. And we have got some uh, results and here's a quick demonstration of how it looks. So on the left, uh, that is the uh, real data collected from our gel tape sensor. And on the right, we have these uh, uh, outputs from the simulation. So as you can see, we can simulate uh, the light uh, travel in the uh, gel side sensor but similar to the gel, gel side sensor, there are some uh, misalignment like a location uh, and also uh, these uh, uh, contacts. So we uh, have got some other develop, development in the scope. As it, in the previous works, we go around the simulation of uh, the, uh, the skin as it's challenging. If we use like FEM or other measures, it cannot be inc uh, included in uh, like simulator, like Madrigal or others, um, and we can't achieve this real-time uh, simulation. So we made use of uh, uh, the recent developments in computer graphics. So we made use of this uh, touchy uh, programming language so that we can simulate uh, the deformation of the skin. So here we have some pseudo grays and also particles so that we can uh, better simulate the deformation of uh, the skin. Um, it can um, populate these uh, uh, moments of these particles in the skin uh, more efficiently. So it can be achieved in real time, and then we can get this depth map and we use uh, the elimination method we have got in the previous uh, simulation methods, and we can have the simulation of the skin uh, included uh, in this work. So we have got some uh, demonstration here. As you can see, uh, there's a delta mm -hmm. sensor uh, going down and uh, there's one object going down to press this delta sensor 
and you can see the output from this uh, simulator. So in this way, we have got two paths for the optical, optical tactile sensor simulation. The first, we can simulate uh, the tactile skin. The second one, we can simulate how the light travels uh, in the tactile skin. So we have a full ecosystem for simulating uh, optical tactile sensors. And apart from that, we have got some uh, recent updates how to use uh, vision and tactile sensing in the virtual world. Um, and we got the very first work on uh, these uh, following deformable linear objects using rainfall learning with vision and also tactile sensing. But here in this work, we didn't uh, explicitly use any optical tactile sensors. We just got some uh, states like positions, angles in the simulation. Um, and hopefully we can get these uh, states extracted from the tactile sensors uh, mentioned in the previous slides uh, in a future work. But here you can see we have vision and also tactile sensing. We have a top view camera and we have the gripper uh, and the gripper can observe this uh, local information of the contact. So like the theta, uh, the pose, and also the, uh, the location. And also we have the uh, kinematic, uh, kinematic uh, inputs. So in this way, we fit them into the rainfall learning policy. And the aim of this work is to find, find out uh, which sensing input would be more useful uh, for, uh, for a grasping task for linear uh, objects, uh, deformable linear objects. So here we have um, seen some different uh, like uh, uh, trajectories. So it may hold the uh, cable to the end, it may reach, but it will drop. Uh, sometimes it will stop before, sometimes uh, it will drop before. So we have seen different cases uh, in this uh, uh, example task. And we have defined a few metrics. Um, so for example, uh, the, how much time the gripper spends at the end of the uh, DL, and also uh, by checking how far it goes. And through these exper experiments, we have got some interesting um, conclusions. So in this simulation uh, task, we have found vision will play a, a better role uh, in this task, obviously, and it will give you uh, most of the information. Um, however, if you need the uh, refinement of the grasping, so tactile will improve the performance. So it means uh, vision can give you uh, roughly good um, performance, but tactile would be good to have. Um, as you can see in the in my talk, we have a lot of open questions to answer uh, still. Uh, but you can see the final goal of our research is to answer this question: how to use visual tactile perception uh, to enable the ro robot to interact with uh, the physical world better, um, either in the real world directly or uh, with the virtual world uh, assistance. So we have got some uh, development in this scope. We have got the sensors um, and we have got the simulations for these sensors. And also we have used these sensors uh, for different tasks, both in the real world and also in the uh, simulation uh, in the virtual world. And in the future, we would like to um, build up a bridge between the simulation and also the physical world. As you can see, there's still a lot of uh, uh, gaps between the simulation and uh, uh, the real world. Okay. So that's a brief introduction to our recent development. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so next, I would like to uh, introduce Professor Michael Yu Wang. It's our great honor to have uh, Professor Wang here. Um, professor Wang is a professor uh, uh, at Monash University, uh, and uh, he gave us a keynote talk at ICRA 2022. Um, it was virtual, so it's a great honor to have him in person here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Let's see how to make this work. So it's just to share the screen and where's my PPT? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. If you want, click this. All right. Yeah. And then and play. Transition mode. Okay. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Ah. So 
again, um, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity. And I will just uh, uh, give you an overview in the next 20 minutes uh, about the piece of work on a vision-based tactile sensing for robotic manipulation. So I am currently at Monash University, uh, but the work uh, has been done essentially by a group of brilliant students of my group in uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And some of them are um, have finished and went down to work in industries in China, and some of them are still uh, here about to finish and looking for a postdoc and academic positions in um, international domain. So if you are interested in our work and like our students, please talk to me. I will be happy to uh, let you to talk to my students. Uh, <clears throat> tactile sensors, we know how important they are, and we know a variety of principles we've been using. And over the years, uh, this idea of using vision to measure contact, measure contact forces being around on geosite is very popular. And there is also similar um, uh, sensors being around. One of which is what we've been using, what we, we have been following, uh, essentially it's based on very much similar optical principles uh, that you have a layer of uh, uh, skin surface, elastic, and you put a camera inside of watching the surface of the uh, inner surface of the fingertip. And if there are geometric features, textures, markers, and under deformation of the finger surface, these geometric features would generate a optical field. So by measuring optical field, and you might be able to inter uh, infer the contact states, contact forces, uh, so on and so forth. So the concept, concept is very widely known. And what we did was basically uh, implement using a set of the regular markers. And later on, we make use of uh, random color patches and then make use of the dense optical flow technique to be able to track optical field and to be able to eventually uh, obtain the information about contact states, forces, slipping, or other critical information that you need for dexterous robotic manipulation. So uh, again, I'm repeating myself, that's the way uh, a construct, how you set it up. And that's our first version of it, uh, fairly bulky, uh, but essentially it's one camera looking underneath the skin and the skin has markers or uh, random color patches. And then you will be able to generate a set of optical images uh, if they are fast enough, and then you will be able to get flows and from the flows, you will be able to find whatever hopefully you need. And this is our third, version of it, uh, we get to a point in that we are able to make this relatively compact, uh, highly robust, and, uh, and well, fairly uh, economical. It's not that expensive. It doesn't require a lot of special, any specialized electronics and all of that. So in terms of the uh, semi product, we are getting to a point in that we were really much interested in putting this into something like jail site, uh, with a same market uh, uh, possibility. However, our partner, uh, Delta Electronics, uh, is in Taiwan, and they have factories in Suzhou, and so doing the co-ed and doing some geopolitical changes. Uh, we have not been able to really work very extensively with our Taiwan partner, which is very unfortunate uh, of all these silly geopolitics, which I have no control. Now, uh, we have a variety of work, uh, two or three different versions of this, of course, for research, for practical uh, possibilities. So instead, instead of using one camera, you might be able to use an array of pinhole cameras, which we made that as well, or array of lens cameras. Okay, so basically you make use of MEMS technologies and then you can create uh, different optical, optic systems where you will get different uh, images with a variety of trade-offs between qualities of optical optical qualities. And you can make this 
uh, uh, make that work. So it's been going on for quite a number of years. And uh, I will not repeat all of the, the details and you can look up from our papers, our publications, and uh, also talking with my, my students. I have to uh, admit uh, my job has gone to more into administration, especially now, and some of the technical aspects. Uh, I'm not the expert. And I, luckily, one of my students, uh, uh, Yipai Du, is right here. So grill him if you have questions about anything else for this, right? Uh, uh, there, there is obviously, once you have the hardware, you're able to get set of images. And then the next questions, how do you get the information about content? Right? So how do you process your images and get information calibrated, sources and all of that? So, uh, we use optical uh, processing te technique, dense optical flow, of course, and you also have to make use of uh, 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 keep a neural network. You will have some sort of algorithms and then we'll be able to get the information. Uh, another particular area that we are very much interested in is to be able to measure the vertical deformation, especially the normal forces, as well as tangential forces and the twist forces. So your marker is essentially 2D, but once they deform, it has vertical motions in addition to two-dimensional expansion. So if you are able to make use of these set of the displacement fields to be able to distinguish them or look at the combined effects, you will be able to infer the vertical uh, motion as well as forces. So simplest idea is to look at the patterns of your markers and look at the relative density of these markers. So if surface expands and the density would be reduced, if they contract also for vertical motions, you will be able to uh, make use of this as well. So there are a set of algorithms we developed from which, and then we'll be able to say that we can detect the uh, contact also determine the vertical intention. So from there, then you can make use of this as a uh, basically contact detection. You will be able to identify patterns, identify uh, surface areas uh, from which uh, you might do uh, what we need for, for uh, manipulation. And then this all needs to be calibrated. It's related to the optical properties as well as your material properties of the elastomer. And then you can go through certain processes of physical calibration or training through um, some sort of a network. So um, I will just uh, see if it would work there. I'll touch on that, touch on that, touch on that. So you probably have seen some of these already. Everybody have all these uh, optical field illustrations and to show you what you will be see from your cameras and what information you are able to process. So relatively straightforward and uh, relatively uh, accurate enough to, to a certain degree. So with the random color patches, uh, you will see the color areas and we'll see if there are more. Yeah, there are more. So uh, this is with uh, uh, pinhole cameras. So you will get different patches and then you'll be able to stitch them together to get more uh, larger areas uh, covering the entire surface uh, of the fingertip. Uh, you, will, you will see uh, the flow or, uh, and, and also the motion from which you will analyze the, the uh, process. So the principles and implementation are relatively straightforward um, once you figured it out. I'll, I'll move on. Uh, so this is the version that we have now, uh, relatively compact, and we want to make use of this to be able to really measure the contact forces. So we would have a tangential force, we'll have a normal force, and we will also have a torque. So from the two-dimensional image, all optical flows in 2D, how do you extract the information to give you these three pieces of information? So we have some ad hoc technique, we look at the vector fields of the displacement, and then we decompose them into curl-free, diverging-free, and harmonic components, signal processing technique, 
relatively straightforward. And we would think each of these components is correlated with a fourth component in vertical or tangential or a torque area. So that's its hypothesis. And from there, we will do some testing and calibration. And if relatively worked out well, and you just believe it and make use of it. Okay. There's no theory to prove this is true. It's just an image processing technique. Whatever you think is there, you have a way of processing it, and then you think you get it by eventually testing and, and, and calibration and validating. And if it's true, you're lucky. If they're not, you go on to do something else. So if you don't understand the physics or, or mechanics and that much. So this is, a, again, another very brilliant idea of one of my PhD students. And if I can touch on them again, just show you from the optical flow. Oops. And you will be able to see all them all. So three different components are extracted from the uh, images. Now, uh, with that, and then we want to make use of this for uh, robotic manipulation or for other purposes in uh, robotic applications. So you can think of this as a uh, tactile sensor. You can embed this into robot fingertips or the joints and so on and so forth. So uh, this is all up to what you want to do with it. And these are not too expensive, but they're slightly bulky, not as small as our fingertip. So you would have some limitations where you could embed this for whatever purposes you, you, you use, right? So I'll just show you one or two examples. Uh, before we get into there, we also have another area of our work that we tried to uh, develop robotic skin materials which would give us a direct normal adhesion, as well as a larger controllable frictional forces. So it's gecko-inspired materials. This has been around for quite some time. And we wanted to be able to fabricate gecko materials, gecko skin, gecko-like skins in polymer economically, effectively, and then you integrated them into the fingertip of a, of, of a robot hand. Uh, same, same time, we also wanted it to be uh, compatible with our vision tactile sensor so that you will still be able to do the measurement to be able to detect, uh, but you can also regulate the contact forces because now you would have the normal adhesion forces like suction but it's dry suction. And you also would be able to regulate or control the tangential friction. Uh, so we hope this will be something once you input on the fingertip it might be helpful. Uh, and and that, so that's another uh, direction, another area of work. Another of my PhD students who has been doing this for quite some time and, and eventually were able to put all these pieces together. So I won't get into the uh, gecko um, skin, uh, and this is a very well known in robotic circles. Uh, there are a large number of groups are trying this, uh, Stanford and, and Stuttgart. And, okay. uh, for us, uh, we just came up with a set of processes, essentially molding with, uh, with the elastomer materials, uh, made, uh, leading to the production of these materials at very relatively low cost. So your molds can be made through a set of processes without getting into micro fabrication. You don't need a clean room to go through uh, aleatography, all that. Uh, so we, we want to get to a point where this could be widely fabricated at a relatively low cost. Right? Uh, another area that we also look into is the hierarchical gecko surfaces. So you have a one layer that essentially give you very dry uh, adhesive forces, more like a gecko's fine fiber. And then you have another layer, just like what a gecko would have, that has large pillows, uh, pillars. And this pillar once uh, bended into different direction, 
and they change the frictional prop, uh, properties of your gecko surface. So that's the uh, uh, process that you would have two layer of molding. Uh, one is for gecko fiber, the other is for pillows. And uh, once you are putting them together, uh, you would have both adhesion and tangential friction. And that is on the very left bottom uh, of the figure. So those big pillow pillars, you see them and then very bottom, there will be some wedges, which you might not be able to see. Those are the gecko fiber-like uh, uh, structure to give you dry friction. So this has been uh, well published and well tested. And, and it also has directional properties. In other words, you can engage uh, adhesion or disengage as you wish through a lateral control of the uh, 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 material motion. Okay. So this is where then we wanted to put these two pieces together. I can get, uh, so you see at the very bottom, there is a adhesive layer. On top of that, there are these pil pillars. And then if you put up uh, with another layer, uh, further inner, and at the back of the layer, uh, uh, that layer, there are markers, random color patches, and then you have array of cameras looking through uh, to be able to measure the motions of those markers as well. So things get a little bit complicated because you have multiple layers and they all would reflect lights coming back. And you have to know which layer you're looking at okay, uh, so that you will be able to really track the motion of the markers so you know your deformation. So uh, my student managed to put all this together, integrate it. Uh, into a uh, robot uh, uh, sensor with, with, with a fingertip. And uh, so there's some data uh, generated. The quality of the optical flow is deteriorated. It's less than what it used to be because now you have another two layers of the uh, materials and they reflect light and they won't uh, coming back to you. Or uh, if you make the not transparent and you won't be able to see them. But here we want to see them. We want to see as far as we can near the uh, contact surface, the deformation that seen and behind the uh, set of the micro pillars. Uh, but it's not a very clean problem. So images are a bit more blurry, messy, and we need to do some processes so that we have better confidence. So here again, uh, a neural network is built and tested. And my student claims it's good enough. Okay, uh, that's AI, and that's all you can ask. You cannot ask for hundred percent. Well, now here it's seventy-eight percent. I have no idea what does that really mean. But most of the, the CISO defense when you see a, a neural network work, and it says now I can claim eighty-five percent good. To me, everyone says that is good. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm not an AI guy. So. If you AI guys say 79% is good enough, I would agree it's good enough. Okay. So that, that, that's part of the, the, the my, my take on AI. Don't, don't take it very personal. Right? Uh, it's just a uh, uh, very, very powerful tool, very useful. And um, well, I'm sure it's going to be quite uh, valuable for, for, uh, for our engineers. So we just leave some of these over here. Uh, well, well, there we again we need to do image processing so that we know the area that we're looking at are the deformed areas of contact. So there will be image segmentations as well as optical flow tractions. You only want to track the contact deformation, not uh, anywhere else. Right? Uh, with that, then obviously uh, we would need to demonstrate that our uh, fingertip with tactile sensing and gecko adhesion and modulated frictional capability are useful. Okay. So if you're able to grab an egg, it's useful. So a simple demonstration, first thing you always try to grab an egg and you can claim that you're not hurting the egg, and you're getting the down. Uh, it's just one of those things that student has to do and you claim you are you are at least on the right direction yeah, you're, you're not doing anything fabulous yet but you are not uh, creating any difficult problem however you will see that 
our uh, grasping angle because we have a dry adhesion need not to be parallel grafting. And we can actually do horizontal parallel grafting. That's where these uh, properties are becoming more useful. I will just show you that when I get to there. Uh, so here's some uh, of the objects we graph, especially on the very first uh, example, that is a sort of top-down flat object picking. There is no real grafting, it's just a, a suction of the dry adhesion that would do it, right? And uh, the object uh, uh, could be a piece of glass, could be a piece of metal, or could be perforated piece of metal, like a PCB boards with holes on it, because there's no air suction in all dry uh, uh, adhesion. And a uh, surface need not to be very smooth, need not to be very flat. So this is where the industry applications come in. This is the exact problem that motivated us to do gecko and also to do tactile sensing. Okay. And you can grasp other objects. Uh, of course, and then in the end of the video, there will be fruits, apples, pears, and, and this is all kinds of things that get people uh, interested and excited uh, to, to show the uh, uh, finger grippers are, are very effective. Uh, and um, another student of mine, um, I will show all their faces, uh, uh, the images of them in the end, and uh, make use of this uh, for whole arm contact detection. Uh, the principles are very similar. Uh, inside the uh, inner tube of the uh, arm, and then you put a camera at the end, you look up, and watch the surface of the circular tube. And on the tube, you would have set of markers if they would be deformed, and they will be able to detect the motions of, of the markers. Of course, your image would be distorted because you look up uh, of a tube, and there is a geometric property so you, need, you need to map out to be able to figure out the motion of the marker relative to motion on the image plane. Very simple geometric properties and optical properties. And if you do so, uh, you will have a robot arm where you would have one sensor to be able to check if there will be contact or where the contact is and to use that for whatever purposes. Uh, so for safety purposes, and then whenever you detect any contact, you can stop or you want to have interactions and you can make use of that. And, and you also be able to measure contact forces through uh, the, the, the simple, same principle that we have discussed. So I will not get into all the details of this. Uh, there are a variety of ways to make use of this information and to say there is a, a sliding motion, someone is touching it, sliding it, or someone is twisting it, so on and so forth. Uh, I think I can skip some of these. Uh, Let's see what else we have here. Bumping detection. This is relatively straightforward. And motion following at contact point. I, I think you'll get the idea. It's very simple things already, really, really not that complicated. Uh, my student also put it into foot of a robot because now you are able to contact, uh, detect contaction through area at the contact force. So use that information to be able to make adjustment, your posture of a robot so that you can balance better when you walk or when the robot walks upstairs or downstairs, or if it's for a real shoe for elderly people and so on and so forth, and it might be helpful. So that's another area of application uh, that, that has been implemented for uh, balancing uh, applications. So you put this essentially relatively cheap sensor into the robot foot and will do some usefulness and, and, and as well as applications. So lastly, let's see what I have here. Balance, uh, this is already talked about. I'm going to show you the video so that my student will be happy. Uh, I'll carry on. 
uh, well, don't need to show them all. Okay. And uh, very lastly, uh, the, the improvement on the uh, three uh, dimensional force measurement uh, it's just been done by my student, uh, uh, Du. Uh, he had actually presented this in a, uh, oral presentation yesterday. And uh, uh, so essentially what he has done is that uh, he's making use a geometric model uh, between the vertical motion of the marker to the horizontal motion in the image plane. So it's a very simple geometric information. So if you are able to make use of this, uh, you will have better accuracy in determining the vertical motion and in relation to what vertical forces. So we would be able to measure normal forces now better than early versions of our sensors. And do it right here, and you can ask him for more details. And I will not repeat because this is part of his thesis and he's going to uh, finish up very soon. Okay. I'll just leave it like that so that I will come to the end uh, to be able to show uh, a summary of our complete work. So we are at the point there, we have built this, the sensors, so we're happy with them. Uh, one potential direction is to make that into more an industrial product sensor for different purposes with different specific specifications. Uh, unfortunately, our industry partner is not very committed and now working with us, but we will we'll hope that uh, we'll, we'll be able to move into that, that direction. But my problem with my students is that when they graduated, they all work for very big companies instead of a, a small startup. It's a message for you too. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, we also want to uh, make use of the sensors for autonomous and textural robotic manipulation. So you might be embedded it into your fingertips and into others and try to make use of contact information to do complex uh, tasks uh, with the, the artificial intelligence uh, techniques. So you will see a lot of similar work around here. It's a very exciting field. And uh, well, I will not elaborate on that. And this is what I want to leave with you. Uh, I've been very fortunate when I was in Hong Kong, had about 20 some students in my lab. Uh, some others do the 3D printing and other stuff, but uh, they, they are really excellent students and they are now graduating, graduating gradually. And uh, uh, I hope you are interested in, in them. And if you have questions, let me know. I will connect you to a right uh, student. With that, I'll well, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wang. Uh, maybe we can have uh, two quick questions. Two quick questions. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, yeah, we have a microphone. If you need. So you make this visual tactile sensors five millimeters thick. That's amazing. Uh, what's what's the downside? You mean if it, if they're too small? No, 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 no. I'm just maybe you solve all problems of tactile sensors. I don't know. No, we are not small enough yet. So, not small enough yeah, yet. I think it, 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 uh, on the optic side, there's still improvement. Right? Uh, so our, our first version is one camera. Then we went to array of pinholes cameras. And of course, the optical properties are horrible. And then we want to array uh, a list cameras, but then you would have a uh, depth uh, issues. So, so the focus plane is fixed. So your deformation is too far out of the depth plane, then they become blur again. Uh, so uh, we're still working on that. We are we're fortunate that we have one collaborator, Professor Yu, who is in microfabrication and micro sensors. So optical properties need to be further improved. Okay. Hi, Professor Wang. Uh, thanks for the sharing. I have a very general question uh, to you, maybe to your student, uh, Dr. Du, uh, Dr. Yu, uh, Dr. Du. Uh, I, I want to ask about the vision-based vision tactile sensor on slide 43. Uh, I want to ask how much is the uh, detection accuracy or the precision about, about this uh, tactile sensor? 43, thank you. 
That's 43. Uh, oh. I'll give you this. Okay. Uh, Yi Pai. Um, maybe using the jail side, uh, there, jail side. Jail side, uh, there is a jail side tactile sensor on the left. Uh, maybe this one. Okay. This tactile. I want to ask how, how much is the accuracy about the detection? Because if you contact the tactile sensor, uh, for example, the physical center, the tactile signal may not be at the physical center. I want to ask the, how much is the error? Thank you. Yes, location error. Yeah, so basically we, we think that if you look, uh, yeah, thank you. If you look into the um, the full 3D measurement that the latest result, it's already calibrated, meaning our sensor is actually, um, we have got the rotation matrices and translation matrices that corresponds to the robot frame. So actually everything happens on the sensor is already calibrated from the sensors. So it means you can directly, like in ROS, you can directly put the point cloud in the robot frame. So um, the accuracy is within millimeters because you know the, uh, the contact surface itself is not very large. It's like two centimeters by two centimeters, but we have like hundreds of pixels, uh, like 640 to 480, uh, by 480 um, image sizes. So relatively, uh, we have like 10, 10 pixels relatively is like 0.1 millimeters, but the calibration process we can achieve is within one pixel. So it's actually very accurate already. I hope it, I know, yeah, is that answers your question? Yeah. Good, he knows his stuff. <laughs> Are we running out of time? Yeah, uh, maybe we can uh, have the questions in the yeah. Just a good question. How do you handle the release of the objects with a gecko-like sensor? Oh, for the uh, gecko materials, we make them into directional uh, uh, dry adhesive. You see the wedges. The wedges are the directional. So if you pull it in one direction, it gives you a adhesion, but you reverse it and then release it. So otherwise, you're going to you're going to stick on the object forever. That's, that's not going to be pleasant. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you all. So thank you very much. So okay. uh, So next we will have the second session of uh, the poster uh, poster presentation. Um, so next one would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next one will be Zixi. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, so we also have online uh, attendees. So there may be some questions uh, regarding your posters uh, in the uh, chat box. So please double check this uh, chat box. And there, there's already one question for tomorrow, yeah? If you can check it and answer the question, please. Yeah. Sushi, please. Uh, in this work, we, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, in, this, in this work, we propose a uh, uh, physics-based uh, uh, optical tactile sensor simulator named Tech Chi. Uh, our, our main contribution is that it is uh, physics based. We use a uh, physics based uh, simulation method named the material point method. Uh, similar to finite element model, this method uses some uh, small units to represent objects. For example, you can see in this uh, uh, diagram uh, the, some green particles are used to represent rigid indenters and uh, some gray particles are used to represent elastomers. Uh, after that, we use uh, uh, we, we use a pseudo uh, grid to simulate the interaction, and uh, we can see that like, uh, uh, it can provide uh, it can provide uh, realistic uh, tactile images uh, considering PSNR, SSM, and MAE. And uh, we also use uh, uh, we also use uh, uh, a sim to real recognition task to show that like, our image is uh, realistic. Uh, besides uh, this uh, 
a method can also be used to simulate some uh, elastroplastic, uh, elastroplastic object, for example, pl uh, plasticine. You can see on the downside, uh, uh, on the downside uh, diagram, at first there is a plasticine, uh, there is a plasticine cube uh, held uh, hold by two uh, elastomer layers, and after, after manipulation, they can be manipulated into a plasticine uh, sphere. That's all. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Yi Zhongling. I'm working with Nathan Rapora and Danan Zhang at the University of Bristol. Um, so high resolution tactile sensing uh, can provide us accurate information about the local context, especially in contact rich tasks. However, the deployment uh, in unstructured environments is still under investigated. So in order to improve the uh, robustness of tactile robot control in such environments, we uh, study the concept of tactile saliency, which is actually inspired from uh, by the uh, whistle saliency from computer vision and the uh, human touch attention mechanism. So uh, just like the whistle saliency, tactile saliency actually involves identifying key information in tactile images. While it is uh, commonly to a note, uh, label the whistle silency manually by human, uh, actually it's quite impractical to do it for tactile silency data because of its uh, counterintuitive uh, patterns, especially with market-based tactile sensors. So to address these challenges, we propose a frameworks uh, which uh, involves, in, uh, includes three interrelated modules or say networks uh, for tactile silency prediction, and we have conducted experiments to verify our approach in the contact pose, estimation task, and contour following task. And we further apply our methods on top of the uh, two different tactile control methods, which are pose-based PID control and image-based through reinforcement learning. So if you are interested in our work, please come and talk to us. Thank you. So in the VTAC uh, 2019, uh, we've proposed uh, the gel site simulation method, which was for flat gel site sensors. And meanwhile, we've also proposed the, the gel tip sensor, which is uh, curved. Uh, and so in this work, we wanted to produce a simulation model or to generalize our previous simulation model for the, the gel tips. And this is uh, the result. So the particular detail to generalize here was the light field. So in the flat uh, simulation model, the light is uh, modeled as a single constant uh, vector. And so here we wanted to capture the fact that in the, the gel tip, the light should be traveling all around the, the, the sensing membrane. Um, so you can see here what it would be like if the, the linear, if we would use like a linear field that would be representing the light traveling through the, the core of the sensor. And in the sec so in the first row there we have the the real uh, samples from the real sensor, and in the second row we have what would be uh, with uh, the linear light field if we, for instance, consider the the background uh, real image. So one of the the features of the our simulation method from the flat to this one is that we use a real uh, image from. Uh, an amp or a sensor without any contact to 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 render the background, which gives us like a, this very realistic feeling uh, or close to it. And so we just need to render the illumination on the, the contact areas. And so with this, uh, what we study here was the, the light fields. Uh, and with the, the light fields that we, we show in the, the paper, for instance, we can uh, safely put the, the background uh, image and the, and the results are, are this one. And that's it, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Guan Qun from Dr. Shen Lu's lab. So our work is about the vision-based uh, haptic rendering. Uh, haptic rendering can be uh, widely used in our daily life. For example, for online shopping, uh, we can only see the object or the closest from the visual image, but we don't know how it feels in our hand. 
So by using the haptic rendering, we can uh, get a virtual haptic feedback and the touch feeling of the object. However, most methods are limited to reproducing the haptic rendering by using the data from the tactile sensor. It means that the tactile sensor need to reach out uh, every object for uh, data collection, and which is very uh, time consuming and expensive. So in this work, we propose to use a generative model to generate it, the tactile signals from the video image. In our framework, we consider two characteristics of the object surface. The first one is the uh, texture of the surface, and the second one is the uh, friction information. So after training this model, we uh, we can use the this model to generate uh, the texture and also the uh, friction coefficients from the video image, which are then combined uh, uh, to be rendered on the electro vibration uh, haptic display. So if you are interested in our work, please find me in a poster session. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Jia Qijiang, also from Shen's group. Um, like uh, I'm working on the transparent object perception and manipulation. So in this work, I'm the it's the first time like we integrated uh, the vision and the tactile sensing for transparent object grasping. So uh, transparent objects like are widely used in our daily life. It can be applied into like the perception algorithm can be applied like the waste uh, recycling and the automation laboratory a lot of things. So, but you know, like the transparent objects, the depths are always missed or invalid uh, and uh, include a lot of noisy. So human can solve this issue like with their hand to touch some place like stable place, but as for robots, it's not that accurate as humans. So when you push the set surface, it may, like the object may fall down. So we need to select the right region for contact. So like the, from the intuition, the best position is like those areas with similar surface normal to the table. So uh, that's the po poking region. So like in this work. And after that, like the robot arm will contact those region, get the depth or local shape, so that facilitates the grasping. So also like because the uh, poking region is quite challenging to collect it. So we also provide a sim simulation uh, like program to render uh, the realistic image with transparent objects. Uh, like it can generate also the surface normal. Like, um, yeah, that's it. Also by the way, like we have like write a review paper like about transparent object perception and manipulation. So if you are interested, you can check it. And if you have any new idea, like inform me, I can update our website. Like I also provide an online platform, like follow, like update very frequently about the new publications, new data, and yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everybody. Uh, so I'm Abu Bakr Dawood uh, from Queen Mary University, and I'll be presenting optical tomography-based soft sensor skin. So here we have. Uh, so this skin is actually based on optical tomography principle. So when light is passed through a sort of transparent medium, uh, and the past light when analyzed, we can estimate the geometry of that medium. And if that medium is a soft transparent silicon. Any, uh, any deformation in that medium would change the light intensity on the other end. So here we have 24 emitters and 24 receiving fibers arranged alternately around the circumference and the receiver fibers are going in front of a camera. So in this work, we actually uh, compared two switching strategies. So one is based on uh, EIT, the normal uh, you know, electrical impedance tomography uh, strategy in which one terminal is switched on and voltage is read on all, all the other terminals. So we proposed that in case of optical tomography, 
because of our, our, our design, each emitter is illuminating only the receiving fibers in front of it, and it's not uh, disturbing any of its neighbors. So we can switch all the LEDs on at the same time, making our strategy, uh, in, in our case, 24 times faster because we have 24 emitters. And uh, we were able to estimate the force and uh, localize it as well. And uh, yeah, because we are using um, a cheap uh, Logitech camera webcam, so it's like it, it has it's 30, 30 FPS. Uh, if one want to invest more money, yeah, can have high frame rate as well. So yeah, thank you. There's not that much in this figure or in this slide. Do come to the poster. That that's just to make you curious. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Carolina Guerra, PhD student at University of Washington. And um, tactile sensing is important for contact bridge manipulation tasks as it allows uh, to maximize the amount of information that we can get from contact interactions. Um, being able to simulate tactile sensing means that we can quickly generate large amounts of data to prototype and debug manipulation policies and tactile models. However, modeling the optical response of the gel deformations and incorporating the dynamics of the contact makes simulations very challenging. So we would like a model that captures the complex elimination changes due to the gel deformations in order to close the scene to real gap uh, for vision-based tactile sensing. We propose tactile diffusion as a data adaptation model. With tactile diffusion, we can map a simulated dead contact patch to a realistic tactile image from a digit sensor, uh, capturing the spectral illumination changes due to the gel deformations. Um, it can be pertained with a diverse data set of contact interactions between a digit sensor and YCB objects, and then fine tune with tactile data particular for the downstream task. In this case, um, imprints from Braille characters. So when using tactile data, we have to fine tune at some point. So we explore um, where it's better to fine tune, fine tune in terms of data, uh, if on the data adaptation side or directly on a, our downstream model. The main takeaway um, is that tactile diffusion requires much less amount of the real tactile data uh, to fine tune to achieve a good performance on the downstream task. And this is a very important advantage of tactile diffusion as a data adaptation technique, because keep in mind that for some tasks, collecting real tactile data can be expensive, time consuming, or just prohibitively to scale. And happy to discuss more details about tactile diffusion uh, at the poster session. Thank you. Um, thank you all for uh, thank uh, all the presenters for the uh, talks in the morning. So. Uh, we will go for the lunch break and we'll come back at two, uh, two o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'll start the afternoon session then. Um, so we've got a um, session on sim to real learning for visual tactile perception. Um, possibly I'll be the only talk with sim to real learning in it. I don't know if, uh, if Roberto has it in his, um, but um it's generally about progress, future directions, for tactile sensing, I think is the is the kind of general theme for this um, session. OK, so I'll get stuck into um, my slides. The generic title, uh, Progress in Real Sim, Sim to Real Tactile Robotics. It's going to be kind of the things I'm showing in these videos here. Um, so just a quick intro to give a background. So I'm... Um, in the BRL Dexterous Robotics Group at Bristol Robotics Laboratory, which is um, five members of staff who work on uh, related areas, tactile, dexterous, control. This is a group uh, a couple of years ago and more recently. So we're kind of mid-sized group, I would say. Uh, web link at the bottom there, if you want to know more about uh, the people who work in the group. Um, so the core technology, uh, at least in my part of the group, is on... Um, soft high resolution tactile sensing in particular the tactic um so i guess what distinguishes tactic as tactile sensor from some of the other sensors you've been listening to so it's a marker based sensor 
but the markers are on levers, see in the picture to the right, so the 3D printed on levers. And so those, those pins, they act as an amplification mechanism um, in the structure of the skin to magnify the contact. Um, so, um, we, and that's biometric because human skin uses the same principle to also amplify contact. So it's different from markers painted on the inside of the skin or markers floating in the medium. These are markers on rigid levers that, that improve the sensitivity. Um, so uh, it's been postulated to be biometric for many years now, based upon the physical structure of the morphology of human skin. So um, in some very nice work, which I was very happy about, uh, one of my PhD students um, compared the signals coming off our artificial tactile sensor with nerve signals that have been recorded in classic experiments from 40 years ago, characterizing human touch, and found a match between the two. So that morphological structure of the skin is reflected in the signals, which is biometric, is reflected that the signals coming off the sensor, if you process them, um, um, can, be, can appear to be closely related to the signals coming off real mechanoreceptors. Um, so we were very, I, I say I was personally very happy with that piece of work. Um, and then uh, there's press release, um, which, caught, which had a lot of media attention, which I was also very happy about. Um, now I think one of the things that, that I took away from this is because there was a kind of human interest factor to this work. It's about, you know, human skin, human hands, as well as robotics. And I think that's what the media um, got, got interested in. Um, but it was also nice to see that the media doesn't just report on AI. You know, they are interested in stuff that relates directly to humans and sensing and so on, which I think is, you know, a point, you know, for the community, if, if you like. Um, so that's a quick intro. So I want to give some updates on recent work coming out of a lab. Um, so first, um, so a theme in our lab has been um, tactile enabled robot hands. So this is part of the real part of the uh, talk, if you like, real sim, sim to real. It's part of the real talk. So this is basically um, converting existing tactile, uh, converting existing non-tactile robot hands into tactile robot hands. And also some of those are based on open source de designs, such as the, you know, the YCB uh, open hand, which we built in our lab. Um, and so, we, so we've had a theme running on this for about five years now with um, various publications, transactions, robotics, soft robotics, and so on. Um, and so um, I'd say basically that's all about integrating this biometric tactile sensor into artificial robot hands that aren't much like the human hand, typically three fingered hands. Um, so one direction we've taken that um, is to um, make it as part of a soft gripper, Stu Yang's work, but rather, but rather than putting the tactile sensor into the fingers, which is kind of difficult if the fingers are soft, is to use it instead as a palm component of a gripper. Or another way of thinking about it is to turn a standard tactile sensor that we make in our lab and put fingers on it. Yeah because then you can use all the kind of control methods and perception methods that we develop for single tactile sensors, but you can apply it to something that can pick up and manipulate objects. Uh, so that's that's one direction that we've taken it, which we call tack palm. Um, and then another direction that we've been taking it is in collaboration with uh, PISA, IIT, so Manuel Catalano, um, Antonio Bici, Matteo Bianchi. Uh, we've been looking at um, combining the tactile sensor with um, anthropomorphic robot hands. Um, uh, so there's some no number of challenges there. One is getting the fingertip, the sensor down to the size that it's roughly the same shape as a, and size of a human fingertip, um, which we succeeded in, as you can see, there's like five fingertips on this, on this anthropomorphic hand. Um, uh, there's other challenges about how you get data. These, are, these all have cameras inside them, they're optical tactile sensors. So there's other challenges about how you, you get data from five cameras and then you can process it. Um, so why we, and I particularly like this hand, is it's a biometric tactile sensor and it's an anthropomorphic hand, but in a sense it's biometric as well, because um, a principle of it is it's heavily underactuated. This hand only has one motor, but it's still able to, to represent the motions of the human hand just due to the morphological structure of the hand, the way the hand is built. So it's kind of, a, so I see it's kind of a biometric anthropomorphic hand you know, that fits with the kind of biometric concept of a sensor. 
you know, moving towards more human-like tactile hands. Um, so that's a hand that um, uh, PISA IIT gave us, and we converted to have tactile sensing. Um, and then they also converted, the, they gave us the know-how of how to make these hands as well. And so we've done a 3D printed version of their hands, which we, which we make themselves, which we make ourselves, uh, non-tactile at the moment. And we're currently on the version two of that hand, where we've added another motor to the hand, actually to give a kind of an antagonistic mechanism of kind of push-pull uh, that the human hand has. And, you know, and the direction we're going is to add more degrees of actuation to the hand, and clearly we're going to make it tactile as well. But rather than going, for, say, for the shadow approach of, you know, having a fully actuated hand and trying to learn how to control that, we're instead going to start with a simpler hand, add more actuation to it while building in the control at the same time. It's kind of coming at it from a different direction. Uh, so I so say this is work that's ongoing, uh, but we're making progress in it. Um, so um, updates too. So another theme of uh, research in, in my lab, in our lab, has been on tactile control from uh, tactile images, uh, basically using deep learning methods to uh, process tactile images into say pose information, how, how the pose of an object relative to the, to the sensor, and then use fairly standard control theory methods, you know, PID control, et cetera, to, to do the control of the robot and interaction uh, with an object. So we've We've so we've been working on this for a few years now, and the main kind of task we've been doing the kind of surface following edge tracing around edges, 3D and uh, goal based pushing as well. So it's pushing this object to this, um, to this, uh, you know, to the goal point. Um, so just using a PID controller and some artificial and, and, and some deep learning to, to, to extract features from the image, nothing complicated in terms of planning and so on, just a PID controller underlining this. Um, so the way we've taken this, I'm sorry, we've had, you know, a stream of publications in various places like RAM and transactions and robotics on this. So the way we've taken this more recently uh, as paper that's just about to be ready to be submitted is we've uh, extended the kind of things you can do with that server control uh, from a technical perspective before we were doing pose based server control. And now we're doing pose and shear based server control, um, which um, makes a step change in the dexterity of what you can do with these robots. So in the, in the case here that's shown is that the left robot is like a master following a pre-planned trajectory, and the right robot is using the sense of touch to keep in contact with the object. Uh, to show we're not cheating, that's where the left robot is basically human hands instead. And you can see how shear is really important to do this. Pose on its own is, is not enough. Unfortunately, the type of sensor that we used is actually more sensitive to shear than it is to, to, um, to like normal forces. Uh, and then here's some examples of this, you know, in operation doing the kind of tasks we did before of like pushing uh, and um, surface following. Uh, another difference is before we were basically doing position control. So although the videos were very smooth, in reality, the robot would be quite jerky. Uh, but this is now using velocity control instead. Uh, it turns out the mathematics is quite complicated underlying this. We needed to use like SE3 Bayesian filters uh, to develop some novel methods for doing like a dropout in the, in the output layers of a neural network and so on. Uh, it's kind of a tour de force uh, by John Lloyd um, who, who did this work. But you know, in the end, we got it working as you can see. Um, okay. And then just to show that moving now more towards the sim, so the kind of things I'm showing in reality, we can also do in simulation as well. So this is a simulator uh, that's basically doing the same kind of edge following as we have in reality, but in simulation. So here, this is more kind of mimic it in sim. I'm going to be talking about sim to real later, but it's kind of show that the kind of things you can do in reality, you can also do in simulation. Sorry. Um, so a difference is, in reality, we use so it's these marker-based methods on these levers. Uh, the simulation, like Sharon's work, we use a depth map. It's convenient to use a depth map in simulation uh, for, for, for uh, simulated tactile sensing. But as it turns out, it's a map between these two. Okay, update three is now on the sim to real um, control, well, tactile control, um, using deep reinforcement learning. Um, 
So basically, uh, again, we've got a kind of a stream of uh, a few papers uh, developing these methods over the last few years. Uh, so the, the idea here is you learn and control policy completely in simulation, and then you, you, you train a network to translate between the real tactile images and the simulated tactile images. And then you can use the policy and simulation to guide the real robot, because you can map from the real tactile images into simulation and use the policy and simulation to produce actions that you can then move the robot with. Uh, and as you can see, this works on you know, a variety of different tasks that we could, we could also do before using the kind of um, using the conventional control methods, but we can also do it in, in, reinfor in, in a reinforcement learning um, you know, approach as well. Um, I think it's necessary, if you want to use uh, deep reinforcement learning for control with using touch, I think it's necessary to go to simulation simply for the reason that it's, it's too, it's, you know, it's expensive to gather. Sample. Reinforcement learning takes a lot of samples to learn its policies, and that's impractical to do in reality. So, but it's, it turns out it's reasonably straightforward to translate between simulation and reality and back again. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's the way to do it. And then it's reasonably cheap. It's easy, reasonably easy to gather, gather the, the um, paired real and simulated tactile images to learn the model to translate between simulation and reality. Um, okay, so here's some progress on that. Um, so Max um, has got a poster here um, where uh, basically this is exploring model-based and model-free um, reinforcement learning approaches, but using the same kind of sim to real uh, approach. So this allows him to, for example, push more complicated objects because some path planning is, is possible using model-based methods. Um, but you can chat with Max more about that. Another way we've taken the to real forward, uh, Marrow's work, um, is using, um, basically trying to reconstruct from tapping against an object, trying to build up a 3D model of that object, uh, which uh, Marrow has now solved. Um, well, or at least he's got it working now on, on real tactile data. He taps, say, maybe 10 times at 10 different places on a complex object, and then using these, his, uh, his machine learning methods, his um, NERV methods, you're able to basically interpolate over those points based upon knowledge of what objects look like to, in order to infer the shape of the object. I say he's just recently got that working on, on real tactile data as well. And then um, finally, um, sim to real. Uh, for, so the direction we're taking the sim to real forward is to, to using multiple tactile sensors. So this is uh, Vaughan's work, uh, Yijong's work. So here he's using two robot arms to manipulate uh, objects. But again, using the kind of same sort of methods as I was describing earlier with, um, with single tactile sensors. Um, and you know, there's various tasks that you can do with two two robot arms, you know, by pushing, uh, by reorienting, by gathering, you know, to, to test out these methods, how they work with multiple sensors. Uh, so I think you can see the direction we're going here is, is A, towards, you know, robot hands that have multiple fingertips on them, and B, towards developing AI methods for interpreting tactile data from multiple tactile sensors to be able to control you know, either, you know, two arms in this case, or, you know, in the future, we, you know, to like with these users' methods on, on dexterous robot hands. Um, that's it. Uh, just a quick recap. <laughs> There's kind of three updates here. First on uh, real tactile enabled robot hands. Um, there's a couple of posters here that kind of fits into that theme. Um, second was the updates on the real and sim tactile um, supervised learning for, for server control. Uh, John's not here, so if you want to know more about that, I guess you can email him or chat with me. He can manage to find me. And um, the third is um, sim to real tactile deep reinforcement learning control. I've got three, a few posters here. Uh, Bourne's Yijong post is actually on attention of robot touch, but what I showed here was on the by touch. But I'm sure I'd be happy to chat with you about both of those. Um, and that's it. And um, I finished on time, remarkably. So I guess we've got time for a few questions. I could do a quick demo of the sensor, actually. It's all plugged in. So it's got, why not a, um, I was going to do it in the middle of the talk, but it just didn't really seem to. 
seem to be the right time. It's actually using the Gaussian kernel density method. Oh. It's using the Gaussian kernel density method similar to, to Michael was talking about this morning. Uh, so it's a new method we're using to interpret the factor. It's not working, is it? It was working when I tried it last time. Was it not working? I'll give it, I'll try it one more time and then I'll give up. Just shows that live demos never work. Um, well, there's a, there's, that's what the tactile images look like. Um, ah, there you go. Yeah, so what basically is it's used as a Gaussian kernel method to translate between those Im marker based images to, you know, something that's now, you know, a bit more. You can see how responsive it is. And actually, you can see the shear fit. So this is actually kind of like taking out the normal displacement, the depth motion, but you can actually see the shear on this. So, so as I move it one direction, the red is actually showing the shear. So I'm not, see how the shear is changing the, um, the image you get out. Yeah. Um, We've used Voronoi methods before to do this kind of thing. That's like a hundred lines of code. Uh, John figured this out. It's four, it's four lines of code. Turns out. Anyway, I'm meeting some my questions. So maybe one or two questions. Um, this is if anybody's got anything to ask. Uh, Bryce. Uh, well, this is Korea. Uh, you said you're using Jupyter. No, we're using Pi bullets. So that means we're massively behind on the times. Okay, so do you have any plan to go to Mojoko Omniverse, so like the new kind we're, of trendy simulation platform? We're, we're currently looking into it, but it, it's it's a balance between <clears throat> exploiting what we've got and developing, you know, something new, which would, you know, comes with an overhead and so, basically it needs a new PhD student. I mean, we there are, there are, Max is interested in it and we're in discussions at the moment, but, you know, undertaking that and basically converting everything over is, is not... It's non-trivial. I mean, it's all possible. It just takes person time, and at the moment, we don't have that person time. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Okay. Very, very interesting. I would like to ask if you could elaborate a bit more on why you mentioned something on how the sensor struggles to measure normal forces compared to shear forces. Doesn't struggle. Could... It's perfectly good at measuring normal forces as well as shear. Oh, forces. okay. Maybe I misunderstood. But something. it's just it turns out it's a bit more sensitive at measuring shear force than it is oh, at normal you. force. Oh, okay. But it, but you can do both. Okay. Uh, I guess that's probably it. So it's time to catch it. Oh. You've got a USB C connection. You could use more power cable. Oh, wow. Thank you. Sorry, I'll get out this one. Yeah, now I can share. Thank you. All right. Do we see it? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. I'm Catherine Kuchenbecker, and I'm really happy to be here. I want to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful workshop and bringing us all together so we can learn from each other. Um, I am a director at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, which we have two sites in Stuttgart, and Germ uh, Stuttgart Germany, and Tübingen. Uh, in Stuttgart, we focus a bit more on the physical side of robotics and AI, and in Tübingen, more on the computational side. Uh, the work I'm going to be showing you together today is a long-term collaboration uh, with Georg Martius, who has been a group leader in the Tübingen side of our institute for many years, and he just started as a full professor at the University of Tübingen. In my department, which is called haptic intelligence, uh, like many of you, I'm really fascinated by the sense of touch and physical interactions. And we're actually working on a very broad range of topics. Um, my background, I come from more teleoperation, enabling a human to control a robot at 
a distance. We also work a lot on understanding haptic interfaces and designing new devices, also fingertip haptics. But along the way of all this work creating stimuli for humans, we started getting really interested in the dual problem of, well, what should robots be able to sense and how can we enable them to interact autonomously with the physical world and also with people? We work also on physical human robot interaction. So today I'm going to highlight one project from the touch sensing area of our work, but I thought it would be good just for you to understand that we work on many aspects of uh, this like haptic and physical interaction. Um, this is my team, several of them are, a couple of them are here in the audience and have been running around. And today um, I have postdocs and PhD students and staff and lots of visiting students. We're very open. If anyone's ever interested in coming to visit us uh, in Stuttgart, please let me know. We like hosting visiting PhD students. But today I'm particularly gonna show you the work of Iris Andrusov. She's up in the upper left and she's a PhD student that Georg Marcius and I co-advise. Um, and this builds on a past project that I worked on uh, with Juan Bosun, who was one of was Georg's PhD student, who is now a postdoc at Yale, uh, with Rebecca Kramer Botiglio, and with Georg. And this is a project called Insight, and I'll just play the video so you can watch it while it goes. And this is a uh, yet another different vision-based tactile sensor, similar to the ones you've been seeing so far today, but actually different in some key areas. So we wanted a sensor that's very robust. And so we have a metal skeleton um, that's then over molded with soft elastomer. And there are no layers in the elastomer. It's one uniform. It's like Ecoflex mixed with aluminum flake and aluminum powder. So it is opaque. Uh, inside, you see what the camera is seeing as Juanbo is touching the outside of Insight. Um, and we see the deformations. There's some... Um, the colors change and you can see infer the, the um, deformations that are happening on the outside of this elastomer shell. But we train a deep neural network that goes end to end from pixels of like what the camera sees to, let me play the movie again, um, that to this like field, what we call a force map, little vectors of the contact forces at a bunch of points all over. Uh, the surface. So we're not trying to estimate deformations, just contact forces. And I think some benefits of this approach are that it's relatively easy to fabricate and it's very, very robust. Um, you can put it on a real robot and interact with stuff for a long time. It has a very, it's very sensitive. So we have very good spatial resolution, about 0.4 millimeters and very good force measuring accuracy down to like mean error of like 0.03 Newtons. And also we're estimating the contact force. So you heard Nathan talk about that shear is very important. So yeah, we're estimating not just normal force, but also shear at every point um, all over the surface. And we found as we used it, that if we rotate the sensor relative to gravity, we can also figure out how the sensor is oriented relative to gravity because gravity pulls the, um, the elastomer just enough for it to, uh, find this out. So anyway, we made the sensor and we're very proud of it. This was published in Nature Machine Intelligence last February and Juanbo did an absolutely amazing job. But if you just look at this picture, it probably jumps out to you that insight is really big, right? That's not a fingertip sensor. That's like as big as your thumb. It doesn't have the articulation. Um, and so all of us agreed, like we needed to make a little version. And uh, Juanbo needed to graduate. Uh, so we recruited a new PhD student. Actually, I think when this picture was taken, Iris had already started. Um, but at the beginning you think, oh yeah, I have this great sensor. It all works, we characterize it and we'll just miniaturize it and make a little one. And that should totally work well, right? It's much harder than you expect. It's possible, but I think it's not trivial. And so I'll just tell you a few things uh, that we figured out along the way, uh, but we did end up making a new version, which we call Min Sight, so like a miniature version of Insight. And this has been recently accepted to Advanced Intelligent Systems. It's open access, it's online, um, and so you can take a look. I'm just going to go through uh, some of the main points from this paper uh, that Iris and Juanbo and Georg and I recently published. And in it, we show you MinSight, a really, really small fingertip size version uh, that uses a vision-based tactile sensor that uses the same uh, principles as Insight did um, in just a much, much smaller package. Um, so like Insight, we have a 3D printed metal um, skeleton that's over molded in an elastomer shell and a single camera. It's uh, a USB camera, a little Mizumi camera that's looking out. There are six LEDs on a custom board and the collimator kind of shapes the light. So it uh, evenly illuminates the inside of the elastomer shell. And then we take those input uh, images 
And this camera can go at 60 frames per second, and then we use a deep network to map this into our force map, or alternatively into just when there is only one single contact, a force vector, and the contact location. And then we can visualize those uh, little force contact vectors, just like we did before. And today I'll also show you two in the loop, uh, like sensor in the loop applications, actually similar to some of the things that Nathan was showing you in the last talk, because MinSight was always just sitting there on the desk, us touching it, it wasn't uh, actually on a robot. So a little bit more about the manufacturing. You can see Iris makes these 3D printed molds and we take that uh, skeleton, we put it inside the mold and then she mixes the Ecoflex and casts it and then it comes out like a shell and that can be attached and detached from the camera. They can be interchanged if they happen to get damaged, but they're very robust. And then we put it on this um, stage. We have a basically a 3D printer that has um, an ATI Mini 40, so force torque sensor with a little four millimeter Ruby ball. And then we have done all the kinematics so that it can hold the sensor in a particular position and orientation. And then the, we can come down and touch contact point and apply forces in different, um, uh, of different magnitudes and different directions. So every training pair is a picture from the inside of what the camera saw, coupled with the force vector that was being applied and the contact force um, and the diameter of the indenter. So sorry, contact location, contact force and indenter diameter. And then at the end, we were able to get very, very good, um, again, very, very low force error. So for different ranges of force, um, these lists, with 3D and also just the total magnitude for MinSight, we got it down to a mean absolute force error of 0.07 Newtons. It's very low. And we're able to predict contact with a mean error of 0.6 millimeter. So sub-millimeter, this is better than human touch is. Your human fingers are at discerning two point, like two contacts. Um, so it's very precise. There were several things that we optimized and investigated along the way. One, we looked at different skeletons. So Iris made a very like um, strong skeleton, stiff one uh, with, with a lot of support and then a lighter one, a thinner one. The bottom one is what we ended up choosing. Um, it's a little bit modeled on a human finger. So there's like a, a angled pad and we're, we're also thinking about robot hands or manipulation, grasping things. So we wanted to prioritize one softer area. And you can definitely see that having fewer skeleton um, uh, sticks or pieces uh, get, give us, gives us a lower force error and better force prediction, better force prediction and better position prediction. Um, but you could uh, redesign the skeleton. You just have to retrain, uh, get new data. So, so I'll show this one for the rest. We also um, looked a lot into optimizing the pipeline because we want to use this in real time. So the camera takes images at 1020 by 7, uh, 1020 by 720. We were already down sampling them to 410 by 308. And then we did an ablation study where Iris reduced the resolution. Okay, can you pull out a force contact vector from the last one and the contact location? Probably not, but where does it start to break down? And we were surprised. At 20% of the initial image resolution, we can still get almost as good as with the 100%, which is already down sample. So there's like, for our design, there's no benefit to having any more than 82 by 60 pixels, which I was really surprised because in your when you look at it with your eye, you're like, oh, there's so much beautiful information, but the elastomer is opaque. And so it's getting smooth and filtered. And so there's basically no information um, beyond. Uh, so we always now downsample to 20, uh, this 20% 20 size, and then we can run our network way, way, way faster and get much closer to real time. Interesting side note, if you calculate 82 times 60, that's 4,920 pixels. It doesn't sound like much when it's 82 times 60, but 4,920 sounds like a lot. And then you think the area, the surface area on the outside, the active area is 1,740 millimeters squared. If you do the division, it's like 0.27, millimeter squared of the surface per pixel on the camera. And that actually comes out at 0.6 or 0.59 millimeters by 0.59 millimeters, which is exactly our position sensing resolution. So it like lines up beautifully that at, when we go worse than that, we start seeing worse predict position prediction and worse force prediction, uh, force estimation. And so basically there's not any more information in this, with the, I think it's more about the mechanics. The, the camera is not the limiting factor, or at least it, it, with every, with all the other parts that we have, the camera is not the limiting factor. And so, yeah, it's close to the location there. We also did investigations of different kinds of networks with trying testing fewer parameters and looking at how well their, their errors could get down and how fast the inference. So I think the results I'm gonna show you in, in, in real time are using the very small squeeze net on a Raspberry Pi, which is 14.5 milliseconds per inference of that 20% sized image uh, to get to um, the contact point and the force vector. 
And then I'll show you these two applications that we implemented. The first was inspired by a clinical application of palpation. I don't know, um, finding tumors and lumps and structures under the skin is very important um, and difficult. So we made some silicone samples and had our sensor press into them gently and more firmly. And we got 98% of being able to detect whether there's a lump there and even getting down to uh, estimating which um, lump it was, a smaller or larger one, it was also be able to feel it very, very well. The confusions are at light pressing force for the biggest one, which feels uh, also feels very similar to the small ones. So that was lump detection. And the other application I want to show you is tactile servoing. From the beginning, we had this vision of Minsight on the end of a robot and following a finger. And so basically come up with a, a desired contact force and then program a little closely force control using the output of MinSight to estimate the contact location and the force sensor. And then I'll show you the experiment in a moment. We have a real ATI force torque sensor pressing into the sensor, into, into MinSight. And this is not, the force torque sensor is not used in control, but just used for validation. And this is the magnitude of the optically measured and estimated and mechanically measured ATI force torque sensor over time for this experiment that I will show you now. So we have optical motion tracking. This is the force torque sensor in Iris's hand, and that's a min sight on the end of a tri-finger robot arm. So once Iris gets to capture it and like convinces it to follow her because she exceeds the force torque, uh, the force pro, uh, measurement, then it's like constantly moving to try to keep outputting, I think 0.5 Newtons in the direction, in the normal direction at the point of contact. And um, you can see from the camera image, it's really able, she's able to capture it and track, have it track very, very well. It's pretty fun uh, to move the robot around and have like feel like you're communicating with it. And it's all being done through the camera-based force, uh, force estimation. And uh, for the, the measurements here, of course, we subtracted with the force torque sensor in the user's hand, we're subtracting the weight. So that's like the actual contact force that the, is being applied on the ball and is being applied on the onto MinSight. In the, the paper, we also go through details and, and uh, talk about there are so many beautiful approaches to tactile sensing. As you can probably tell from what I've been speaking about today, we're really focused on 360 degree sensing. We show a few curved sensors and just a handful of flat sensors. There are many, many. They are great, but we think to do these real applications where you want to be able to move around or reach into messy objects or press on um, physical things, we would like to have sensing on all sides. And we're quite proud that MinSight is small and sensitive and quite accurate and fast. Um, so I'll just share a few concluding thoughts before we open for questions. Um, miniaturization is harder than you think it will be in the beginning, but it is possible. You have to re-optimize like a lot. I don't know if other people have found this, but we had to re-optimize like lots of other little details um, to get things to work well at small scale, but I think it's really important. And different sensor designs that we're all exploring, I think they're making different trade-offs. So what we have chosen in MinSight and Insight before it, we wanted something that was really easy to fabricate and robust to physical interaction. I want to be able to drag on textures, touch things that are um, a little sharp and not have it get damaged. Uh, it's lightweight and it's very sensitive to 3D forces. The, the sensing shear was from the beginning something we wanted over this large uh, 360 degree area. But some disadvantages, um, we need experimental data to train and uh, our sensor surface is not uniformly st stiff. Like you can definitely feel the skeleton. So we have like this nice, soft, almost like tactile fovea in the middle. That's where we were pressing uh, on the embedded balls. But if you were to push uh, on where the skeleton is, it's not as sensitive. It can still feel stuff, but it's not as sensitive there. And it definitely cannot measure these fine surface details like uh, gel side and gel tip and all these other beautiful camera sensors that have this very thin surface. So it's not for that, but it's much more, we're estimating direct contact forces. Um, along the way, we found that um, you have to subtract the correct zero contact image. So when you know what this sensor sees when nothing is happening, if you accidentally substitute in another sensor's zero contact image, it, it's very bad. Um, or even from a different day, uh, it's not as good. And so it's really important for us when we're trying to transfer like a model that was learned on one sensor shell with one LED ring to another sensor shell. Um, there are still tiny differences and the LEDs are at tiny different orientations or the camera lens is at a tiny different 
um, orientation. And I wish it wasn't so sensitive to those things. That's something we've been, we've been working on. We had a great intern working on that recently. Um, we also have found, so we have this shell and this soft elastomer. And when it, it feels high forces, it shifts a little bit on the skeleton. And that's not good because then the zero contact image is changing and it's definitely introducing more errors, but it's a trade-off to get this very, it's very strong and won't get damaged, um, but it does shift around a little bit. And yeah, so far, though I'm in the sim to real session, I apologize to Nathan ahead of time and to Shan, uh, we so far haven't found useful uh, roles for simulation. Um, we are planning to use it uh, to mechanically simulate the sensor, to, but not trying to simulate anything about what's happening inside the sensor, just contact force and contact location and to do learning. So we need a soft simulated soft sensor that's reasonably similar to our real physical sensor to have the robot learn to do stuff. But so far we are not, we found the simulations are just so slow and so inaccurate. Um, I'd rather do a real experiment on a real sensor than trying to simulate it and spend a long time making a simulation that's close, but still not correct. But I think we all have different perspectives. With that, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you for your attention. This is my team. Again, uh, this is Iris, the PhD student who did the work that I showed you. Um, and I think the organizers and the funders, people who've reviewed our papers and supported our work and uh, mentored me and my team over the years. And with that, I would be very happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, questions? Okay. There's a microphone there. Anyone can grab it. Here, why don't you give it to the... Uh, thank you for the great presentation. I uh, appreciate a lot everything, uh, also the final conclusion. Uh, I was wondering also if you apply, if you try to apply the higher forces, like for example, 10 Newton or so. So, so far, no. The training, it's this four millimeter diameter um, sphere. And we're only, we stop when we get to, I think about two Newton. So, which is why we're only training up to 1.2. I think we can have higher forces and because we're, we also will then get a higher contact area and we're basically summing up like all the little contact force vectors, but we didn't train beyond that. And so I think it's outside uh, what we have trained for so far. Thank you. But I agree it need, we would, it would be great to have even higher forces. In the front. Just a quick question about mine. So you have aluminum powder in the elastomer, right? Yeah. You managed to have always the uniform distribution of that. We have aluminum powder, so we pre-mix. It's aluminum powder and aluminum flake in the silicone, and we try to mix it up very well. It's not perfectly uniform, so if you visually look at the inside of the different um, shells here, I can unplug and stop sharing so Roberto can set up. Um, so they are somewhat different, but when we subtract the zero image, uh, it looks reasonably similar. I think inference from um, the train on two. It's not quite as good as what I feel, but it's very good. Maybe 70%, uh, or, or maybe like yeah, 30% higher error. But I clearly, like, here, I can speak. I can speak into this well. Um, so clearly, uh, there's still some inconsistency in the manufacturing and like the texture and the appearance of the internal, of the inside of the shell does affect uh, our inference of it. We've got time for a third question, you? Okay, we have a third question. Hello, um, hi. hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, I think it's quite amazing that you managed to make it that small. Um, with the thicker uh, silicon skin than the other sensors, do you find that you have a delay? Because until the mechanical pressure comes to the inside, it probably takes some time, right? Uh, so far, I have not seen a, a temporal delay because I think as soon as you push on the outside, I think you almost instantaneously see it moving inside. The silicone is not very compressible and it's not very strongly supported. So uh, we see inside very quickly, but we will never see like the texture. Like you press inside into a penny, you will not be able to read the penny. Uh, we've never even tried braille. Um, but you will be able to know where things are touching and if they're pushing in the normal direction or in the shear direction and be able to run that really quickly so you could close the control loop around it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. I'm looking forward to Roberto's talk, so let's give him the stage. Um, 
Brilliant. So I think we have uh, reverse spectrum under. What's next for fission based capital testers? All right. Um, yeah, all right. Well, I'll ask. Let's see if I can remove the. All right. All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Roberto Calandra. I'm a, a new professor at the Technische Universität Dresden and uh, at the Center for Tactile Internet with the one in the loop. Uh, you might know me because I used to be at Facebook where I was working on Digit and the whole ecosystem that we were developing. And uh, when I uh, accepted the very kind invitation from Sean and the organizers to come here today, um, I really wanted to talk about some of the work that we've been doing over the next two years and some of the amazing discoveries that we've been doing. But um, when I was actually thinking about what I wanted to talk really in my heart today to you, I actually decided that it was more worthwhile of your, of your time and, and your uh, you know, kind presence here to actually discuss together about benchmarking touch. This is a uh, uh, sort of something that it's, it's very dear to me. And I, I would like this to be you know, as interactive as possible as a discussion. Mm -hmm. So please, if at any point you want to you know, interrupt me, please do this, yeah? And I'll, I'll try to take, take care of time, but you know, also organizers, if I'm late, please ping. Yeah, so let's talk about benchmarking touch. Um, as you know, the way that uh, we have been structuring our research in the last few years has been around these sort of four pillars of hardware, touch processing, simulations, benchmarking data set plus applications and community. But really it turns out to be that benchmarking, um, it's not a fourth pillar. In some ways, deeply integrated into each one of these different parts that we are really thinking about. Uh, benchmarks is a crucial part of hardware. It's a crucial part of touch processing. It's a crucial part of simulations. And it's a crucial part of applications. And the way that over sort of the, the last few years I've been starting to shape my thinking about is that effectively, um, you know, if we look at all this amazing hardware that we've been building in, in the last few years, I, I challenge any of you to re really be able to say, you know, which one of these sensors is better to any other of these sensors, yeah? Each one of these sensors is, is, is unique in their own way, but it's also impossible to compare them. This is comparing apples to oranges. And part of this is because each one of these sensors have been evaluated in using different protocols, using different metrics that people care about. And it's, it's really impossible nowadays to, to, to really understand no, even if we talk about very basic informations about special resolution, you might have different protocols that differ, lead to different results. Are you looking at, you know, what's the smallest object that you can see? Or are you looking about the, uh, you know, if you can infer the distance between two points or, you know, more complex shapes and, and whatnot, yeah? So the way that um, I will basically like to present you my, my thinking, uh, and this is open to discussions, is that really, as a community, we should start thinking about benchmarks in three levels. I think that there is a first level of benchmarking touch, which is at the hardware level. There is a second level, which is perceptual, and there is a third level, which is task. And I will now try to, you know, briefly go through all of these levels to try to explain um, sort of what I'm thinking about and, and, and try to get some of your feedback whether you think this makes sense, yeah? So on the hardware level, um, effectively what we care about if we build a new sensor is to understand what are the properties that these sensors allow us to measure uh, in, you know, in the real world given this specific hardware. And these are properties like Spe special resolution, temporal resolution. These are certainly things that we know that humans have. We can measure them in humans. We can also measure them in, uh, you know, in, in artificial fingertips. Uh, although we might disagree on what is the actual protocol that we want to use to measure this. Uh, things that I, I believe will become 
very, very crucial. And at the moment they are very understudied like multimodality. We know that in our fingers, we have many different types of mechanoreceptors and you know, vision-based tactile sensors mostly capture geometry uh, forces. That's not so interesting. We want to be able to capture more than that. Um, robustness, uh, how do we measure robustness? Uh, is it uh, some type of abrasion test? It, do we care about uh, sharp edges? Do we care about, uh, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of grasps we can do? Form factor, this is very obvious. And anything else that comes after that, you know, in my mind, there are probably 20 to 30 different metrics that we might care about. So how do we identify them? How do we really uh, define them in a way that if you're talking about special resolution and I'm talking about special resolutions, the two metrics are you know, comparable, yeah? And the main problem, as you might have understand by now is, is the lack of standardization. We don't agree on what we're talking about when you and me discuss about something. So what in practice I would like to propose to, to this community today is that over the next few years, I think that there are three very concrete action items that we should be thinking and, and acting upon. The first one is that we need to build agreement on what are the metrics and what are the protocols for testing hardware, tactile hardware. And uh, you know this is very important, but it's only the first step. The second step will be that once we know what are the metrics that we care about, we need to be able to devise a, a, an evaluation bench tool, uh, you know, a physical device where we can put the sensor and anybody can measure the same thing, whether you, you are in US, whether you are in, in Bristol, whether you are in, you know, in Japan. And once we have this, this is, this is a good step because now we can measure the same thing, but ultimately also this is going to be very painful if we think in practice uh, for researchers to actually do that. So what I really would like to see, let's say five or 10 years down the line is to have uh, some partner or, or, or a third party uh, like the NIST or, or IEEE really establishing uh, you know, uh, a third party lab where you can send your sensor and, and these things can be evaluated, yeah? And yes, maybe you need to pay some money for, to do this, but at least we know that the measures are impartial and the measures are sort of the ground truth, yeah? Feedback, thoughts? <laughs> All right. So hardware, how do you uh, discriminate between, let's say, vision-based sensors and what I would call the others? Yeah. Because they have like inherent and I mean like yeah, implicit difference in the sensor. Um, I think that this should be, I don't think we should differentiate explicitly, I think we should differentiate in the metrics. You know, uh, a tactile sensor, which is vision-based, is likely to have better spatial resolution, will probably be worse in terms of temporal resolution. Uh, you know, you will see, you will have so many metrics that ultimately different technology will be stronger in some places, will be worse in other places. And ultimately, technology changes, but what we care about should remain the same over a longer period of time. All right, I'll move on to the next level, but please, uh, again, let's discuss about um, together. The second level that I'm proposing here is perceptual. Once we have the hardware, we need to use these road measurements that we get out of the hardware to do something, to predict something, to make sense of the world around us. And we need to use models uh, typically, you know, nowadays AI models uh, in order to do this. So if we have tasks like classifying materials, classifying sleep, detecting sleep, reconstructing objects, these are uh, all in some form perceptual tasks that can be performed from passive data. They don't require interaction themselves. And uh, they are dependent, of course, on the hardware, but they're also dependent on the particular model that we use. And the value of thinking about this perceptual level is that now fixing a hardware, we can start investigating different models or what is the best, best model? What is the, you know, if you use AI, what are the particular mod, 
you know, machine learning models or structures or inductive biases that you want to use in order to improve the performance of your overall perceptual system, um, again, conditioned on a particular piece of hardware that, that you might be using or having. And now this is something that can be done in a passive way because we are evaluating models at this stage. And again, the questions that I think we will need to build agreements is what are the important properties that we actually care about uh, you know, being able to, to measure perceptually? Uh, you know, we might care about detecting different materials. We might care about uh, constructing the 3D, ge 3D geometry of, of something that we are touching, but you know, there might be different applications depending for what is the specific fields that you are working on. And once we have that, my hope is that we will be able to start building data sets and, and sort of standardized middle, middleware that will allow us to more easily uh, be able to compare models. And when I say things middle, like middleware, I, you know, I explicitly refer to things like skinware or PyTouch, where ideally you can just switch different models. You can compare different models that people have already implemented and uploaded online. And, and now if you want to invent a new algorithms, it's very easy to basically you know, compare to existing state of the art. Finally, question or no? Yes, that's it. Um, not at this stage. I think this is a very, very reasonable assumption. Uh, and it would be interesting if we can sort of, uh, you know, from the de developmental uh, sort of processes in humans, we know that humans learn in some sort of curricula. So in some way, it would be interesting to also take some of that literature. But at this stage, I don't have a strong uh, sort of thoughts about having a hierarchy rather than independent tasks, yeah. Um, the third level is, is task. It's active motor control. Is the fact that ultimately as roboticians, we want to put this type of tactile sensors onto robots and we want to use them to manipulate the environment, to interact with the world, interact with people. And the fact that we now have you know, hardware, a perceptual side and a controller mean that we need to evaluate the whole pipeline as a pipeline rather than as individual elements. And uh, as you can imagine, the type of tasks that I'm alluding here are things like grasping. You know, If we use this particular hardware and this particular tactile sensor and this particular controller, how well can we grasp objects? How well can we manipulate objects? How well can we uh, insert objects or, or assembly some, you know, something in a factory? And these are intrinsically active tasks where we are no longer only just collecting data and making sense of it, but we are also having a decision-making part on top of it. And again, sort of the type of um, ideas that I'm proposing here is that we need to identify what are the important tasks. As a, you know, looking into industries, looking into where we see tactile sensing be, being used in research in the next decades, what are the tasks that we really deeply care about? And once we know this, we can start thinking about uh, really building challenges, building competitions in simulation and in the real world. Uh, things like you know, tactile gym, uh, tacto, all the simulators out there. We should start standardizing. And Jitendra is here. You know, what Jitendra would say, I'm stealing your words, is that you know, computer vision community has been extremely successful in setting uh, basically uh, benchmarks in setting challenges and going after them. And I think that as a tactile sensing community, we should do the same. And the reason why we should do the same is because uh, if we actually look out there, outside of this room, you know, everybody in this room is here because it's convinced that touch is useful. But if we talk to other people out there, 
most people are still not convinced that touch is useful. Yeah, I get a lot of questions like, oh, why are we you know, doing research in tactile sensing? And you know, I'm philosophically convinced that it's useful, but many, in many cases, I don't have empirical proof to show to people that, oh, this is the case. This is the reason why you need to do this. And this is particularly, maybe even more important for industry where there already is an inertia. We already need, need to convince them that it's worth their money to invest into this. And if we don't have as a community proofs that touch is important, this is gonna be a really, really hard task to do individually, yeah? So in addition to this, as a scientific community, we should be interested in objectively trying to measure and quantify progress. And of course, having metrics and challenges and tests will help to do this. And finally, it really might be this the opportunity to focus on, on a couple of key challenges that we think are reasonable to solve in the next couple of years and, and go after that instead of basically uh, you know, spreading forces over a number of tasks that individually might not really change uh, you know, the success of the community, yeah? Um, so this is you know, basically what I wanted to tell you today. Um, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Before this, I will just do a um, sort of, you know, very <laughs> egoistical announcement that I'm actually hiring. So, you know, if you are looking uh, for a place to live in Germany, Dresden is an excellent place with a, uh, you know, very high quality of life and excellent beer. Uh, so I'm looking for, you know, people at all levels, PhD, postdocs, lab managers. So please uh, ping me if you are interested. And so to recap, I believe that as a community to grow, we really need to start setting goals and we need to start setting metrics that we can measure. And overall, I propose that we do this at three different level abstractions, which is hardware, which is perception, and which are control tasks. And we need to be able in the long term to be successful as a community, to be convincing in, in showing to the rest of the wider robotic community that touch is important and that we have evidence that this is the case. Thank you very much for your time. Fantastic. So we've got time for a couple of questions, but I, I'm sure some of these points will come up in the discussion later. Um, hi, great talk. Um, quick question. Um, what do you think about, particularly for the tasks, the role of perhaps really setting the bar for ourselves, uh, looking at how humans are able to perform some of these things? Because I think sometimes we kind of like imagine based on what we've seen and what we've been capable of so far. But I think the gold standard in my mind is really to put robots where people are. And so if you can do the complex things that people can do, and maybe even exceed them, then you really know you've been successful from rubbing your finger and detecting a, a, a nanometer, uh, you know, uh, uh, artifact to being able to manipulate something between your fingers to larger scale grasping. I mean, how do you think that might fit into the sort of standardization, even as a baseline or a goal to be achieved or exceeded? Um, I, I, I agree. You know, the the human hand in some way is the golden standard that we, in manipulation, right? This is what we would like to, everybody would like to achieve. Specifically for in-hand manipulation, fine manipulation, um, I find that my, my doubt there is the fact that there is also the hardware component of the hand. And building hardware hands that are as dexterous as a, uh, and robust as a human hand is its own challenge. So in some way, this is what I would like to see, but as a way of de-risking, I would like to start from tasks maybe that don't require such level of dexterity in the beginning. Maybe it could be easier things like, you know, inserting pegs or, or you know, some sort of parallel gripper manipulation type of thing. But I, I agree with you that that would be... It's a... 
<laughs> so um, the, the, the first two levels seem very straightforward to me. The third level seems huge, yep. like ne never ending. And then do we also have to compare ourselves to solutions that don't use tackle sensors like soft grippers or just, mm -hmm. and then in order to prove that we are better? I absolutely think we should, yes. Okay. Um, I think that this is exactly the, one of the key challenges in, you know, in communicating with people that are not believers in touch sensing, right? They will tell you, oh, but I can do this with a tentacle, pneumatic tentacle. I can do this uh, you know, from vision. Why do I need to spend 50 bucks to put a tactile sensor on my robot? Mm, okay. But I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. So we set this person, can we set up Ted at the same time? Yes. I don't know how to do this. Maybe if you stop sharing your screen. Yes. Um, I have one more question. Can, can I ask? Um, so I, have, uh, I want to hear your thought. I, I, so I think it's a great and important idea to push to some benchmarks, um, but I want to hear your thoughts on whether now is the good time, is the right time, because an interesting counterpoint I have heard myself is like because tactile sensor is a new uh, area like compared to cameras and maybe like different labs working on different aspects of this actually encourage innovation. So and then maybe at a certain point when a particular method over outperforms all the other methods, mm -hmm. then this sort of benchmark will automatically be formed. Mm -hmm. um, I want to hear what, what, what do you think about this? So I think that at the hardware level, we need this now. We need this very urgently. And you know, um, we, we shouldn't wait five years for the hardware to standardize because we actually need these metrics to standardize the hardware. Um, I think that in some degree, you're right that you know, at the task level, we still have a lot of uncertainty about you know, what, what, what are the tactile sensor information that we actually care about? What are the perceptual information that we need? And uh, it might take longer to really conversion to something, but I think we should also start very actively think about it. And maybe just by having the wrong benchmark, we actually learn what are the important things that can inform sort of a more useful benchmark, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ted, can you hear us? Yeah. So we, shall we check that your sound is working? Uh, if you could say something. Oh, no, that sound's not working. Maybe that sound can help. Maybe the sound's not working. All right. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Great. Brilliant. Me? All right. Great. Fantastic. So next we've got <clears throat> Ed Adelson on advances in camera-based tactile sensing. Uh, we're running about five minutes late, but that's okay. There's a large amount of time set aside for the break. So, so. cool. Over to you, Ted. All right. Are you seeing my screen? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, all right, so let's uh, just uh, begin with something I think you're familiar with. Um, this is the sort of thing we've been doing for a while. This is uh, uh, one of our favorite uh, gel site sensors. It's got, uh, it's, it's a wedge shape, which is convenient for robotics. Uh, and we can pick up all kinds of wonderful inf information from it, like uh, shear and force and shape. Um, and uh, it's also worth noting that with that kind of information, if it's uh, accurate information, you can do um, wonderful things like uh, pose estimation. So in this case, where you, if you uh, 
know the object and you know its initial pose, then just by watching the uh, output of the gel site sensor shown on the right, you can uh, infer the um, the 3D shape. Uh, I'm sorry, the 3D shape and pose, which I think could be uh, very useful. Maybe a, maybe a nice uh, topic for a benchmarking uh, test. Um, but I'd like to talk uh, in this uh, in this presentation about first of all some new applications we've been uh, pursuing and also some new physical configurations. And as far as applications, starting with the uh, that wedge that we like to play with, um, here's a problem which is uh, a household chore folding uh, a towel, for example. And if you want a robot to help you with that, it should probably have tactile sensors because this is a very tactile task. You um, feel your way along the edge of the towel until you find your way to the end, and then you know that it's time to, to do the fold. So can we use tactile sensing for that? Uh, well, the first thing we have to do is teach our, our fingers to know how to feel their way around on a towel. So here we're training uh, the sensor or the robot to recognize different parts of the towel. Here's the towel, how it feels like if it's folded over. Uh, here's what the towel feels like on an edge. Here's what it feels like uh, in the middle. Um, here's, here it is on the corner. And um, once we've done the training on that, we can then uh, put, the, put the robot to work. Uh, and here, uh, under tactile servoing, it's finding its way to the bottom uh, of that edge until it feels the corner. And it can tell that it's gotten to the corner because the way the corner feels is different than the way the edge feels. And, and also, I should say, it's feeling its way along the edge and keeping making sure the edge is still between the fingers by uh, feedback from the tactile sense as well. So this is a nice example of how you can use this tactile information in uh, a, uh, a domestic task. But we're looking at uh, a variety of other configurations. Uh, and here's an example. Suppose you want to build a fin ray effect finger, such as these ones uh, that are from Festo. Now, you know the, the fin ray is a really cool uh, finger. It's tapered, which is a nice shape for getting into small areas uh, in robotics. And also, when it grasps something, it automatically uh, curves around it to hold it well. Uh, that's that's due to the clever design of the, um, the fins uh, in, in between the finger sides. Well, could you put a gel site sensor on that? The big problem is you've got those fins in the, running in the middle. Uh, so if you try to put a camera in there, the camera can't see anything. But uh, we've been able to do it if we, we can hollow out the middle of those fins and replace the fins with thin struts on the sides. And shown here on the left is just a cutaway of uh, the interior. So the interior is now empty except for those struts on the sides. We put a camera at one end. Uh, we put a mirror along the back side and uh, a strip of a flexible strip of gel site um, on the on the bottom here on the on the front face of the thing. And now we have the problem of how do we do the illumination? We want to get multiple colors in multiple directions. Uh, so we, what we have is uh, we have, there's a blue LED at the end of the strip, and along the edges. The two sides of the strip are uh, coated with fluorescent paint, though they, they fluoresce in response to the blue light. So we've got blue light coming one direction, green and red light coming in other directions from the paint along the strips. And that paint is flexible, so it flexes along with, the, um, with that strip. And, uh, and here's the result. We can um, build uh, this gel site equipped fin rays. We can plunge. Uh, these uh, fingers into this bowl of nuts. Uh, once you grasp a nut, you can uh, look at the texture and shape of the nut. And, um, and of course, using the usual machine vision techniques, you can now classify the nuts that you're picking up. So that's a, 
think a nice example of how um, we can uh, uh, put gel site on kind of challenging non-obvious uh, shapes of fingers. Uh, here's a more common shape. A lot of people have uh, made fingers that are uh, round, giving you sensing on all sides. Um, gel tip, omnitact, inside are examples of uh, round fingers like that. Um, and they, uh, people often get nice data from them, but it's hard to get good 3D. Now, not everybody cares about getting good 3D, but that's something that we like to do in my lab. Um, and so uh, here's a, a, one way to do that. Um, you, uh, well, it's very difficult to, to control the light inside um, one of these things, because if you just stick light in the end, you don't really have a lot of control of its directionality. So we did a kind of radical thing here where we put very thin strips of LEDs uh, in the middle, actually right in the gel. So we got these two strips of, uh, of LEDs uh, in the gel, and then we've got other LEDs along the edge of the gel. And between them, we get directional, nice, uh, well-defined directional light at all uh, positions in the gel. And so here we're putting a, pushing a screw against it. You can see the output from the screw, and then we can reconstruct the 3D shape of the screw with all the threads on the right. And of course, we have the problem that the LEDs block some of the view, but not much of it, and we can interpolate across that. All right, how, how about this problem? Uh, a nice thing that you get with your own hand is you grasp something, you've got tactile sensing all over the place, so you're getting lots and lots of data. On the other hand, with most artificial tactile sensors, they're small, they just touch a single little patch, and so you don't get much data. Uh, so what could we do to try to get a lot of data all at the same time uh, and not needing to have to go touch, 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 touch at multiple places? Uh, so we built this, um, what we call an endoflex. It's a soft finger with a uh, flexible skeleton embedded inside. Uh, this finger has two cameras, each of them a, with a wide angle lens. Uh, each of them is looking out at the uh, entire, a, a big soft patch that's on the front of the finger. So it sees the front and the sides of the finger. Um, and um, and there's lights so we can get um, you know, colored illumination so we can extract information about the, the shape. Um, and as I say, each of these fingers has two cameras and, and two big soft pads. Uh, and we've got a total of three fingers here. Each, each finger is tendon activated with a single degree of freedom. Um, Anyway, so between them, we've got six big soft sensors uh, surrounding the object, and we can uh, grasp it by pulling on the tendons. Um, and uh, so here is the, uh, here it is in action. We stick an object in there, it squeezes it, and we've trained it to recognize a small set of objects by by touch, it's getting data from all those cameras all over, so multiple uh, parts of the object at the same time. Uh, so this is anyway, a step toward getting the rich uh, multi-surface kind of uh, information that you can get, that you would like to get from a hand. All right, but now, um, Let's go the other direction. Suppose we just want to have a single camera that's going to give us an entire finger that's finger-like. Uh, this is uh, it's not published yet. It's under review uh, by Alan Zhao. Uh, so on the left, you see what you see the finger shape that we're aiming for. Uh, it's not a flexible finger. It's a, just a, a stiff finger. Uh, and on the right, you see there's a camera toward the base. The camera bounces off a little mirror, and then that mirror bounces off a big curved mirror that goes along the whole back of the camera. This uh, mirror uh, combination allows it to look at the entire inside of that uh, sensor surface, which you see on the right. Uh, 
There's a couple of strips of LEDs to provide the illumination. And uh, again, here on the left, you see there's a camera at the base, there's a mirror and another mirror. Um, and on the right, you can see what the camera sees. It sees, it actually looks at this, the LED strips um, and also looks at the skin and can see the skin on the front and the sides of that thing. Um, and the uh, raw image, a uh, single image is shown here on the right. And then to the right of that is a difference image. And uh, what you see there is two things. One is there's a blob in the middle where, which is where the object is touching the finger. And the other is you see that all the LED uh, locations have shifted a bit. So you're seeing a shift of the LEDs due to the force that's on the finger. And this at first seems like a disadvantage. It means that we've got this uh, annoying shift of the LEDs themselves showing up in our difference image. But you can make uh, lemonade out of lemons because that shift of the LEDs is telling you proprioceptive information because it's telling you how the overall uh, shape of the finger is changing. The finger is flexing in response to that um, force. So anyway, we're getting two kinds of information here. One kind is the tactile information from the skin itself in the middle of the finger. And the other is the proprioceptive information from the flexing that we can see here. Anyway, just to uh, summarize, um, we're having fun pushing things in new directions, both in terms of the uh, way, way we can use the information to guide robotic actions and uh, in the way we can build new sensors with new configurations. Um, in one case, the thin ray using uh, a novel kind of fluorescent strip illumination, another case using these embedded strips for illumination. Uh, the endoflex giving us a total of six cameras and soft fingers looking all over the place when we grasp something. And then the this last thin finger, which is uh, kind of attractive finger-like shape. Uh, and that's it. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. I think we've got time for a few questions. Um, I'll ask a question first then. Um, so Ted, what, the, the single finger where you had proprioception in it as well from the movement of the lead, what are you going to use it for? Um, well, uh, uh, we could use it for any number of things. But uh, as you know, there is this uh, awkwardness many times when you're using a, uh, when you're using a sensor, which is that um, you started out building the sensor, thinking about how you're going to build the sensor, and the but a roboticist may be starting out thinking about the mechanical properties of the finger that they want, and uh, often people want a finger that's finger shaped. So, so you'll have uh, if you have multiple fingers, let's say they could be attached to a parallel jaw gripper, or it could be a you know a, uh, let's say a three finger gripper, um, and uh, but people want to get data not just at the fingertips, but along the entire finger. So that's the idea here, is that we'll be able to use the, uh, the phalanges of the finger as well as the fingertips to gather data. Okay, brilliant. Cool, okay. So I guess uh, there's no questions. We'll head on to the next talk, which is, um, we'll say thanks to Ted again. Thank you. Which is uh, Richard, who got the job of it, surprise. And you found out yesterday about that, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not rich. Didn't find a wig. Uh, my name is Bryce, and I'm going to talk about like how we handle and how we develop sensors as Shadow Robot Company, and mostly like how we do things for our robot hands. So quick introduction about who, who we are and what we do. So we, uh, we are SME founded in 1997, uh, 1997 sorry, uh, counting now 36 employees. Uh, we have teams uh, split across developing hardware, manufacturing it, and developing software for the robot hand. We work with uh, both private and public uh, institutions to make robots uh, always more dexterous. <coughs> 
And for that, we propose like the first, uh, I mean, one of the first uh, product, which is a dexterous hand. So it's like an anthropomorphic hand, 24 uh, movements, 20 degrees of freedom. It's talent driven. So it's like a great platform for uh, control. Um, and it has uh, 129 sensors. I'm not even accounting for the uh, tactile sensors. Uh, so you can really get a good understanding of how things happen in the hand. And this is quite like anthropomorphic. Um, we found it like quite intuitive to make it as a teleoperation system. So the user just needs to put some uh, gloves on and then we can start operating uh, the robots, which will mimic what the arms and hands are doing. With a quite a good precision, we can like carry out a set of tasks. And it's quite a nice uh, toy, I would say, if you're doing like reinforcement learning, uh, imitation learning, because you can collect data and try to transfer it to the robots uh, without being teleoperated. While working on these two, pro uh, let's say, products, we found like a lot of uh, challenges, obviously, as any teleoperation, like how do you map the human uh, arm and hand movements to the uh, robot arm and robot hands? How to ensure you have a good visibility in the workspace, even though you might have the arm and the hands in the middle? Um, but like what I'm going to talk about today is more like how tactile sensor can solve two other problems that are highlighted in pink here, providing users with tactile feedback, quite important. Um, and how do we, do we apply the desired force uh, during manipulation? So regarding haptic feedback, we have two devices, the um, shadow gloves, where basically it's kind of lightweight. It doesn't come in a way of the human dexterity, but we don't have any haptic feedback. We've also integrated the haptic gloves, which um, are a bit bulkier, it might come in a way of the human dexterity. However, it provides amazing haptic feedback. Um, the only, I mean, downside, yes, no, it requires like a sensor on the robot's hands so we can like understand what happens at the, uh, when the robot interacts with objects. So that's why we like have our hands with two kinds of sensors. So the biotax uh, and the PSCs, which are our old attempt at uh, tactile sensing. And by using these sensors, we realized that they were kind of a wish list that I think we all have kind of the same. Um, for the fingertip to be soft and deformable, anthropomorphic somehow, uh, because when, we do, when the operator, at least in the operation, does a pinch grasp, like for instance, the bio attacks with a curved shape were a bit difficult for us to grasp the object. Uh, we want to be able to localize where the conduct happens, because even on automation, we might want to do some adaptive grasping. Uh, the data to be repeatable, to have low recovery time, to have a nice sense of range between 0 and 30 Newton, because we might like interact with objects, not just like fine touches, and the sensor to be durable. We don't want to change the sensor every two days. So that's why we had a, we tried to do this with our latest uh, Titan sensor. So as you can see here, it's like the size of my finger. I have a demo kit, so I can show it right after the, the talk. It's made of 17 taxels, so sensing units. Each one provides local X, Y, and Z magnetic induction uh, information. So plus the internal temperature at 17 points, we have a total of 68 streams of data, 12-bit data coming at one kilohertz. So it's a lot of data and it's like a quite a high sampling rate. So it's not vision-based, sorry. Um, we are, it's designed to be replaceable, meaning that you can unplug and plug. There's no like external boards, there's no like amplifiers. It's like all embedded and it communicates through like a standard SPI protocol with a six pin cable. Regarding the sensing properties, so uh, I really appreciated Roberto's talk, uh, and I have like one something, a uh, little something afterwards about that. Uh, we really wanted to have a spec sheet of a tactile sensor, not just like, hey, there's a new tactile sensor. Like we want people to understand like what it can do, what it can't do. Uh, so we focused a lot on hardware, more like on the task because it's still new, it's still like a prototype. Um, and so we have like, uh, uh, we can capture like, uh, Sorry, with the current design, we can capture a lot of different things. So the direction of shear forces, I mean, I have a small video that uh, will show that. So we can distinguish in the data between like a shear force applied like this direction of this direction or even twisting motion. Um, we can capture force between 0.2 to at least 20 Newton. I'm saying at least 20 Newton because we can't reliably put a number on the date uh, on the force that we apply when it saturates. We don't have this device yet in the office. Um, and we're able to capture very brief and short-lived information. So for instance, when the switch clicked when we like apply a certain force or like we just uh, bump into onto an edge. And so from this discrete number of, sens uh, of sensors, we managed to have a fully centralized sensitive surface. You have no dead zones. I tried with a quarter mil probe over a million points 
and everywhere you get a data response. So that really gives you a lot of information about where uh, things happen. The, uh, about repeatability, this is like what's uh, an example of one of the stream of data. So we poked the, the, the sensor with like a probe 10 times, 10 Newton, same approach vector. And you see like on the peak data over there, we have like a change of two units. So right now it's a tactile sensor, not a force, so it's not matched to any force yet. And it's this like two offsets corresponds to half the noise range. So it's like quite interesting because this means that the generalization that any AI plugged into this uh, sensor might not need to have to cope with. Um, so it's, I'm gonna start with this video here. So it's somehow soft, at least like this version, we iterated a bit on the prototypes. So it's nice to have some uh, a sort of compliance with the objects we interact with. And I know that some of you might have thought like, okay, it's magnetic, I can't choose them close to iron and these kind of things. And you're partially right. And um, so we, in hardware wise, we kind of shielded somehow the magnetic fields inside, which means that um, you can play with uh, aluminum, easy, light uh, stainless steel as well. You won't have any shift in the data. However, from mild and strong steel, so here you have an example with a C250 steel, you'll just get a consistent, let's say, offset in the data. So here I'm approaching, and you see like the data, the green stream gets down and down and down. This is a row and filter data. But then as soon as I start touching, I get the usual behavior as if I was touching wood or plastic. So the data doesn't become erratic. You just like have a kind of offset that might be accounted for with like an AI or by zeroing the data if you have a context about what you're grasping. Um, same thing with the demo, I have like a bit of uh, a magnet and what it, how it impacts the sensor. So we're not super happy about that. That's why we're still iterating on a, on a design. Um, but what we already did is applying this to different shapes in different uh, projects. We can play with the size of the sensor. We can make them smaller, bigger. We can make them more curved, less curved. So it's kind of nice because we also iterate on the, on the shape that we really need for our robot hands. And as you can see in the middle here, uh, maybe some of you saw it at, at our booth, we finally integrate five of them to our hands. So it means that like without any more cables, you have 255 streams of data coming at one kilohertz. So it really helps understanding what happens at the fingertip of the robot. And like a kind of intuitive next step would be to embed the same technology inside the palm. So this is a palm flash that you can see here, because like one of the issues with our robot hand was like the objects were kind of like slipping in the palm. And I mean, some of uh, the previous talks covered this, we want to know how things happen like on the whole hand, not just fingertip level, especially in, for in hand manipulation. So about the future applications, as I previously said, still a prototype and it's a raw tactile sensor. We don't map force, 3D force contacts. Um, so obviously we want to have a 3D force sensor. We would be able to say like, okay, this force is applied in this direction and in here. And um, that would allow us to have fingertip force control. That's like my personal dream to have like a robot able to always apply the same amount of force at its hours while screwing something, while wrenching, uh, to provide haptic feedback as well to the user for inter uh, interoperation, grass adaptation, early contact detection. And there's something that we've been working on for the last few, let's say last months, is a sensor simulation. It would, we would like really enjoy having this uh, Tata sensor that we'd be able to simulate. Um, Mujoko, Omniverse, uh, potentially by bullet. Um, so that like every policy learned in RL in simulation might be then deployed on the robots without having too much of a gap in the like tactile sensing. Uh, so before concluding, uh, and I would like just to convey the fact that we're always open to like feedback about like tactile sensing. Um, what do people want? It's sometimes a bit difficult to understand. Is it like high resolution and um, high resolution uh, and low durability, that's like okay or not. Um, so yeah, if you have like any specific requirements, come talk to us either like during the events or via email. And there's something we've been working on internally is about like characterizing the sensor. And so that comes like, that joins what uh, Roberto was talking about just before. Uh, could we like have something all together as a community so we can like benchmark it? And it's not like just about saying like, oh, I'm better. It's just like saying, oh, that's what I need for my task. And then like, then there's all the um, questions about also the shape and everything, but like, yeah, that's, that might be like a part of the benchmark.
Uh, again, if you want to see the sensor in action, just come talk to me right after the talk, and I'm more than happy to like, give you a small demo. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm a technical guy, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like a I think it depends like if you're part of projects and like these kind of things. But yeah, if you want to know more, just ask and that's a robot. Does it come standard with your tactile section? Yeah. Uh like as soon as we finish like iterating on the uh, on the um, like design and everything, like it will come for the same price with the hand. That I can tell. Rather than paying another fifty thousand for a biofact sensor, she's sitting the the cake. More questions? Again, um, so we um, we can do some demos now. Like you see, you've got you've got sure, yeah some everything's over there. Yeah. Here. So um, Chan said it's a bit of from his sense of the jumps in here that you can do a demo as well. Yeah, so we'll have the, we'll have um, do the sensors here in this room. So if you want to come along and have a look at them, um, you know, come in and we'll be here. And also, if you've got sensors of your own as well, yes, that you want to show now, so we can just all lock in and show each other the sensors. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. See you after brilliant. Uh, now, welcome back and welcome to our fourth session for this 20, uh, 2023 VTAC workshop where we work, focus on uh, bridging worldview and real visual tactile perception. And for these sessions, we are, we are going to have a small session, but we are particularly will focus on the challenges and outlook for the bridging the simulated and real world tactile sensors and tactile sensing for robots. Okay. So as the beginning of this uh, sessions, I uh, uh, please allow myself to spend a little bit of time to uh, talk about uh, some experience from our own lab about like uh, using and developing tactile simulators and what we think are the ma major challenges we look uh, we face and what we uh, what we think are the good way to go in the future. So. Uh, before we started all the work in the lab of uh, simulating a tactile sensor, so we started to ask first uh, the question at the beginning, uh, what is a tactile sensor and uh, how does it work? So if we want to find a very high level summarization of all the tactile sensors, uh, their goal is to convert the physical contact information into electro uh, electronic signals uh, that can be uh, read, uh, read by the circuit and finally uh, uh, finally got by the robots. So the robots can react, uh, react to it and decide what to do based on the tactile reading. So then we probably want to think more about what does it mean by each link here, especially what is a physical contact. Of course, we know that contact is something so complicated that it's even bothering. But a simpler way we can think about that, especially if we're thinking about like the simply, very simplified simulations, one way to define the physical contact is, uh, is to define them as an intersecting of geometry. So in other words, I'm using this very simple and kind of exaggerated models of two objects, a cylinder and a sphere. So where it's uh, very similar in the way like most of the simulation engine model the objects. So usually they're good, like they're not, uh, they're working, uh, uh, they're living by their own in the simulation world, but occasionally they will interact with each other and there might be some uh, uh, intersection between them. And this intersection geometry, to some extent, if we think this is simulated robotics world, we may consider that as the, uh, as the area of contact. So in other words, if we are using this kind of simplified language in simulations, so we may redefine this problem of the working process of a tactile sensor as uh, uh, transferring the geometry interactions of two objects, uh, bracket, one is the sensor, one is the exact external objects the sensor is touching. And finally, we want to com uh, convert that into a, a tactile signal distributions over the area. 
So based on this principle, actually, uh, many years ago, uh, I would date back to 2010, there, there has been a pretty neat work on simulating a tactile sensor race reading. So the sensor itself is a pretty standard, it's an 8 by 6 capacitive tactile array sensing. Uh, I guess everyone knows like how the, uh, in the room knows how the sensor works. And those people, uh, those people from John Hopkins University follows exactly this definition or simplified definition of sensors working principle. So firstly, they use a virtual camera in simulation to get the intersection of two geometries, uh, the intersection geometry of two objects. And in order to scale that to the tactile signals, they, they believe that the transfer function is something very similar to a uh, spatial kernel uh, following a Gaussian distribution. So they just uh, convolute this uh, intersection geometry with this uh, Gaussian kernel and get a reading from the simulation, uh, get a reading to assume what is the output of the sensor in the simulation environment. And here shows an example of the results. You can see that it works amazingly well for a simple method like this. Uh, but however, like it's, a, it's very good for the first step, yeah, but it's not perfect. No sensors are per now perfect. They're always everything, something that bothers us and bothers us probably too much. That we is something like called nonlinear process. And to some extent, it's too much nonlinear that we consider them like even similar to a noise. So where does this nonlinear process comes from? So we can look closer to how the sensor works. So for uh, for not all the tactile sensor, but for all the tactile sensor I'm aware of, their working principle is that they convert the physical contact or the force interactions into a deformation of a sensing medium. This sensing medium is typically something like soft and deformable. It could be a piece of elastomer, could be some fabrics, could be some foam, or even a uh, tube, uh, even like air or water, but it's something that can be formed uh, in reaction to this contact of force. And then there are some electronic parts that can trans uh, that can measure the deformation of this de of this medium. So in other words, the con physical contact or the contact force is always measured in, a, in, in an indirect ways. So there's no sensor measure the contact force directly, but it's always like firstly it turns into the deformation of something, and then the electronic parts measure the dis uh, deformation. So I will consider the first part is a mechanical process, where is the physical contact transfer, uh, transfer to the deformation of this sensing medium. And the second part is the transducer part, electronic transducer part, where the deformation of the medium is trans, uh, transduced to this electronic signal. And each of them were, and the two process mostly works independently. And each of them would introduce some noise by themselves. So the question is that how can we model each of them? So the, the, the first part of mechanical process is super, uh, it's typically super complicated, especially if we are dealing with some of the sensors with large areas of uh, deformation, uh, uh, deformable areas, or even complicated shapes. And almost uh, the uh, probably the only solution to get a good good answer to this is to use finite element. So, but the challenge of finite element is always so uh, they are always so slow. Uh, this is actually a pretty, uh, pretty very very nice work from Nvidia a few years ago uh, to simulate the. Uh, uh, to simulate the biotech sensor where we know that it hit two parts of this uh, complicated plus complicated. So they, they decide that the finite element is the only solution, but they spend much effort to uh, much more effort since uh, optimizing the finite element uh, software to make sure everything works uh, faster while you know, uh, the error is acceptable so they can get a um, better estimation of the deformation of this sensing medium. So the second step, the transducers, to some extent, is much uh, to some extent is much simpler. So everyone knows how the resistor the resistor work, how capacitive works. Everyone can knows their working equations from your high school physics. So we just need to model them. Where like we can use a physical based method, like model these resistors, uh, capacitors, or even magnets directly out of their definition or using their models. Or we can use a data driven methods where we want to we want to just forget about everything and model all the noises. But still, like the nonlinear process comes from both to both parts. And they have different noise model, and they have different type of uncertainties and non-repeatabilities, and they may go over and interact with each other. So the question is always that, like, how can we effectively deal with those nonlinear process?
Okay, I don't have a good answer, but I can talk about some of our experience simulating the tactile sensor gel side in our lab. So we tried different approaches uh, to address this challenge, and today I'm going to talk about like uh, kind of the simplest but yet very, very effective method we developed. It's a tactile simulator called TechSim, which uses example-based methods to generate uh, the, the gel side reading based on a very small data set. So compared to like a, a uh, most of the data driven method which requests a very large data set. This method requests only a small data set, a very uh, straightforward, very simple, uh, simple model. So that means like everything works very fast and very easy to calibrate to different sensors. So we try to model the two parts of the gel set sensor, which includes both the color change, which measures the geometry of the objects, and the marker's motion, as shown in these pictures, which indicates like uh, the force and the torque, especially the shear force and the plane torque. So how does this work? So this is uh, shows the model we use to calibrate the sensor response on the geometry side. So it's a very straightforward polynomial functions, which it takes in the input as the uh, takes in the input of the contact location and surface normal of each pixels. And the only parameters here are six of them, like A, B, C, D, E, F, the coefficients in this uh, second the second order polynomial function. And to get these coefficients to calibrate this model, we collect a small set of examples like this, where we have balls pressed on different locations, give us perfect, uh, perfect demonstration about like what is the corresponding color response to the surface normal at each particular point. But this method will yet works pretty effectively. And here shows the examples about the comparison of the simulated readings with the real world, real census readings. So you can see that it's pretty similar. And also the speed is very fast since the model is very straightforward. Also, it works pretty well for the rich geometries, uh, for, for the rich textures on the surface geometry, because the model is very, uh, very straightforward. It assumes like the only things it cares about is surface normal and kind of location. So as far as you know, the surface normal, it works robustly on the entire surface. So another thing is about sort of about measuring, uh, modeling the motion of the markers, which turns out to be like more complicated because now we need to deal with the physics much more. So what is the physics of this uh, of this sensor? So the most challenging part for us is this uh, uh, soft elastomer on the surface. So if you guys have deal with this or look very closely about what's the deformation of this soft elastomer is like at all the time, you can notice that like it doesn't always uh, deform exactly as the external geometry, but it has this smooth out uh, geometry. And also this, there's also some expansions from the, um, from, the contact, uh, from the contact point to the side where it's actually, although there's no intended shear force, but it has some patterns like a shear force. So uh, it's very hard to do so this, but like we want to find a simple solution. So we approximate this with a, a simplified model using superposition method. So in other words, we redefine this kind of deformation as active deformation, which is caused by the contact of the objects or the shear force or the torque. And the other one is a passive deformation. That means like it's not caused by the external object, but it's caused by the deformation of the other points and some internal mechanism of the soft elastomer itself. So we assume like this elastomer is uh, very naive, it's just like a linear, uh, has a linear performance over the entire surface. So we just uh, we can rewrite this uh, deformation of each uh, each single point in the form like this. So it's uh, just a linear comp linear response of the sum of the uh, passive deformation caused by all the active deformation part. So I'm going to skip the details here. I, I I encourage you to check our papers to read the sort of this physics parts. It's lots of fun, and uh, uh, but. Then it turns out to the question about how can we calibrate this coefficient to map this uh, passive deformation from the active deformation. So again, we use the example method to get this. So we try to sample a bunch of points in finite element method. Oh, yeah, we did go through that, but it's only once to, for the sampling. And once that, we can get this like uh, straightforward tensor out of the uh, to model the deformation of the elastomer, and then it's solved. So here shows the results of a motion of the markers. So you can see that the simulation is very close to the real world. It's not actually, it's not expert, it's not a perfect match. If you take a ruler on the screen to measure their length of each marker, it doesn't match exactly, but still like it works pretty well overall and especially can give us an idea of an overall trend of the motion. 
okay, now we have this nice simulator. Let me ask a question about like, how can we use the simulator, use the simulated sensor for robot task? So we start with a very simple uh, or very basic robot manipulation task, grasping, where we want to use a tactile feedback to tell the robots whether this is a successful grasp or not successful grasp. So this has been done like pretty uh, broadly in the past. People have been using model-based methods or using learning-based methods a lot. And the big, uh, big, uh, big uh, challenge for using learning-based method is that uh, collecting data is a big pain. So now we're trying to do things in simulation first, collecting lots of data, see simulation, train the network and convert and transfer that to the real, uh, real world robots. And the good thing is that we have this very nice uh, simulator. So the, re the, uh, the reading from the simulated sensor is very close to the real sensor. So that made our life much, much easier. So you can see that the top examples here are the readings from the simulated sensor and the bottom one is the real sensors. So we simply collect those data in the sort of simulation world and then get a, uh, and train the network and then transfer to the real robot with zero shot. And it actually works pretty well. So uh, here shows the results, lots of numbers here, but if we look uh, in, uh, look only into the, these highlighted lines, that means like if we transfer, uh, we do this test of uh, grass predictions with only the uh, in simulation environment, it can get a prediction correctness of 100%. But if we do the zero shot system to reels, it can get a successful rate around 90%. Of course, that's only the story behind the scene. After the scene, we spend lots of time on the booth on seemingly very tiny problems. So the thing that bothers us the most is the uh, the gap between the simulation world and physics physics in the real world, which is mostly caused by this uh, uh, on the physics part. So, for example, the first thing we need to deal with is from the input of the sensor. So our simulator, the taxon, actually take the geometry as the input. It's pretty standard as like the uh, basic definition of most of the simulator, everything is based on the geometry body. So we still, we also consider like the interaction as the uh, intersections of the two geometries is the input of the contact. However, in the real world, we don't know. We don't know the geometry because the elastomer itself is too complicated. And for with some, uh, with some physical engine, like the straightforward one, the pipeline we use, uh, it outputs the contact force. So we, we face this gap of mapping the force into the deformation of the geometry. So we find to, uh, we, uh, we try to solve, uh, address this by using a calibration process to get this force deformation function curve of the sensor ahead of time. So in simulation, once we input the time, input the force of the contacts, we will, uh, we will do a, like a, a onboard, uh, onboard calculation to calculate what is the deformation of the sensor. So the second challenge we run into is that the physics, uh, the physical interaction between the sensor and the objects. In other words, if we give, uh, we know where is the contact point, we know the uh, mass and distribution of the objects, we know the contact force. How can we know whether this is successful grasp or not successful grasp? Actually, the simulation engine and the real world have, may have totally different ideas. So uh, the simulation engine, the bullet uh, we are using actually uh, simulates the mechanical performance of the objects based on the fr friction coefficient. So I assume that it's, still, uh, it's a pretty straightforward column co co uh, co uh, co uh, co friction. But like, uh, uh, we don't know what it is because it is influenced by multiple factors. So to do this, we did a calibration of the real world experiments and the simulation experiment. We, we play with, with uh, we sample like different co friction coefficient and see which one has the closest the distribution of success versus failure in grass as the real world. And we will choose that number as the one we are going to use. Okay, so that is our uh, our stories about like experiencing, uh, exploring how to develop a simulator and how to use it, and when does it work well, when does it not work well. So still, like we talk about, like there's a challenges. We know that the nonlinear process is always about us a lot, especially if we consider the physical interaction and even consider the non uh, very complicated nonlinear physical physical uh, interaction between the rigid objects, soft objects, and soft objects, and soft objects. So we believe that is uh, the major cause of the most of the uh, of the noise and the uh, the gap between the real real world and the simulation. So there might be different ways to address it, such as like we can use data driven methods 
us to make our system get used to all those uncertainties, all those noise, or we can spend more efforts trying to get a better understanding about what is happening on the physical level and get a good modeling of this. So I believe there have been like efforts towards all the, both of them, and there's progress, and there might be different answers. But for this session, let's let's welcome our speaker, Professor Dieter Fox from University of Washington and NVIDIA. So he has been leading an excellent group at NVIDIA studying uh, how to build a good physical based engines for uh, for years, and they did a great work uh, in simulating like the entire uh, physical world for robot and simulating uh, the micro interaction. Uh, and the, the local interaction between the physical world and the deformable sensors at the fingertips. And let's welcome him and listen to, listen to his comments about like what are this gap and how can we get a better understanding in this contact reach uh, for those contact reach tasks. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just want to give kind of an overview of some of the work that we've done, especially in the context of this uh, contact rich uh, task simulation and also now moving towards uh, sim to real in, in that domain. And uh, as you can see here, what we'd like to do is uh, train robots to perform these kind of tight insertion kind of tasks that are important for industrial settings. Um, and of course, this only really makes sense if we can then transfer it to the real world. Uh, and the work is mostly based on kind of two papers. Some of you might have seen that the first one was on RSS last year, the, the factory work. And then this year we have an RSS paper coming up uh, that's called industrial. Um, all right. So as we know, industrial assembly is actually uh, very, very tricky because it requires these kind of uh, interactions that uh, have just very tight margins of errors, right? You need to be very precise to, to perform them. And um, there are various benchmarks out there that people can use. So NIST came up with this benchmark board. This is actually not even the most recent and the most complicated one, but this is kind of the basic one for these insertion tasks. And it turns out that uh, most, most researchers actually, or everybody I'm aware of, uh, try to solve these also through um, training or teaching in the real world. And the reason for that is that it was virtually impossible just to simulate them at the accuracy that is required so that you can actually run that in a simulator and get a reasonably um, physically realistic results out of them. Uh, and I was also totally naive about that. I thought that can't be hard because you have these well-specified rigid objects, right? And, and, and it should be very easy to simulate that. And at the time, actually, this was kind of the state of the art that was out there where um, there was a paper by Ferguson Allen and, and before that also on PyBullet, where um, this is a simulation of kind of threading a nut onto a bolt. And it turns out it's you, you need very accurate assets and models for these assets. And then what you need to compute is all these kind of um, contact surfaces between them, right? So that, for example, uh, that out of the fact that you're applying some torque to the screw, that out of that comes this kind of motion. And um, the, the best simulation was this kind of here that took, uh, let's say 350 times longer than real time, which means to simulate one second of that operation takes 350 seconds in simulation. And of course that kind of beats the purpose from our perspective, because you wanna be faster in simulation so that you can train policies and things like that. And you can parallelize that. So back then we then worked with actually the, the physics team that, that really develops these fast simulators and uh, worked with them on speeding that up. And the key trick was what they introduced is um, these STF collision checking into the physics simulation where in this case, for example, you simulate uh, the bolt uh, through a sign distance field, like a voxelized representation, 3D voxel, super fine grained, of course, 3D voxel. And uh, the nut itself is um, just a mesh. And with this representation, then you can, at every step of your simulator, you can then very, very quickly compute <laughs> the contacts between the mesh and, um, and the bolt using these STF values. So for example, we can then compute, for example, within a, less than a millisecond, we can compute 16,000 context between the nut and the bolt, just looking up in parallel, of course, all these um, all these STF values. 
And you also get, of course, the normals of these forces. And then usually you would now try to solve all of these and you, you can actually do it, but that is not uh, very fast. So the next trick we then applied is this notion that you can actually kind of cluster those, um, those force vectors and contact vectors where you cluster them by um, kind of a proximity in space and also take the normals into account. And now we only have to deal with about like 300 contacts. And uh, with this um, reduction now, we can really solve all the, the forces and the physics uh, very, very fast. So the idea is that at every step of that simulator, now, if you do uh, one time step forward, then you go back again, you first compute all the, the full contacts, then you reduce them, and then you solve it for the, for the physics, the resulting forces. And with that, we are now able to do a thousand nut and bolts in parallel in real time. Okay, just kind of, this is orders of magnitude faster than what was possible beforehand, because again, beforehand it was a single one, 350 times slower than real time, and now we can do a thousand in real time. Now, the nice thing is that we can start looking into training policies for that. And um, that was kind of the, the status that we were able to do um, at RSS last year. Um, it turns out that that is actually also already kind of a test for how consistent the physics simulation is, because as you know, if you train uh, an RL policy on that, it would kind of immediately take advantage of any inconsistency in your physics simulation. So the fact that policies for that indicates that it was actually pretty good. Uh, we also had some results that the forces that come out of this kind of um, correspond reasonably closely actually to forces in, that you would measure in the real world. So now we moved on to the notion of, okay, because the main purpose of all of this is of course that we wanna do it in the real world, right? We wanna train in simulation uh, such that we can then apply it in the real world. This is now the um, upcoming RSS paper, uh, industrial, where again, the idea is, oh, oh, sorry, uh, training and then showing that it transfers to the real world. There are several, again, several kind of tricks we had to play in order to, to make that transfer pretty well. I just wanna give you a kind of a quick idea of, of some of that. The first one is actually, uh, the first task is, uh, the key thing is you first need to figure out where the assets are, but for that we're actually using, in this case, just a mask RCNN uh, to, to set the assets. And then the next step is you need to like, learn to pick up one of these. And then there's another step that would then be the transportation where you, place it close to the um, insertion point. And then finally, you wanna have an insertion policy. So typically we train actually uh, three separate policies with different rewards for those, um, but then you can also combine them into a single one. Um, one trick was that uh, pretty interesting is that uh, during reinforcement learning, so I'll tell you on the next slide what the reward structure looks like, but the interesting piece is that we know that these simulators are not perfect, which means if, for example, the robot applies very strong forces or things like that, then it can ha just happen that the objects actually interpenetrate, which means actually the physics simulation is not uh, perfect. And what we're doing is uh, during training, when we do the rollouts, we actually compute based on the rollout, we can quickly also check um, which kind of interpenetration did we see in that rollout. And if there's too much interpenetration, then we just discard that rollout. And the other ones, we're actually weighing the reward that we're getting for that rollout. We weigh it by the interpenetration that we saw in that uh, rollout, okay? So the idea here is um, that was novel here is to say, we take kind of the veracity of the simulation into account for the reward structure itself um, that we're giving to the agent. And that greatly improved actually the robustness of the learning. And then the next step was then um, using again for the reward structure, rather than using, for example, the 60 pose of the asset as the target pose. The problem with those is always with symmetries and things like that, that that doesn't work well because you have these, for these round packs, you have this rotational symmetry or for squared packs, you have these different positions in which you can put it in. So what we're doing here again is using the sign distance field in order to define a dense reward for them where we say, we compute for the, the pack that we wanna insert, we compute for I think a thousand points on it. We compute the 
the SDF value with respect to the to the hole we want to insert it right at the end we compute kind of the 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 SDF values for these thousand points on the on the pack and then compare it during the rollout to get the reward we compare the SDF values that we compute in the rollout itself to those okay and thereby for example you get exactly the same reward independent of the orientation of the object right but you still get this nice notion of the closer you get the better it is okay and then finally um then there's some kind of curriculum that also improved the learning quite a bit uh, where the idea is instead of training it for example to say replace for the insertion policy right you want to insert it into into this hole um, you could just say we initialize the object up here and, and give it a reward once it's all the way down there um that is actually very unstable and doesn't work very well. So one thing you could do is, for example, we actually initially, we, you could say we start the pack already partially inserted. And during training, we remove it further and further. And at some point, we move it out of the hole even. Um, that also didn't work very well because this transition from being inserted slightly and being outside of the hole it's just there's a big transition and, and then the policy wouldn't actually uh, work well for that. And you can look at the details, of course, in the paper. So what we did in the end was here um, where we say we, we sampled the initial pose kind of from a mixture of poses where the peg is above the hole and poses that are already partially inserted and um, reduce this into this insertion depth further and further during training. And that actually worked a result in very uh, robust policies. Okay, so here's now uh, how it works in the real world. And again, for the detection, we just use off the shelf uh, detectors. Um, and in the policy training, of course, we are simulating some noise, of course, on the position estimation. And these are objects that the robot has not seen in training. Again, the main interesting aspect here that this is purely trained in simulation, right? We didn't do any fine tuning in the real world on that. And on the right side, here's the last one. How are we doing on time? Okay. Okay, now actually, none of this is relevant for this workshop, right? It's kind of vision and tactile. So, we're now going to tactile a little bit. Um, we don't, I don't have any, uh, this is very much ongoing work, uh, but of course, like that task, like screwing the nut on the ball, doing this just based on vision is, is, is very tricky and it's a, a pretty unforgiving task actually. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna play the one on the right one as well, where you will, on the left, you can see actually an example where it works. But you can imagine that placement has to be very, very precise, which means that actually we need to know the position of the nut inside the gripper very well. And on the right, so you can see if you get this a little bit wrong um, and it releases, then it just falls off, right? So that brings up, of course, the notion of if we have tactile sensing in the gripper itself, then hopefully we can estimate the position of the nut way better than uh, just based on, on external vision. And that should make the policy much more robust. So towards that, we also, we used to do a lot with the biotechs, but those are just very, very hard to simulate. And also the information you're getting from the biotech is uh, clearly not as readily useful as for example, from the gel sites. So big fans of gel sites. And you've seen several of these here already. Uh, here on the right side, we have now also a, a fast simulation for that. We can see on the upper right side, that's kind of the, the simulated output. And what we do here is actually, we simulate the surface of the sensor and the object both as rigid objects, but in the simulation, we let them slightly interpenetrate. We give kind of like a spring-like penalty term for those. And then we just measure the interpenetration depth in order to generate a depth image. So this is very much inspired by the Taxim work. Um, but uh, with this new implementation, we get also very nice speed ups on that. Um, so you can see up here, uh, the original text voice, that's at least what I heard from the numbers, was like, can be done at, let's say, seven, 10 frames a second. 
But now, for example, if we run 16 of those in parallel uh, on a GPU, we're getting almost a thousand frames a second. So that again is a, a really nice speed up in order to enable very fast training of that stuff, right? Let me just show you what this looks like. Here on the right side, you can see uh, the sensor response. So we have now very fast simulation also of the forces and the shear forces and everything uh, can be done now also in training in the loop during reinforcement learning. And uh, some first task we did was um, uh, seeing how we can use that for let's say this kind of simulation task here. And one question is of course, uh, how useful is the information at all? Uh, we, we can, render both, of course, camera images and the gel site simulated gel site images. And what we did here was um, we first train a policy using the state information, ground truth state information, and then we distill it um, using behavior cloning into a policy that uses only the observable tactile information. Okay, so again, in training, we have the uh, the privileged information of knowing the state of everything, right? But then we want to um, distill it into a policy that only leverages, for example, the post information you get from the manipulator and the tactile images. Okay, and here are some results we're getting. This is, uh, again, not published yet, but if, for example, you're using neither the risk camera nor the tactile feedback, we're getting then only 60% where the original, the state-based policy was above 90%. Um, but then when you add tactile information, you're going up to 90. And then using tactile and the risk camera data gives you another boost 94%. So that kind of shows that, of course, using this information can, of course, uh, I think really nicely improve the robustness of the system. Now, before you ask the ob obvious question that I will not be able to answer is, what is the number for camera only, risk, risk camera only, I, I don't have it. I will tell you that when I get that. Um, but, uh, but again, I think for these tasks, I believe uh, tactile information is gonna be very, very, uh, very useful, right? Because you're not gonna just get the visual position that you want, right? And the key trick is, uh, of course, the nice thing is that you're doing like fully closed loop control using that information at frame rate, right? Um, and we can do that now very, very fast. Um, wait, was there another comment here on that? Oh yeah, you can, so you can go two ways for training this, right? One is again, you train it, you do an RL policy like PPO, train it um, using the privileged information, then you do some distillation, where during distillation, we're not just doing pure behavior cloning, but you're also, for example, when you deviate from the rollouts, you take uh, feedback from the trained policy in order to give you it's like dagger style robustness. And another thing you can actually do is you do some asymmetric actor critic, where for the critic, you're using the full state information and the actor has only access to the um, touch sensing tactile feedback. And then you can train actually a policy that way as well. So there's two different ways of uh, which we're looking at this right now, okay? So with that, I wanna uh, finish. And I think we have now a pretty good, fast, accurate simulation for these contact-rich tasks. Uh, we're also getting good simulation for the visual tactile information. I, I strongly believe, of course, tactile information increases robustness with respect to the pose of the, the pack where it is within the gripper, for example. And uh, we, we haven't looked at the results, but clearly it should also speed up kind of just your policy executions. Um, Clearly, we should not only look at either visual or tactile, it should just both, you just feed both into your policy and they should learn how to use them at what time, right? I think that makes obviously a lot of sense. Um, uh, with the RSS work, we clearly showed that we can do the SIM to real transfer already. And uh, we're currently, right now, we're looking at showing also for the tactile sensing, the SIM to real transfer. So, so far we have good evidence on the simulation side that it improves robustness, but we haven't really closed the full loop to the real world. That's what we're doing kind of as I speak. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you for the work, for the clean, the action, right? Yes, and you're asking? 
the SDF yeah. is, is a neural it's, network polynomial or lookup table. Right? It, it's just a real explicit 3D, uh, 3D grid voxel representation. So it's not like a neural network or a nerf or something like that. It's really just a very fine grain. I don't know what the resolution is. You should okay. look it up in the paper, but it's like really fine grained voxelization, just what you would do in whatever good old Kinect Fusion kind of things. Okay, okay, thank you. Oh, thank you all for the great talk. I just have a question about using simulator for tactile uh, sensors to transfer to the real world. I mean, like we always do some approximation in the simulation to make the simulation fast and like uh, getting enough amount of data. What's like the intuition to have the simulate data good enough to be able to like provide, like, like what's like the key features we should have like in the simulator to be, make it possible transfer the real world? Uh -huh. If we only knew. Um... I think at this point, it's there's kind of some, it's like trial and error, right? You see, you try, you first try to model, as you said, you have these trade-offs. You try to model your sensor as well as you can. Also, given the, the limit, the constraints on, first of all, what physics simulation can even do, but also on your assets and the computational efforts you can spend on it. And yes. then um, you train your policies with enough randomization on those. and. And then hopefully it works in the real world. That's what we're okay, in the course of doing right now. So so it's hard to quantify that, right? It's just yeah. really uh, a little bit of black magic in there too, I must admit. Okay, thank you for the answer. Hi, uh, great talk. I have a question about like future tasks that like uh, your lab is interested in. So for, for the task you've shown today, like it's a combination of both vision and tactile. So I'm wondering like, are you also, are, are your lab also interested in like doing like pure uh, tactile based tasks? Like for, for example, human can do very complex manipulation without vision at all. And I think for this task, it might be the noise might be uh, even what might play an even larger uh, factor uh, because then like those tasks that require both vision and tactile. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I want to hear your thoughts about, yeah. about this. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say at this point, I would push more on these kind of tasks where you just have both sensor modalities, right? Because in many, many tasks, that's what you have access to. And, and um, I think we should just leverage whatever sensor information we have and put it in those policies. Um, doing the, the contact sensing only tasks, I, I think for that, maybe we are still a bit too impoverished on the tactile sensing in order to do, like, you know, the kind of tasks you grab, you go into your bag and try to find an object based on that. This academically may be really interesting, but I'm not sure whether we are there yet to say like, this is the most important thing we should work on yet. So basically you have doubts on the current tactile sensing hardware to achieve those tasks. <laughs> I'm sure we all agree there are limitations in the current sensing hardware and it's of course awesome stuff, right? Um, but at the level of what uh, where what we can do, right? We're clearly pretty far away from that. And um, uh, and the question is, can we actually get the the dense, for example, coverage of a full dexterous hand, robotic hand that that we need? I know Gordon does a lot of cool, cool stuff also on the on the full coverage. But I think um, it's just very difficult at this point. Thank you. Yeah, Hi. So in your experiments on the nut insertion task, were you using a parallel jaw gripper or a multi-finger hand? It was parallel jaw gripper. So could you comment on uh, the, I think to do de proper dexterous manipulation, one needs multi-finger hands, mm -hmm. right? So could you comment on the additional complexities and how close are we to being able to handle that in simulation? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one, yeah. Um, so this specific line of work we were pushing also because of the hopefully relevance for real industrial application domains. 
And I think in industry, as far as I know, at least, they are actually pretty far from even considering dexterous manipulation just because of the brittleness of, of, of those systems. Um, from a purely, let's say, academic and interest point of view, I think that's clearly a really interesting task doing this with multi-fingers, fingered hands, and um, it just makes it much more complex, everything, right? So we've done the dexterous manipulation you've seen, like the in-hand uh, object rotation kind of tasks, and, and, and those are um, getting into the, the work that Pulkit is also uh, pushing forward. Um, it adds another level of complexity on the hardware side and on the sensing side, um, but maybe some of these tasks, we could just actually investigate purely in simulation, right? Where we just say, let's assume we had hardware that actually had coverage all over, sensor coverage all over the hand and fingers, what could we do? How hard are tasks then, right? We could kind of these, what happens if someone comes up with the hardware solutions? So um, many interesting questions in that domain. Uh, we are not in this specific line of work, we're not really pushing for those, but um, uh, in the sim to real, like with the Allegro hand, uh, we're, we're still pursuing that as well. Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm aware that the Isaac simulator has a soft body simulating, uh, it can simulate soft bodies. Uh, is there a reason you, discarded the soft body simulation in the gel site simulation um, yes. by using the intersecting of the bodies instead? It's a very good reason for that, speed. <laughs> Is there any the accuracy? Form of, the form differences? of a simulation makes it just still way smaller, right? We had a paper actually here where um, we generate training data where we have deformable objects. And for example, you wanna, you wanna um, reason about contact forces and deformation forces on the object itself, um, but that is still actually very slow. And what we did there is we used that data to train a graph neural network that then can simulate those things much faster. But um, but I think typically, yeah, we're not we're not quite there yet where you can just say the formal object simulation can be done at that speed that we really want. Thank you. I want to come back very quickly to the previous discussion about to, to achieve true, you know, manipulation that is, uh, you know, sufficiently uh, sufficient for complicated tasks. Maybe we need dexterous hand. What about, and then you commenting on the fact that in the industry, they're pretty far to, from considering that uh, parallel grippers are ubiquitous. What about considering mobile manipulation with fairly standard arms, fairly standard parallel grippers, but in effect, you have four fingers. If you just have two grippers, you have six fingers. If you have three grippers and so on, right? Uh, how do you feel about this? direction and what are the limitations then you mean so, hands get, with no 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 i'm saying oh. getting the dexterity not via the dexterity in one hand but dexterity via multiple robots cooperating which each oh, of them yeah. has simple grippers and then you have robustness in hardware but you have potentially a lot of dexterity especially if you have a mobile platform okay yeah yeah i think um clearly moving all this stuff with on mobile manipulation is, is clearly, I think, a really interesting direction, right? We're actually pushing that we just have a new base where we have um, omnidirectional, the, the clear path uh, base, and then with a chef that can go up and down and two Kinova Gen 3 arms and stuff like that. So I think that's clearly interesting because it, it, it just obviously increases the workspace and the kind of things that your robot can do, right? And then if you have multiple of these and you have different kinds of grippers and different capabilities, combining them for joint tasks is a really interesting direction, I think. Okay, uh, I think we have uh, quite a few questions. Maybe we can continue in the, in the panel discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. so we can move to the panel discussion. Yeah, uh, let's thank the professor. Thank you. 
We can take the chair from the table over there. How is it? It's not attached. Okay. No, it's not. And I have two hands. <laughs> you even have time. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Sean, is that possible to turn the camera a little bit so the Zoom people can see the face of their, all the speakers? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I can call the technician. <laughs> okay, sounds like a non-trivial. Yeah. It's, it's a camera that can be moved, she's right. Where's the computer yeah. that's controlling it? We should ask for help. I don't know how to use it. Um, Okay. Let me have a try. on this uh, uh, put my hand so probably you want to deep blur your background Oh, cool. Oh, it, I think it works pretty reasonably. Let me continue. Okay, I have to turn it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, just some uh, uh, logistics. Um, I think we we have limited time, so probably we'll finish uh, around like uh, um, ten around six, and we can have a group photo here, um, like what we did in two thousand nineteen VTech workshop. Uh, so that with this is a hybrid uh, workshop, and it will be a good chance to have a group photo here. Um, and uh, I have put together these uh, QR codes, and you can post your questions there and also your thoughts there. Um, I can pick up this question there. Um, and also we have uh, uh, this hybrid uh, panel discussion. We have Winton and we have uh, uh, Ted online. So um, I want to make sure Winton and Ted can you know, speak and we can hear you. Yeah, the audio works perfectly for me. Okay, great. How about you, Ted? Can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. Okay. okay. Um, so I would like to start the um, panel discussion with uh, the, uh, you know, what we have seen today, this uh, initiative uh, by uh, Roberto uh, on this benchmarking, these challenges we, have, we are facing. 
maybe we can start with uh, the hardware. So you asked one question um, to all of us. Um, so what are the properties of a given touch sensing hardware? So maybe we can start from there. So and, uh, maybe you can share your views. Or that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was thinking today, like, you know, there's a bit of debate. So I don't want to be a contrarian, but, um, you know, there's kind of an implicit assumption here that, you know, one sense is kind of better than another at doing the task. I'm just wondering if we're getting to the point in the field where actually, you know, a lot of these sensors would, would be capable of doing the control for, would be capable of providing the information for dexterous, inform, dexterous manipulation. It's just we don't know how to do the AI yet. So maybe we should concentrate more on doing the AI and solve it that way. Yeah. yeah, kind of similarly, like, is a hardware or is a bottleneck? So knowing where we are at is like quite important, but like really separating everything is also a challenge. And how we do this is something to, to really, I guess, think about. So, in my view, if I think 20 years down the line, I think that there will be one standardized hardware uh, that um, probably will be very different from the hardware that we have nowadays. I sort of imagine that it's going to be a mixture of different technologies that we have nowadays. And to me, one of the fundamental questions um, that I'm very interested in is, is what, we actually, what do we actually need? Yeah, because uh, we don't know what special resolution we need. We don't know what frequency we need. We don't know for which task different modes of the of the tactile experience are actually used for. And the only real real golden sort of reference that we have is the human hand. You know, we have numbers sort of from physiology, but. Fundamentally, I'm not so interested in, in knowing which technology we will use. I'm more interested in knowing what are the features that we need to have for being able to solve downstream tasks. Thank you. And thank you, Roberto, for getting us all to think about this question. What I want to throw out there is I want to treat all sensors the same. I don't care how you solve the problem. I want to have a room, a, a setup where you bring your sensor and it's hardware. And then I think there can be different software running on it. But for this instantiation, I want a thing that probes it. Maybe it's even just a human because humans are really damn good at things like this. And I have motion tracking and I have a, a touch sensitive tool that I can then probe your sensor. And through my ground truth, I then find out how big your sensor is, where it can feel, what it can feel. I can basically apply all kinds of tactile, maybe even temperature. I can basically put it through experiments and your the, the sensor hardware job, the people who created that physical hardware and the software behind it is supposed to be trying to perceive and and report. This is still passive touch. It's not even moving. It's just a sensor sitting there. And uh, but I want to get out of it. Like, how big is it? And where is it sensitive and where is it not? And how fast is it giving me data? And what does it measure? And is that even like, how does that correspond to what I can what I'm feeling on my side when I'm probing the sensor? But I can I can't even really think past this very low maybe this is a mix what i just said is a mix between the hardware and the perception um because i don't even know if we talk about what's the raw data i don't even know my raw data is totally different from your raw data is totally different from your raw data so i don't even think we can discuss at that very low level i think it has to go up to like positions in the world and contact forces that's my my first thought dita what do you think i don't know yet I, i'm uh i i I agree totally that, of course, there's on the one hand side the effort we need to benchmark these sensors, right? And that's uh, not easy, as we, as we all know. We we put a lot of work, for example, in the when we got the biotech in trying to get ground truth data for it in order to kind of train a simulator, and uh, it's 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 a lot of work. And now, if you want to compare different sensors, um, at the same time, we also want to, of course, benchmark the algorithms and representations that leverage those sensors. And I think. Again, we shouldn't think about there's a visual sensor and then there's a tactile sensor. These policies should just be 
trained such that in a closed loop form, they just ingest all this information that comes in and take advantage of that, right? And um, as you saw, I, I, I believe it's simulation is gonna be an important tool for that just because you can scale things, you can compare things and you can then do also, yeah, very large scale training uh, because right now, when when we did also this first tactile sensing work, um, it's I always thought like picking. We were able to pick up objects with grippers that didn't have tactile sensing, and then when people started working on like oh, and now we do it with our tactile sensor, the whole system actually got less robust, right? And it feels like um, it's it's not this notion of if you put a tactile sensor on your robot, suddenly everything gets better. It's just this the additional hardware brittleness that gets introduced for those. So it's still not an I would say an out of the box experience. And where we want to go, of course, is I think that actually every gripper should have tactile information in it, right? And there should be algorithms coming with it also as well that can take advantage of that, right? So that um, not everybody has to kind of train their own models for those again, right? That we can share them across the community. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, um, Tad and Wenzhen, so can you please share your views as well? Well, um, can I talk? Uh, I, I think, you know, tactile sensing, we're interested in tactile sensing uh, because it's part of a task. I, I mean, you can have, um, if you have an ATI sensor, an ATI sensor is, uh, you, you can specify its, its properties because it's not designed to do anything other than make measurements of, you know, force and torque. Um, but a, uh, a tactile sensor is designed to be used actively uh, as part of a robotic task, usually. And that means that all kinds of things are important. Um, obviously, the, um, the software driving the robot is very important, but also the physical form, how, how it fits in with the task uh, is important. So um, it, I think it's very difficult at this point to uh, say whether one sensor is better than another sensor um, because uh, you really have to talk about that with respect to a task. And uh, it, it's a little disturbing to think that right now, um, well, in industry, there aren't any tasks for which uh, people tend to use tactile sensors. It's all very academic and um, I think that's one of the things that the uh, tactile community has to confront is uh, uh, it's great fun for us to think about the future. Someday we'll have great dexterous hands that can do all kinds of stuff and we can show you demos to get you excited. But if you ask, uh, you know, what, what can someone in industry do with your tactile sensor today that's actually useful? The answer is not much. So I think we, um, we need to move beyond that, that state. And maybe uh, and hearing uh, Dieter's talk just reminded me how far we are from, from that. And hopefully people in industry can give us some hints about where we should be aiming. Uh, I could only echo on Roberto and Catherine's ideas. Like on one hand, I know that people are struggling to have some standardized sensor, like everyone have no struggling about like how it works or what's the its properties because it's so well known. And on the other hand, like we want to have some way to benchmark it. Uh, but on the, uh, I also uh, totally agree on test point. Like it highly depends on the task itself. And if we look at what we haven't seen in the future, like uh, future five years, 10 years, or if we go further, probably 50 years or even longer, I think the definition of the task we want the robots to do will evolve. And even the robots themselves will evolve. So I don't think like we should stick to a single answer at this moment or at some moment. Uh, I don't know, the, I myself also don't know the final answer to this, but I believe like um, a very good way towards uh, to explore towards this direction is to explore things in simulation. So in order, uh, 
uh, other than like having this real physical sensor that is pretty standardized, everyone can uh, can use. I, I think like a better way to think about this is to have the standardized sensors in simulation. In other words, I, I think if we can find the standard, standardized way to model or describe like a bunch of different tactile sensors, and we experiment with them in simulations, and then we can evaluate their performance uh, for different tasks. So that will give us a better understanding about like uh, how does those like definitely the modeling or parameters of the sensors will will relate it to the performance of the robot task. So I have uh, I have been um, very lucky to work with the Jawsai sensor for many years. Everyone think that they want to use Jawsai because it has so high resolution. But I was always thinking about like do we need that high resolution? If we reduce the set resolution for like uh, twice or four times or even ten times or hundred of times, would that still work? I think simulation will provide us a good uh, good answer. So if we can uh, have a way to like standardize this process of modeling the sensor, modeling a bunch of different sensors, and uh, and connect that to like different tasks at this point and in the, uh, the tasks in the future, that will give us more insight about what is really a good, uh, good sensor to choose and what, what, is, uh, what are some good direction to develop in the tactile sensors. Yep, um, thank you for all the discussions. And uh, I think it's still um, like tactile hardware is still an uh, open question and probably we need to define uh, what features we want to get out of uh, uh, tactile sensors um, and there's one uh, question of, uh, from from the dog um, online uh, so any comments on the physical robustness of optical tactile sensors how to ensure visual tactile sensors can endure uh, industrial settings without any model um, uh, model drift? I think it's quite uh, related to what uh, Ted um, highlighted, you know, in the industrial settings, we may have different uh, challenges. So Ted can please uh, comment on um, this question. Uh, sure. I mean, I've heard from people in industry, if you, if you ask them, um, how many touch cycles uh, do you want your robot uh, sensor, your, your touch sensor to, to do before you have to change it because it's worn out? And the answer is, I don't want to ever change it ever um they it's uh the whole point of uh, automation is to make is to make things go fast and to make them go by themselves and to not have anybody have to shut the whole thing down and and uh fix it uh so the the, uh, the durability and reliability is is of utmost importance in industry and the uh the sensors that we're building these days are uh you know our requirement is that it it run long enough that we should, we can get uh, a paper out of it. And if it breaks just at, at the very end of our uh, paper, it's okay as long as we get the publication done. But um, so the, I think there's a long way to go. And, and I think everybody, we and everybody is trying to learn how to build more robust sensors, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. And uh, I, think it, I think it deserves a lot of attention. Thank you, Ted. Um, uh, so anyone in the panel would like to comment on this question as well? Um, yeah. It might be quite hard to publish a paper saying your sense is more robust than another one. So it, it kind of seems to me more a kind of problem for a company or something to, to make sense more robust than the kind of academic question. because fundamentally it comes down to the materials and the fabrication methods that you you make your sensor out of and you know in academia we're under different constraints for how we do that um compared to 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 industry so i kind of see it as more of a kind of industrial thing and it's probably a solvable problem for most of the different sensors out of the out there again so again my view is a lot of the sensors out there are probably good enough for the tasks that we want want to use them for we just don't know how to how to get them to do it um, so as somebody who spent a lot of time um, about trying to improve robustness uh, digit is about three order of magnitude better than the formulation from gel sites originally um, there is a path i think 
working with uh, with new materials and and people from from other fields to actually improve still significantly the performance of uh, of vision based tactile sensors um just to give an example things even like tri uh, babo uh, you know they have really interesting materials they use things that can in theory withstand really a lot of work and i think there needs to be collaborations outside of the field with with other scientists but i can imagine that we will reach the point where these things are relatively uh, robust uh, of course there is a trade off also between robustness and and sensitivity uh, and uh, and you know some of the applications that industry wants to do maybe they don't need the same level of sensitivity that we need to do you know dexterous manipulation uh, or or something else yeah Yeah, I would totally agree. I think this is like the, the best answers I see in industry and I see in other community. I think a uh, uh, test company, the job setting has, been, uh, has done an excellent job for uh, developing the new sensor uh, sensor pad, which is much, much more robust uh, than the older version. So uh, we tried that in our lab. We, we really like it. So, and uh, we believe there's some, like, uh, probably some mysterious, excellent uh, material science, uh, science happening there. And I believe that if there's enough motivation from industry and there's enough like uh, support to the, uh, to the, on the engineering side, that won't be a major challenge. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, I do have, um, so personally, I also hold my own views. So um, if we think of our own fingers, so if we use our finger too much, so it will, uh, our skin will go out as well. Yeah, so we may not hold too much uh, expectation in artificial uh, skin. Um, so if we can make it cheap enough, uh, modular, replicable, so we can use um, the sensors and replace this skin after a certain time. So maybe it can um, be applicable to some industrial applications. So the next question I have got um, is related to uh, industrial applications. Uh, with the current state of tactile sensors and models trained on them, what applications in industry uh, related to robotic manipulation and grasping can be immediately addressed using tactile sensors? What is the scale of need, uh, of, the, of need request that you have met, have um, come across? So I think this is quite related to uh, um, Professor Fox's uh, talk. You know, you, you got this uh, motivation from the industry. If you can start. Yeah, I think in, in our work, we've been looking at these cases where just the, the vision information might not be precise enough for, for these um, tight margin kind of tasks. And that is where, of course, tactile sensing can really help you, especially not only for, let's say, trying to map the tactile image to a better 60 post estimate or something like that, but really using the raw data in these closed loop policies, I think is a good way to go. From some uh, interactions we got, like with the uh, shadow robot hands, usually like people are interested in uh, tactile sensing when just vision is not enough, as you said, but they want it to a level so robust that we don't have it yet. And that's also like a bit of, of a gap, like, oh yeah, tactile sensing should be able to solve that. Do you, are you aware of the problems with tactile sensing? And that's also like one way of breaking the system. Like the day you don't have the data sets of break because like they're not super durable yet. That's also like a failure point that they want to avoid. So it's like a, it's engineering. It's like a whole thing of trade-off and they have a system that they not very happy with, but that works and they don't want to break it more. So it's like kind of like the feedback we got quite a lot by working with industrial. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's very good, very good to know uh, the insights from the industry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, oh yeah, we we also take the questions from the from the floor. If you have questions, you can raise your hand. Yeah. I wasn't sure about your protocol. Okay. Okay. So if you have questions, you can raise your hand. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
you know. I mean, it, it seems to me that uh, tactile sensing has to go hand in hand, so to speak, with the development of hands. And uh, I mean, the two are very intimately coupled. So it's uh, it's sort of interesting. We didn't have too many people who focus on building hands in this in this room. Uh, and I'm trying to get a sense of uh, some speculative sense of how we can expect this field to progress. So an analogy might be with uh, legged locomotion. So in legged locomotion in the last 20, 30 years after the first demos, what happened was that there were a number of sort of hardware efforts, but not too many, right? Maybe like maximum of 10 or so, 10 on the order, that order. And then uh, the development of controllers. Uh, if, we, I, I mean, the hope should be that we don't take 20 years to, <laughs> to stabilize to that level of accomplishment in dexterous hands. And my conjecture is that because uh, of the development of machine learning techniques, which are really quite liberating in terms of the development of controllers, progress should be much faster. Uh, I mean, it will be rate bound by the developments in hardware and sensing, but the controller part could go much faster than it did in for the case of legged locomotion. But what's the opinion of this, uh, of the panel? <laughs> I, I agree that hopefully we will make uh, much faster progress. I think one problem is just that uh, most labs that have just manipulators with grippers without any touch sensing in them, right? And then these efforts that Roberto, for example, is leading, uh, that can have a big impact, right? That also we get to a price point and it's just easy to get them to get head, to get your hands onto some of those. Um, and then hopefully this will become much more popular. I hope this also comes maybe when we have better algorithms just for doing grasping per se, like picking up things, because when we have basic algorithms that work much better on the, let's say, the tactile without tactile feedback, then we will also be much better at starting to leverage that information, right? Because we have the base algorithm of where should I put my hand in the first place, right? Because if I haven't solved that problem, then the tactile information isn't going to help me so much. It only starts helping me when I actually have contact with the object, right? And I think um, with progress being made in all these different areas through a lot of, of course, the deep learning side, um, I think we should hopefully see a very good progress there. I agree. Um, well, I guess my, my lab is one of the few labs that, you know, we build robot anthropomorphic robot hands and we, um, you know, innovate in the tactile sensing hardware as well. And we do the AI. And that's kind of tough, you know, covering all those bases, uh, you know, when you're tucked away in Bristol, you know, rather than, you know, Stanford or somewhere like that. Um, so um, what, what my perspective is, I think in tactile sensing, we've seen a lot of advances over the last decade because, um, the field has kind of opened up where people are making their own sensors. So there's been kind of um, enabling technologies that allow people to innovate tactile sensors in their, in their own labs and then do research on that, you know, which we're seeing a lot of example of at this workshop. Um, I would like to see that happen with hands as well. I think, you know, there's a tendency now to kind of buy hands off the shelf, but you can't really innovate a commercial product. But if you can get to the point where people are routinely making the hands themselves, as people are now routinely making the tactile sensors, or even making the tactile hands as one piece, then I think that that could allow you know the field to you know to innovate a lot more. So that's why in, in my lab we you know we have a particular focus on using three D printing to make the tactile sensors, but that also ties in with using three D printing to build the robot hands as well because you've got you know, another technology that is also rapidly advancing, you know, that can be leveraged you know, to enable others to, to, you know, to build upon the work that, that you can start. So that, that's my perspective. But, but we'll see. You know, maybe there's a perfect robot hand that comes from shadow or something, and maybe we don't need to you know, innovate uh, hand design. I, I mean, there's also the cost as well. If you, if you use the 3D printing, you know, it is a reasonably cheap, technology to use so if you can make you know 
a tactile hand that's 3D printed for say under 500 quid, 500 pounds, you know, then, you know, that, that opens it up so that many labs in the world can then, you know, build those, investigate, improve on it, you know. Yeah, that's definitely a good idea. Um, then the question is like, what can these 500 pounds hands can do? It's like also like a, a whole question of like, yeah, of course, like price comes in the way, but like what can this do? And like to which extent, like we have to like put more cost and like the volume and like all these kind of things. I think that's like a, a reasonable assumption that like not everything can do. I mean, like not every single design, not every single material can do like whatever we want. So it's also like depends once again to the task, like where we want this robot to be applied. Uh, if it's for like purely research about like this control, we want to like solve some tasks, I guess. Okay, yeah, so we have talked a lot on the hardware and different tactile sensors, different tactile hands. Um, so there are some questions on data and also uh, like models. Uh, so there's a one question, um, different tactile sensors produce different raw data, but there are also difference between raw data from different units of the same sensor. So this issue affects the robustness of the tactile sensors. How can we fix it? I think probably is from you know the how to process the data and model um, part. Yeah. Um, machine learning. <laughs> I yeah. think uh, from, uh, from my answer, point yeah. of view, it's very clear that this is the way to go. Um, I can give an example of some of the experiments that we did earlier on in our passing tactile sensing uh, at Berkeley. We had this system that was basically learning how to grasp with a parallel gripper and vision-based tactile sensors. And um, we, we we actually had, uh, uh, we were using basically gels from, from, from gel sites from, from Wenzel and Ted. And these gels had, had markers. So, you know, we train a classifier that tell us whether we're in contact. Uh, and then after a, a couple of days, we, you know, the gel breaks. We, we changed it and now the markers were a little bit misaligned with how the data were before. And suddenly the classifier were not, was not able to, uh, you know, actually discriminate anymore. And we basically repeated this process for five, six gel. And at, after six gel, basically the model just learned how to ignore these things, was able to keep performance that were basically irrelevant of which particular gel we were using. And at that point, we decided, okay, let's look inside what the model is actually doing. And we basically discovered that the model was invariant to markers because it was basically learning how to cancel them out. Yeah. So it was intentionally ignoring markers as, as a feature because of its variability. And I think that, you know, this is something that could have in theory been engineered, but with machine learning, it's really so easy to remove the sources of variability that we should exploit this tool, yeah. Um, just, just maybe just like a little something like, maybe it could be part of the benchmark that you were proposing. Yeah. Like not having just one unit and saying like, oh, on this specific unit, because mm -hmm. like, I mean, all of us know you have manufacturing, I mean, sorry, manufacturing like variability, and this should also maybe be quantified, not once again as a comparison, but just like to know, like, okay, if I'm working with like, a, sensor that I need to replace, I need to account for a given variability that is quantified in a given way. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have, I have got some ideas on, on this as well. Uh, so in vision or in NLP, so they have coined this term uh, foundation model. Uh, so I have seen some recent works in tactile sensing, uh, also using uh, foundation models. If we can get such foundation models, and these uh, models can work for different types of tactile sensors or uh, different parts of your tactile sensors, that can be very useful uh, for processing uh, different data types. Yeah, um, I think we are approaching um, six very soon. So I will um, ask my own question. The very uh, first one. So this, uh, what directions or what topics? we haven't explored or that are um, and so still not widely explored in this field. Any topics on the directions? It's a very big question. <laughs> Put me on the spot. <laughs> um, directions that haven't been explored. 
Well, I mean, you know, there's lots of kind of directions that are kind of underutilized, I guess. Um, you know, you have a few fashions that come and go. There's probably your things back in the 80s or earlier that maybe, well, so I don't know, I, I, so embodied AI, you know, I don't think there's enough, too many people doing disembodied AI, you know, ground it in the real world. Um, embodied AI. I, I would go for late robotics, like something else we haven't, like on tactile sensing, if we put like on a spot mini, like under the knee, uh, under the feet, mm -hmm. we could like reversify the, the control of the kind of thing. So it's not for grasping manipulation, but maybe something where the technology could be deployed as well. And we could learn, I think, a lot from that as well. So we, we tried to put feet, uh, digit feet for robot. I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't get any results that motivates that so far. Uh, but I think it would be really cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, and g digits have this shape that is, you know, sort of hemispherical. So we could just put four digits together and and make a fit. I yeah. would love to see that. But... Yeah, we had one work from uh, this morning's talks. Uh, Professor Michael Wong uh, showed their, you know, tactile fits, and uh, unfortunately, we can't make it for the panel discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So although I and many people today showed. Uh, sensing deformations, contact forces, location. I'm actually also really excited about what we can do, especially in human-robot interaction without needing to know where the contact is happening. So we made a hugging robot called HuggyBot, and it has a giant inflated torso with a microphone and a pressure sensor inside. And it is so fun to hug this robot and pat it on the back and rub it on the back. And we use machine learning, but the data is, it has no idea where you're patting it. It doesn't care and so i think the multimodality that just keep remembering the tactile is a lot more than little force vectors across the surface of contact and we should not be blind to the utility of sound and vibrations and temperature uh that's my thought yeah yeah i think uh, on the on the manipulation side there's of course a, a lot of focus on fingertips Right. But that is, of course, as information, it's still very, very limiting. So I think it would be much better to have more touch sen sensing, for example, kind of in something that would correspond to a palm of a, of a, we talked about that. And also like what Gon has these kind of touch sensing on the whole body of the manipulator, right? Because that's, of course, going to be really important if you want to have people close to the robot uh, that they can sense that directly. And I think that's, that would be really helpful to have something that, um, yeah, you could just wrap around your whole robot and it, it works. Thank you. Um, uh, Wenzhou and Pat, would you like to share your uh, thoughts and views? Well, one of the things uh, that I would like to see in the community is um, a common base of software to do just basic things. So right now, everybody, they, they build their sensor, let's say it's a vision-based sensor, uh, and then they write the software to get forces or to get 3D shape or to detect slip or to uh, you know get pose. And um, it would be great if it's possible uh, for people to uh, come together for some uh, sort of baseline common software that everybody could use in this um, wide, widely distributed and, and widely de debugged and understood. <laughs> we, we open source PyTouch as a middleware exactly for this. Uh, I think it would be great if, you know, that if you want to help providing you know, models, we open source a few models. Uh, if you want to integrate also, you know, your models, I think it would be a very good step to create a, a standardized platform for, uh, you know, standard interfaces for plugin models and sensors. Uh, so Roberto, remind us where we can uh, go for that. Um, PyTouch, um, it's open source on GitHub, uh, Facebook research slash uh, PyTouch. I think it sounds similar. PyTorch, but it's PyTorch. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's it was a pun. The to PyTorch Pi people were sitting next mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you. 
So I'm mostly fascinated by the technical part. So on the technical part, in order to better understand uh, the basic working principle of uh, robot tactile sensing and uh, how it helps robots, I believe a good direction to go is to uh, consider the tactile sensing the signals in a longer sequence or in a, in a, uh, in a broader setting. So currently, I think most people have been treating the tactile signals either uh, as a static frame or a single uh, vibration pattern. But instead, like usually, the tactile sensing is like correlated to the contact itself. Is a is there's a motion to generate the contact? And and as a human or other animals, we use different ways to contact objects intentionally. And there's like a. Uh, a stereotype procedure for the getting the contact and the motion itself is also a way to generate touch and also part of uh, part of the perception. So I think like a very interesting direction to go, which can lead us to a better understanding and a better way to use tactile sensing. So if we can find a way to describe the tactile signal, not in a like standalone signal format, but it's a combination of the motion and a, a dynamic response. And we can want to see like how fundamentally this kind of new way for describing the signals can provide some new understanding for robot perception. Thank you, Angel. Uh, so we have approached the six o'clock uh, so quickly. Uh, so I can see we share a lot of excitement, uh, excitement uh, among us, and uh, I really hope we can continue uh, these discussions. Um, and uh, we have got a uh, special issue on tactile robotics on TRO, and uh, we can continue the uh, discussions and development uh, there. And I uh, hope we can continue uh, these uh, beta workshops uh, so I think it's a uh, time for a group photo. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sam. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.